Good morning. Welcome to the August 5, 2022 State Board of Education meeting. Board members, please engage your microphones before speaking and turn them off when you are done speaking. Please note that the board members may be using their cell phones and laptop computers to access the agenda and other information related to this meeting. Live web streaming is available through the State Board of Education website. The August 5, 2022 State Board meeting will now come to order. Andrea, please call the roll. Patsy Kojans? Here. Lisa Fricky? Here. Patty Goobles? Here. Jacqueline Morrison? Here. Kirk Penner? Here. Maureen Nichols? Here. Robin Stevens? Here. Deborah Neary? Here. Commissioner Bloomstead? Here. All present. Thank you. Agenda item 1.2, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda item 1.3, information regarding the Open Meetings Act is posted as you enter the room from the main entrance doors. The Open Meetings Act is also posted on the State Board of Education's website. Commissioner, I think it's your turn to uh, describe the protocol. Yeah, and th thanks and welcome to everyone that's here. Uh, just a reminder, this is a, uh, our, our public meeting, but not necessarily a uh, public uh, session, except for when we do have public comment. Um, so thank you for uh, being here. If you do have conversations or something that might be otherwise disruptive, please take those out in the hallway. And uh, otherwise, thanks for joining us today. I think you're next again. Yeah, and today, um, kind of a, a, a couple of fun things that we get to do here today, but um, uh, today I want to welcome Michelle Fouts and ask Michelle, um, go ahead and come forward, and I hope, yeah, there she is, all right, excellent. So, uh, Michelle is a first grade teacher at Holdridge Elementary School in Holdridge, Nebraska. Mrs. Fouts is a 2021 Nebraska Milken educator, and at the time of this award was a second grade teacher at Bryant Elementary in Kearney. Uh, a school assembly was held on April 27th, where Stephanie Bishop, Vice President from the Milk and Family Foundation, myself, Maureen Nichols, Robin Stevens, NDE staff members, veteran Nebraska milk and educators, and many other dignitaries and members of the community were present. Mrs. Fouts was surprised during, I think she was surprised, during the school assembly. Let's watch a brief video and kind of see how that went. Commissioner Bloomstead, may I have the envelope, please? <laughs> The Milken Educator Award goes to Michelle Fouts. to my family that came, um, my husband and my brother, sister-in-law and niece. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I just love teaching and I love what I do 
and I am so happy to hopefully be a role model for other teachers in the state and um, country and I just I love my job I love teaching I love the little ones which isn't it's easy for some and I don't I can't imagine doing the older kids but um, <laughs> thank you for all you do for um, education in Nebraska I know it's not always easy what you do and you probably don't get enough recognition um, for all of the time you put in but I just I love my job I guess <laughs> and I feel pretty honored that somebody thought I did a good job I guess so uh -huh. it's pretty what's your favorite part of the day of a teaching day and don't say recess and lunch like my <laughs> granddaughter <laughs> I, well I do like a break but um, <laughs> I love reading. That's my passion is literacy. Everything literacy is my passion. And when I can take any book and read it to kids, uh, and like you get to use all the voices and the actions and get them involved, I think you can really um, help a kid love to read or love books, even if they struggle with reading or that's hard for them. If you can get them hooked onto books and just like, find that joy in a book even you know you can read the pictures and all of that like that if you can get them hooked on it then they're going to have that drive to you know want to learn to read or become better readers so reading books to kids is my favorite part of the day that's wonderful we need that yes. and what's your favorite book oh that's oh, that's the really hardest difficult, question uh chapter book currently would be the wild robot by peter brown um, I think the chapters are super short, and so they have lots of cliffhangers to leave the kids on. Like, they're like, oh, keep reading. I'm like, oh, nope, we gotta go to recess or wherever. Um, and picture book, oh, golly sakes, that's a hard question. I love Mo Williams as my favorite author, and I think his books are easy for kids, easier for kids to read, and they're very humorous. And then the characters in the book are very easy to draw. And he did that on purpose so that kids can make their own books and write their own stories with the same characters. I don't think I've ever read a Mo Williams book I don't like. <laughs> so. Well, seeing your energy, I can imagine it's, that you would be one. I, I come and sit hands. at your feet and listen. <laughs> and I can't sure. talk without my hands, so this is OK. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Deborah? Just out of the thousands and thousands of teachers in Nebraska and educators, uh, who are heroes and amazing. You're the number one this year. So congratulations and thank you for all that you're doing. Since you're talking to a group of policymakers, what's the one thing that you want us to know about the challenges of teaching right now? Sorry to throw a hard one on you. And then when you're done answering that, Will you ask your family to wave so we can just like, you know, give them an applause because we know behind every great teacher is an amazing family supporting them. So, okay. Yeah. Will you ask the first question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what's a challenge that you want us to know about? Um, I think right now there's this whole like science of reading, at least in the elementary world, there's a lot of science of reading, balanced literacy, like, and how to, like people are either usually one or the other and there's this like well no my way is better no my way is better and like really it's them working together you can't do just one or just the other you have to have both and how to blend them together and I think some people the science of reading has become that you know that word and everybody's like oh I have to completely switch everything I'm doing which means I can't read books to kids anymore. I can only teach phonics and I can only, and it's, I don't think that's the case, but I think that's maybe what's projected to the teachers. Um, and I think they, school systems are purchasing um, curriculum or materials that say they're science of reading driven, but teachers aren't always trained in the science of reading and giving the proper, um, professional development because really it's not the materials that are teaching the kids it's the teacher and so if you can give that professional development to the teachers on the best practices and what are the way you know like how do I do the science of reading like I know I'm supposed to but what does that mean so I think it's the professional development because the teachers teach the kids not the whatever you buy the materials so and then my husband way back there and then my brother, there he is, my brother and sister-in-law and my niece.
Any other board members? Yes, Patty. You know, Michelle, it's obvious from your enthusiasm that you love teaching, and that, that enthusiasm is contagious, and I'm sure that that's revealed in all of the children in your classroom. You know, you've said several times, I love teaching. I want to know, what do you love most about the profession? Questions. <laughs> My favorite book, and what do I love most about teaching? <laughs> Goodness gracious, well, I love it all. Uh, but I love the relationships that I get to form with the students. So the beginning of every year, I don't, I don't, especially this year going to a new school, like I don't know families, I don't know kids. And so we all come in the first day and it's like, we don't know each other, you know, but by the end of the year, everybody's crying because nobody wants to leave. It's just forming those relationships with those kids and because if you form that relationship with them, I mean, they'll do anything for you. Like they will, they work they will stand at recess and read a book. I mean, they just, they will do anything because they don't want to disappoint you. And so just the, how powerful those relationships are, like how you build them and how I get to do all the fun stuff to form those relationships. And, and then I get to read all those books and that helps with forming relationships. And <laughs> it just is all intertwined so much, I feel like. So that's why I love it all. But I think building the relationships with the kids. Mo, Maureen, sorry. Uh, being a former elementary teacher, one of the things we had to consider and think about the first couple of weeks after we started was setting goals for the year, personal goals, professional goals. I don't know if you've thought about those yet or considered them, and if you have, would you mind sharing what maybe one of those personal and or professional goals would be? Uh, so I'm moving to a new school, and, and I had been at my previous school at Bryan Elementary for 13 years, and it really, it was the hardest decision of my life, like, to just leave, the, it was my family, and we were so supportive, and we were just so connected, and so going to this new school where I don't really know anybody, and I don't have any real relationships yet that are strong with anybody, is my personal goal is, like, to make relationships and connections with the adults that I'm working with, because I think that's just as important as making those relationships with the kids because we're all one team. And really, I mean, we all have the same goal. We want kids to, to love to come to school. We want them to grow as learners. And so I need to make relationships with the adults that I'm working with as well as the kids. So that's one of my personal goals. And then um, I just, like with my little kid goal, like yes, you want the scores to go up and all of that, but I just want them to love reading. Like I want them to love books. I want them to say, can I take that book home and can I read it at home with my mom? Can I show my mom? Can I do, you know, I want them to feel proud and empowered by whatever books they're taking home so that they just have that love of reading and then I can teach them anything once they get that love. So I just want them to love school. Thank you too. for sharing that. Yes. Well, I just want to add, I think those are both wonderful, wonderful goals, but uh, for not being in that building for as long as your other building, I can tell you that your colleagues that I spoke with that day were not surprised in the least that you received this award. So you've obviously already been able to make some great contacts and relationships. So have a wonderful year and find joy in your work every day. I will, thank you. Thank you. Robin. A quick observation. I was at the presentation Okay, here you are, you have just won, uh, I'm an old athlete, so I have to refer everything to sports, but you have just won like uh, the state championship, okay? Even beyond that, the national championship, kind of. And you know, if, if that would have ever happened to me, which it didn't, uh, it would have ever happened to me, I would have absorbed all of that, I'd have celebrated for weeks I'd still be celebrating. But you, within 10 minutes after you receive this outstanding award, you're in your classroom teaching your kids. I says, how does she do that? So that was amazing uh, observation of me, for me. Posed at my school and oh, like yeah. he did that right before school started one day and then I had to, it was on Halloween and I had to go like teach kids on Halloween and I just I was like I, 
I mean, I, I did it, so I had practice, I guess. Maybe <laughs> I had practice, because my husband did that to me. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, Michelle, and stay up here close because we're going to want to do a picture after okay. we do this next one too. So okay. stay up here close. So thank you. Let's do it. So it was a pretty unique year because we actually had two of these uh, in a, in a single year, and so I want to welcome Katie Mace uh, to the front of the room. Here she comes. So uh, Katie is a guidance counselor at Lions Decatur Northeast Schools in Lions, Nebraska. Give her a round of applause, yeah. So Mrs. Mace is also a Nebraska 2021 Milken educator uh, and at the time of award was uh, 712 grade, or 7 through 12 grade English and speech teacher at Lions Decatur in Northeast uh, Lions Decatur, I couldn't quite read that. Lions Decatur Northeast uh, Schools in Lions, Nebraska. Uh, a school assembly was held on April 28th where Stephanie Bishop, a vice president from the Milken Family Foundation, myself, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Patty Goobles, uh, Alicia Ostrander from uh, US Senator Ben Sass's office and, and NDE staff members, as well as veteran Nebraska uh, Milken educators and many other dignitaries and members of the community were present. So let's watch that video because I think that'll be fun too. Lieutenant Governor Foley, may I have the envelope, please? The Milken Educator Award goes to Katie Mace. <laughs> I'm crying again if you can't see behind me. So yeah, uh, just a lot of emotions for that. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess I'm just kind of speaking here, but I, I first of all uh, would really like to thank my school, Lions Decatur Northeast. I work with amazing people. And um, you know, like it doesn't matter if you're having a really tough year. And last year was a, it was a rough year. As a teacher, I was faced with a lot of challenges, but there wasn't one day that I hated my job. Um, I've always been supported by other faculty. My administration is amazing. And, um, and then because of that, we just have really awesome kids. We have awesome parents. It's a wonderful community. And uh, it kind of found me. I actually had put in an application to another school that wasn't hiring. And they passed it off to Lyons uh, about 16, 17 years ago. And they contacted me. And I was hired. and I and I haven't left. Um, it's, uh, I'm just really proud to be from there, and uh, we are small but mighty, and I think if you look at the stats on how well we do with academics as well as athletics, and, uh, and I mean, shoot, just two years ago, we, we even had Teacher of the Year, um, and now this, and so for uh, preschool through 12th grade school, we really make a mark in our state, and I know that there's so many other, uh, I guess, uh, schools out there that are just as, just as deserving of all of this. And I know that all of the teachers that I work with are just as de deserving of this as I am. So it was, it, I, I guess I hold this for all of them and I hope I do them proud. <laughs> so thank you again. And thank you for the state of Nebraska as well. I, I'm honored to work in this state. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. 
Anyone want to start the uh, questions? I will. Okay, Jacqueline. Yeah. So I know that the committee, when deciding with one thing, I think I can say I was on the committee. Can we say I was on the committee? Is it private? I don't think so. Um, was how many extracurricular activities you are involved in with the kids. And so you are the definition of not just being a teacher in the classroom, but a teacher after the work day and putting in all of the hours outside of that. So can you talk to the board or just kind of tell them about some of the things that you've done with kids or do have, are doing with kids outside of the classroom? Because I think it's so necessary to appreciate I know that that's a labor of love, right? That's, <laughs> and so, um, can you just tell us about some of the things that you do or have done? Sure, yeah. School, and you want to create the opportunities that you had growing up, um, and you also, especially with social media now, you pick up uh, what is available to all of the larger schools, and kids want that, and parents want that for their children, too, and still stay in that rural community. So, I mean, all the teachers at my school all have a lot on their plate, um, but I am uh, the One Act director um, for play production, so we go to our competitions every year. That's probably my biggest passion. Um, even though I'm guidance counselor this year, I'm still staying the coach there. I'm not ready to give that up. Uh, I love theater. Um, and I also used to do the spring play as well. Um, and then uh, we had a teacher retire and they needed a senior sponsor and I, which put me in charge of graduation. Um, and so I gave up spring play to be a good senior sponsor. And so I am in charge of making sure that they stay on track and they graduate in May. Uh, and it's a tough job, um, but it's a really rewarding one. Um, oh, let's see, I help, I'm assistant FBLA. I've been cheer coach before. Um, I help out, I do the clocks. I do the clock and the scoreboard at volleyball and basketball games. Um, I help at the track meets, not very much. I put ribbons in an envelope, but hey, everybody needs their ribbon at the end of the day. Um, that's my job, it's my favorite job. Um, I am on uh, the MTSS committee, SILK committee. i am um, been on a technical committee. Um, I, I know there's more, there is, um, and uh, I, I can't remember all of them, but yeah, I, I do it all, so um, we all do, you know, so yep, you bet, thank you, and thanks for recognizing that as well, because it is a lot of work, but it's, it's really rewarding, it just helps you to be a part of those kids' lives in another spa aspect other than the 48 minutes you get them in class every day. Well, congratulations again. I One word, superwoman. <laughs> My question is, as a counselor um, and listening as a board, uh, what can we as a board do uh, to help counselors around the state? Is there anything that, you know, it's an important, you know, teaching is important, but especially with what's been going on with the pandemic, um, and counseling students. What do you want us to know, or how can we help the counseling profession in Nebraska to, to do their job? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm just stepping into the counseling position as my actual position, but I think I've helped being counselor. Uh, you know, I got my degree a few years ago and stayed a teacher, <laughs> and uh, I think, number one, when I got my counseling position and turned into, and then went back to being a teacher, it literally changed everything about how I taught. Um, I could just see kids a little bit differently. Uh, I knew when they walked in the door what kind of day it was going to be and what we needed to do about it. Um, but being a full-time teacher, I couldn't do everything. However, I think as far as the counseling position goes, I think one thing that we need to consider, and maybe a lot of schools need to consider, is that counseling today shouldn't just be about, let's get these transcripts to colleges and uh, make sure they know what college they're going to and what direction they're going to. It's so much more than that. A counselor can help be a part of their mental health. And I know that maybe people are tired of hearing that a little bit, um, but I think there is a preventative way to help children as well as our teachers to from becoming uh, too deep in their mental health to where they are we can't help them so much anymore you know I think that there's ways that I guess my 
when I got my degree, it was with the emphasis of preventative mental health. And as a counselor, that is just my number one goal. Um, how can I help a kid get control of their emotions before it becomes too much for them to handle? And, um, and parents don't know what to do. We live in rural community, there's not a whole lot of help. You know, you gotta drive a long, long way and when you're living in a single household and mom has to work, she can't take her kid to a therapist or to a counselor. So what can we do as counselors to really prevent that mental health from becoming too much? And in addition, I really wanna help be a part of preventative mental health or just be there for teachers as well. Um, I think teachers need to be recognized that they too are going through a lot depending on their classes, their day, or what's scaring them from the media and whatnot. And so uh, I think to just also be there and have maybe some moments and some down moments for those teachers uh, and be a place for them to come and talk to so that they feel like they're gonna be okay. Thank um, you, thank you very much. Patty. Katie, um, of your strongest teaching skills, which ones do you see will be most beneficial to you in your new role as a counselor? Sure, um, so I'm really big into the arts, um, and obviously I love theater and speaking. Um, I was a speech coach too, I remembered that. Um, and, uh, I, and speaking, um, and then I was a part of um, what ESU2 offered for integration of the arts, so I learned how to do, you know, how I can incorporate music and painting and drawing and all that. So I really wanna actually kind of mesh uh, the arts with, uh, with, I guess, kids understanding maybe either a concept I'm trying to teach them um, about good character or to also find a way for them to uh, help themselves if they're having a bad day or having a bad time. And what, you know, can they draw? Can they, uh, you know, act it out? Or, yeah, I don't know. So I guess that's what I'm hoping to do. So I wanna, that's my strong suit. And, and I think that my lesson plans will have a lot of that integration. I just want to emphasize that um, you are such a great example of what our teachers do in Nebraska and why we, why we need great people like you. And yet we expect so much mm -hmm. of you mm -hmm. as a classroom teacher, not just in your classroom role, but all of the extras that you do, and you still have to go home at the end of the day, prepare dinner, feed your family, love your family, spend time with your family, and where's the time for you? And I hope that those listening today and those in the room today can have a better understanding that you are a prime example of what our teachers in Nebraska do. You give of yourselves. It is not an eight to four, 7.30 to five job. No. So thank you. Thank you. I get very emotional thinking about these kind of things, that we don't appreciate you, and it's not always about the pay, but you're far underpaid, and I wish we could do better for you but that's our legislature and our state funding that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. But thank you for everything. Thank you, thank you for saying that, I appreciate that. Yeah, I just wanna cry. Like, the stories here are so amazing, and I, especially knowing that you're a counselor, I just want, and I just wanna say thank you for the message you bring today about the prevention and about how important that is to the learning environment for that student and for other students. And please keep shouting that because it's so important. And I, I love that you're on the MTSS team because that, you know, that all is um, so urgent right now, mm -hmm. uh, especially since the pandemic. Um, thank you. 
and uh, I just wondered if you had a cheerleading team here for I you do. from yeah. your school or your family, and will you point them out for us, please? Yeah, okay. um, I brought my husband, Brian, with me oh. today, and um, my All father, right. Tom Milligan, and oh. his wife, my stepmom, Bev Milligan. Oh. And, uh, yep, awesome. they are a major part of my life. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, well, Katie, um, I'm, I'm uh, your colleague in a different way because I also work in the speech and play production world still, yeah. still. And so I really appreciated your information that you shared about integrating the arts into your counseling and into your classroom uh, because I understand how it can change lives. Sure can. So, yeah, sure does, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Congratulations, I enjoyed listening to you answer all the questions. And I think this year, Milken did a very good job with their two choices yeah, in Nebraska. I agree, yeah. And, I, and thank you to, to the Milken Foundation as well, um, if they're listening. Like it was, it's just such an amazing program to be a part of. And yeah, they, they really make you feel appreciated as a teacher. I wish every teacher could understand this feeling. It's so awesome. Enjoy it. Thank you. I am. <laughs>So I do want to, I, I believe we have some other veteran Milken uh, Award winners here, and I'd like you to stand up so we can also recognize you. There they are, a couple on the, there they are, all right, all right. So we're going to take about five minutes to, to get a couple pictures, and so, and, and thank you individually, and congratulate you individually, so we'll do about five minutes and then uh, get that done, then we'll resume the meeting. Okay, let's go ahead and resume. Zaina Brida will introduce uh, the next item. So will you please come for forward, Zaina? Good morning, board. Uh, happy to be here uh, to share uh, with you one of the investments that was made uh, last year, and specifically uh, last August uh, to, um, from uh, SR3 uh, to really address um, uh, the mental health in, uh, in, in Nebraska among uh, our children. And I have prepared, I hope the, hope the technology works. Just give me a second. Uh, although the, uh, while the um, um, mental health uh, issue in, uh, in children and teenager uh, is, is not new, but the, um, uh, the pandemic uh, amplified, uh, has amplified uh, this issue. Uh, the psychological uh, rate, the rate of psychological um, uh, disorder uh, among children and, uh, and teenager uh, has doubled since the pandemic began. Uh, according to the national uh, the data, we have 25% of our youth experiencing uh, uh, depressive symptoms, 20% of youth experiencing anxiety symptoms. And also uh, the recent uh, study shows like in early 2021, uh, emergency room visits uh, for suicide attempts were 51% higher for, uh, for youth in comparison in, in 2019. And, and this is not new. In Nebraska, uh, last year, the Department of Education conducted uh, many uh, focus groups and, and surveys, and this has been consistent that a number one concern is to provide access to mental health service for students, staff, and community. Um, so the Department of Education respond to this crisis and reach out to our uh, uh, partners, including ESU, to um, provide a uh, very and uh, high ra uh, range of uh, services to 
uh, to our students in, in Nebraska. So um, ESU has responded, all the ESUs, uh, actually 15 of them, uh, responded to this uh, and uh, we uh, partnered with ESU and provided institute that uh, with the training in, um, in, uh, in uh, partnership with the uh, uh, mental health uh, technology uh, transfer center. Uh, we always use the acronym MHTCC, and they provided with the resources and with the uh, guideline and uh, with examples, and here it shows just like how the, uh, the school-based uh, mental health system that provided uh, by the MHTHSS uh, really is the grounded of a multi-tier uh, system, uh, um, the MTSS, uh, focus on uh, teaming, focus on how to sustain um, uh, this effort and also the data-driven uh, decision-making. Also, we are partnering with UNL Public Policy Center uh, to evaluate this project, and as you see in front of you, uh, the, the report, it was uh, produced by the UNL uh, uh, Public Policy, uh, basically evaluated and in three approach we have uh, evaluate the statewide uh, the institute for ESUs and um, the training that and technical assistance that provided by ESUs, and the third uh, um, approach is to uh, evaluate the institute and implementation for for the selected schools. This is just a logic model. It shows by our partner uh, partnering with uh, ESUs. It really help us to. Um, uh, um, pretty much uh, to identify our outcome and goals for short term, medium term, and, and long term uh, for this project. I'm gonna stop here and introduce our uh, guest speakers, uh, starting with Dr. John Screda, administrator for ESU6. Uh, Dr. Michelle uh, Rayburn, she's the director of student services at ESU6. Uh, Mr. Ray Collins, superintendent Fulber Clatonia. Uh, Mr. Josh uh, Kampson, superintendent uh, Fulmer Central. And uh, Ms. Amber Hartsack, she's the lead uh, uh, of uh, this uh, project, Mental Health, and working with ESUs and, and school uh, district. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Scredo. Thank you, Zaina. Good morning. Thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to share some of the successes with the initial implementation of these ESSER dollars to support school mental health. It's a privilege to be up here with these awesome educational leaders as well. Um, in opening, one of the things I would be remiss if I didn't mention, and which uh, I believe my fellow ESU admin colleagues from across the state would pummel me if I neglected to mention this, is that uh, this truly reflects ESU-NDE partnership across the state. So while we're here representing ESU-6, uh, the involvement of ESUs across the state reflects that we are all in on this. And it's a great example, I think, of strengthening partnerships to leverage these resources and benefit school districts and students across the state. Um, specifically, there's some great synergy around this effort because you, the State Board, has identified provision of access to mental health services as one of the department's top priorities. And this matches up really well with the identified needs of school districts. Our school districts, pre-pandemic, we're seeing student and staff mental health as a significant need, and to say the pandemic exacerbated that would be a drastic understatement. By moving the ESSER funding commitments through ESUs, we believe this work is being done efficiently and impactfully, and the ESSER dollars fill a gap in resources just as intended. So specifically from the vantage point of ESU-6, headquartered in Milford and serving 16 school districts, our board has adopted a strategic plan that identifies three goals driving organizational decision making, and they are to advocate, collaborate, and communicate. Advocate for the needs of school districts, our school districts, and ensure that we are collaborating with partners at the local, regional, and statewide level, like the Department of Ed, in order to meet the specific requests of our school districts. And to be sure that we're communicating both needs and successes. The best thing, in my opinion, as an ESU administrator and longtime school district superintendent before that, is that 
in education, we are shameless about sharing what works. And Wilbur Quitonia and Fillmore Central Soups with us today, they'll be talking up what they're accomplishing and sharing that with our other superintendents, and that is going to result in scaling up solutions, and that will have huge impact and extend the beneficial impacts of these dollars. Uh, Dr. Rayburn will describe some of the specifics in terms of ESU-6's facilitation of this. Yes, they are. Oh, we got to turn this on. Or we just pass the big one. Let's pass the big one. You, you have time to figure that one out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And as Dr. Scretta mentioned, um, mental health aligns with uh, what's been um, identified as needs of our, of our districts. And as a director of student services, I get the privilege of working both with um, administrators providing professional development for their educators, as well as the educators working directly with, um, with students. And so mental health is a recurrent topic in those conversations. And so the school mental health project design allows it to um, fit within the framework of a multi-tiered system of support. So MTSS, you've heard that acronym um, already today. And so basically to provide those resources to layer up services um, as the need presents. And our, at ESU 6, our mental health team consists of, um, there's four of us, so we have our MTSS coach, um, a professional development consultant, a program supervisor, and myself. So intentionally to include both the perspective of general education and special education. Um, and when the project began in the fall, the four of us went through training that would be similar mirroring what um, our districts would experience but it was bolstered with um, some exemplars and some um, supports in, in how to uh, scale that up and be adaptive with the needs of our districts. Um, we've also been supported with technical assistance calls along the way, clarifying the expectations um, around the project, as well as an opportunity to collaborate with, um, with the others, like they mentioned, the 15 other um, ESUs that are involved, and so collaborating and sharing ideas. Um, and because that's, um, the focus has been clear, um, the purpose to increase access to mental health services and supports, but it's been an adaptive process allowing us to um, provide in the local context of what our districts are identifying as their needs. Um, so that collaboration with others um, is wonderful to see all the different opportunities and, as Dr. Scretta said, shamelessly steal and share. Um, and so while we had many pieces of mental health supports at the ESU, such as an LMHP, um, school psychologists contracted with, um, directly with districts. Um, we have a counselors network, bringing um, 16 districts, allowing those counselors to, to network together, um, and, an, and the MTSS coach. While we had those pieces, we didn't um, really have the, the systems approach to how to pull that all together and put that into um, MTSS, and that's what the project is um, providing us support um, and specific guidance around that. And so um, with that, I uh, will turn over to... Um, Ray Collins from Wilbur Claytoni to talk about what that looked like from the district's perspective. So we'll see if this works, yes, no. <laughs> Thanks for making me feel better. Keep passing it. <laughs> well, I felt like it was working. Um, good morning and thank you for having us here. Raymond Collins, uh, superintendent at Wilbur Claytonia. Um, I've been at Wilbur Claytonia uh, 12 years and in my arrival uh, in 2010, we had a SKIP team, which is School Community um, Intervention and Prevention. Uh, their focus was on helping students with emotional and social and behavioral issues. Uh, a lot of times, uh, students were identified by the staff, and then we had a public agency that provided a limited amount of free service. And so it's a great program, but it didn't take me very long to find out that uh, by about April 1st, we're running out of service time. And so for the last six to nine weeks of school, students did not have the supports, particularly those that really needed it. And so uh, we, we knew we needed a little more help. And I had dialogued with our provider a little bit about what that might look like. Um, in 2013 and 14, we actually had two attempted suicides of students, one that was successful and one that created a severe injury. Um, again, that heightened our awareness of uh, the needs that kids had, 
and places that we needed to send them uh, were not readily available in rural Nebraska or we didn't know about them. It seems like anytime we find out that a student has an emotional crisis, our, uh, particularly if it's a, a, an emergency kind of thing, um, immediate kind of crisis, our, our, our loan tactic is to send them to the CAPS program at Bryan here in Lincoln. And typically that's been what we've done. So we needed some more help. We are one of the people who does participate um, sharing an LMHP with the ESU. We have that person one day a week. Great help. Again, he serves five or six kids, five or six families, but he could serve 12 or 15. Um, the need is, is that great and growing. Um, our board agreed to join Directions, which is an employee assistance program as well, uh, through the negotiated process. Um, I do see a utilization report, and we do have families, uh, both students of uh, staff members and staff members who use that for a variety of different things, from alcohol abuse, child abuse, my child doesn't get along in school, uh, a lot of different things, mom and dads are having problems. Uh, but again, we, we see some of those kinds of things being served. Uh, we have a great counselor. We kind of came upon her uh, in, in the elementary, kind of came upon her, I don't want to say by accident, but she wanted to be an elementary counselor for us. However, um, her degree, she had a master's degree in school counseling from Colorado State University, but didn't have a teaching certificate. So in Nebraska, she couldn't be licensed as a counselor at that time. Um, I looked at the code book and said, hey, Amy, can you get an LMHP? She was able to get a provisional LMHP license. We hired her as in that role, uh, probably use her more as an elementary counselor than an LMHP, what we are going to expand that role this year. Uh, so we got really fortunate working with her, Crete, Medical, uh, Crete Area Medical Center helped us create a telehealth counseling program. Uh, it was great. Um, they actually had someone coming down into the local Wilbur community one day a week. But in our community, um, when, it, when, when we talked about the two students' suicide, we also created a suicide coalition. We met with parents and students, but when we did outreach parent meetings, uh, I think the most highly attended meeting was five people. Um, I think in our community, mental health is still very stigmatized, very difficult to talk about. Um, it is difficult to, it, particularly when we start talking about suicide. I, and I have a personal experience. Uh, my dad was living in Houston. I was in Preg, Nebraska. He called one night. It sounded like he wanted to do harm to himself. I'm 1,200 miles away. Uh, finally got him talked into seeing somebody and, and w when he did I asked him how that went and he said well first I drove around the building for 30 minutes because I didn't want to go inside and be told I was crazy and so that was kind of uh, my experience with that and, and so again this continues to be stigmatized um, COVID hit and of course students were at home some in abusive neglected environments uh, some without a lot of parental support um, and so uh, we've seen that, those social emotional behavior issues continue to hit our school, continue to uh, create issues for us. Um, and I can say that every year in the last 10 years, I've seen a negative impact of social media on students in, in, in our school. Um, a lot of different instances, and, and I know last year when we continue to talk about mental health, uh, suicide ideation, um, I can think of three or four students uh, that that receive some sort of service uh, for that. So what has this program done for us? Um, we did a, a broad assessment, self-assessment, and what we felt like was we had a lot of pieces in place, but nobody really knew about them. Nobody knew how to access them. Uh, and I don't want to say nobody. One or two people in the school system knew how to access them. I can't say that everybody in the school system knows who to go talk to if they hear a student talking about this or have their own problems. So one of the things we wanted to address is just what do we have in place? What are the needs that aren't being addressed? So we want to conduct a needs assessment to try to create a more comprehensive, broad-based program of mental health in our school system. Um, 
We also identified a single point of contact. As I said, we have someone with a tremendous counseling degree, some clinical experience, um, licensed LMHP. We're going to have her be our single point of contact for a lot of this, but help create a comprehensive behavioral flow chart, if you will, so that we can educate our students, our parents, and our staff on here's what's available. If you have this particular issue, you're hearing of this thing, here's who to contact, here's how to move forward. So ultimately, that's what we want to we, we want to do. Um, it was an interesting discussion as we did our self-assessment. I guess as a superintendent, I felt like last year the pandemic was over, and so I'm, I'll, I'll be honest in that, and that's probably an un, inaccurate assessment. School felt to me like it was more normal. Um, however, as we did our assessment, some of the staff um, verbalized that they were still highly stressed um, having a lot of issues, needed some additional time and space. So um, this continues, and our, our plan is to try to do a much better job for the students and staff at Warwick Victoria. Good morning. Um, I'm Josh Cumston from Fillmore Central, and uh, really thankful to be with all of you this morning. Um, and excited to get a chance to kind of talk about what we are trying to do through this uh, Mental Health Institute. Um, this will be my third year at Fillmore Central. Uh, I previously had been with uh, ESU 9, or I had been in that district. Um, so it's my third year in ESU 6. And I can tell you from conversations with, with superintendents and other ESUs as well and other administrators, um, mental health has been something that has been a concern for quite some time and has been seeing an increase. Uh, in those kinds of things, chronic absenteeism, uh, behaviors, and other things that, that students and staff have been uh, dealing with. Uh, but, I, but I think that, that COVID really brought those things uh, to the surface, really exacerbated and showed us uh, where exactly we were with, with some of those needs. Uh, Fillmore Central has, um, prior to me being there, had had a, a long-standing relationship with the Fillmore County Hospital, who has a behavioral services uh, facility there. They were helping to provide uh, an LMHP to, to our students about two days uh, a week. So there had been some really great things in place uh, for the students of Fillmore Central. Um, but just in my own experience and in other schools and, and since I've been there in, in Geneva, uh, we knew there was a need. And then one of the things that really brought some of this to the forefront is when you're a new superintendent in a, in a school district, oftentimes you survey staff, you survey parents and community and students, and you try to get a feel. One of the, one of the big needs that, that came through that were some, some mental health pieces. Uh, and then through some of the ESSER surveys, I think the first survey that we had done, unfinished learning was, was at the very top, followed by uh, social emotional supports and then making sure that we had sports continue. That was a survey that was done in the summer of 20. When we did a survey at the end of the first semester of, of that year, um, our three highest, social emotional supports, mental health supports, and supports for wraparound services. Those had jumped to the top after that first semester, and we really started to have conversations on how can we do something uh, for the foundation of all students, even the ones that we don't know they're in crisis, for everybody involved, how can we do some things with mental health and make it a seamless system? And we were having those conversations. Um, and not exactly knowing how to, as, as Ray put it, we had some different areas that we were doing some things, but how do we coordinate that and make sure everybody's on the same page and aware of those things that are happening? Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that, that people, you know, with, with some of these mental health supports, we're talking school safety situations. I mean, obviously that, that has been in the news a lot. We're talking about, um, I think something that gets missed are, are sometimes our high achievers have some, some of those needs and people gloss over that and don't realize that some of our high achievers are under a tremendous amount of stress and how do we, how do we find those and provide that service for them as well. So we were, we were thrilled to death when we heard there was going to be a, a coordinated mental health institute that might be uh, possible and we wanted to apply and be part of this program. Uh, and we were uh, really excited to partner. ESU 6 is a great partner with us and has been for, for many years and, and through, through NDE as well. So um, we, we got together in May with our team and our team consists of, we have, we have three buildings in our district, an elementary, middle, and high school. Um, we, we had a, a teacher from each building join the team. We have two guidance counselors, a K-6, so we have 
we have two and three buildings. We have a K6 and we have a 712. They're on the team. We also have increased our, um, the services through the Fillmore County Hospital for a mental health practitioner. So, so she will be coming three and a half days a, a week and have an office in each of our buildings. And so uh, those are some things. And, and all those people are on the team, myself as well. So we did the initial shape assessment in May. And we were really surprised at some of the scores that we, we thought we had some things in place that we decided we knew about them, but not everybody else did. And that was very eye-opening for us and really helped push us to really want to, we were glad that we had been a part of this mental health institute. So moving forward, um, we have met several times already. Um, one of the things that we'll be doing as we come back for you know, the, the uh, pre-service meetings right before school starts, uh, will be, there'll be a presentation of the team to all of the staff explaining what some of the, uh, uh, what some of the training has been, what some of the direction is going to be. And, and one of the very first things that we'll be doing will, will be a needs assessment. And we want to give that out to our, our families and to our staff. Um, so we have a committee that's dedicated to that. And our, our goal is by parent-teacher conferences to have that document ready and be able to start gathering that information. And then we can line that up with a, with a resource map and, and see how can we connect those needs. We also have another group that's going to be working on a, a mental health screener, and they're looking at some different ideas uh, that we can go ahead and put in some of our um, data management software. And, and just again, if we do have some students who may um, need some support, we want to make sure that we are identifying those students and not letting them fall, fall through the gaps. And so, so we're in the initial stages of that, but we really see a, a, an enormous benefit to being part of this program and, and are thankful to, to be. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, like Zainab said, my name is Amber Hartsock. I work with the NDE, and I've been leading this project over the last year. And this just provides kind of an um, outline of our project for the first year and kind of roles and responsibilities for each of those entities. And as was mentioned last September, we held an institute, a three-day institute in partnership with the MHTTC to provide the training to participating ESUs on how to then support the entrusted school districts in doing this work. And we've been providing ongoing technical assistance meetings um, as an opportunity to collaborate and also, like Michelle said, to kind of make sure everyone is clear on expectations. And then the ESUs were asked to create an action plan on how they were going to host their own institutes, looking at schools they would recruit, when they would do so, and then hosting those institutes by the end of July. And they all were able to do so. We provided financial support for the ESUs in doing all of that work. The next step is then for those participating school districts to create an action plan on what goals they want to work on for the next year. They also have an opportunity to select up to two areas of financial support that we will provide to them that reflect the goals they want to work on. And they also receive stipends for attending those institutes and those trainings. And so where we're at right now is receiving those action plans from the schools, reviewing and approving them, and then we will enter into contract with those schools to provide that financial support. Um, the ESUs will provide ongoing technical assistance to the schools as they move through the year and, and implementing those action plans. And then us, we at the state level will provide support as well ongoing. Um, and so we will be starting year two of this project next month. And so we will continue again with asking the ESUs to host an additional institute with other schools that are interested in doing this work. And we will just continue moving forward for as long as we have funding available. Maybe a question. I, I'm, I'm assuming we're planning on questions, so I'll. I'll. <laughs> All right, we're, uh, Maureen and then Kirk. I appreciated this report a lot. I spent time this past week uh, reading this uh, information sheet that you had presented to us earlier. I was very pleased over the work that has been done and likely could not have been achieved without the ESSER's funds. So we did good on, the board did good on ensuring that this happened. My one concern, and maybe the school districts can address this, is 19.5%, uh, 20%, a fifth of those that attended. Um, you know, their, their concern for the future was 
securing funding for a sustainable model of supports. Now, as I understand it, our ESSER funds end by the 2024, correct, Commissioner? 2024, they end. Zainab, would that be correct? Are you feeling like this is going to be sustainable. That is my greatest concern. I want it to be sustainable. I hope everyone listening understands the importance of mental health in our schools, more now today than ever. So in order to be able to get this sustainable funding, we're going to likely have to be looking at the legislatures or the ESUs when they provide the services, however it is, it's going to cost the school districts more money. So then that becomes more money at the local district for their budgets. And our kids deserve the very best. Where do you see this headed? 19.5% might not be a lot to people. It is to me when we're looking at an important topic. Um, so. John Scrutta, ESU 6 administrator. Um, one of the things about sustainability that I want to describe, and then Dr. Rayburn might be able to expound upon this a little bit, is that part of what's happening with this grant is the systematizing of best practices. And so what's happening um, in terms of the resource investment right now is that it is sharpening the acumen and building the baseline knowledge and competency of student services experts and some of our professional development consultants across ESUs in Nebraska. And there are processes in place already through the ESUs, like the formal collaborative entity for educational service units is the coordinating council. And so part of what's already underway with this grant process that is so phenomenal, I think, is that when ESUs get together and convene, best practices are being shared, and we have an opportunity to consolidate and synthesize the key best practices from these investments over the next few years. And so a part of this will just be, be about embedding processes, establishing networks, refining those within ESUs. And Michelle can talk, I think should mention, like our core four at six. Yeah, that's the core four where I said we included the general and special education. And so I think that's a key component to also think about it's uh, working smarter. And so when you work through the process, you know, and, or if you think about that, that tier, that triangle, you know, we love to use the triangle in education, we also want to be meeting more needs um, at tier one by just our standard course of action. And, and I think that's important to mention, I, I heard the, um, um, Katie mentioned that um, from the counselor's perspective, that staff component too. And so, you know, what's our, the effective workforce and what are we doing in tier one? So I do think that there, and so we're not collapsing that triangle and putting all the resources at the end. So if we're more preventative and we have um, systematized that. So I think one component of that is um, increasing the capacity to, to serve in that systemic way. Yes, there still will be what resources do we need when it's allocated to, um, you know, to perhaps a position, a licensed mental health practitioner, et cetera. But I also think when we increase our collective efficacy and our capacity and we embed within systems, um, we might um, sometimes work smarter and surprise ourselves on what we can do differently um, at tier one and tier two. Um, with what we already have. And I think Ray mentioned that as well. Um, some of it is really just aligning, you know, we have a counselor, what, what's their, what's the, what's the daily, you know, how we delineate what a counselor does, what our school psychologist does, what an LMHP or when we're using um, community supports and services. And so I think some of it is that concept of increasing capacity and working smarter too. And, and I'll agree with all that. I, I think that our our goal would be to build this systemically and, and help educate our staff. My concern for stability is really a workforce thing, and that's not just necessarily a school-based problem. Um, I, I worry about the number of uh, um, providers that might be available, and, and that's not going to be necessarily a school-based issue. It's going to be a, a statewide work-based work issue. 
Um, and, and I know it's more and more difficult. Like I said, we got lucky to find an LMHP for a counselor. I do believe that more counseling uh, programs have, have uh, their students doing some clinical work. So there is that piece being built in. Um, but again, if there's any sustainability issue, I think as a school system, we're going to buy into the aspect of mental health and trying to do what's best for our kids and, and help them provide services. My bigger concern is where will those services be available? And, uh, you know, we're only 35 miles or 35 minutes from Bryan Hospital when you're, when you're in Wilbur and Claytonia. So we have some access to things that Lincoln and Omaha can provide. I don't know about it outstate Nebraska, but that would be my concern. And I don't know that you can use ESSER money to build that whole workforce infrastructure in the state of Nebraska. I, I want to add on. Okay, go ahead. You bring up some excellent points about the sustainability of providers. Um, and that goes right along with especially our students in school who every student should feel safe, welcome, be able to sit down and have a conversation with those that are adults in the building. So I appreciate your candidness. Thank you very much for what you have done. Kurt, did you have your hand up? I did, thank okay. you. Thanks for coming here. I um, we just so the committee members that weren't in on that presentation, we had a presentation from ESU five yesterday, Jen McNally and Dr. Brenda McNiff. Um, mental health is here. We can spend probably the whole day talking about why, but it's here. Um, and one thing I took from that, and you mentioned it as well, is that it's it's not the the kids that you think maybe need mental health. A lot of it is the high ability learners. It is the people that are in every activity possible. We over, we overwork our kids, quite frankly. Um, and that's, that's an issue. And that's a, that's my fault as a parent, right? So I want to know the difference between what you're doing. And this may be a hard question, maybe not an answer question you want to answer. What's the difference between what we're doing here with the ESSER funds and what ESU5 is doing in some, some school districts in, in their area and outward? Is there a difference? Are you kind of hybrid in this? Is there, because what she was talking to us about yesterday was how you get in and you're, meet, you're seeing this many people, but it gets down. I mean, it's not like it's nonstop. It, they reduce the number of people that they, they talk to her. they get a lot of touches and she went into she's high energy we all know that um, but there's a there's a right way to do mental health and there's a wrong way to do mental health and I think uh, Jen and ESU 5 uh, might have it pegged pretty well I think I would say that there's um, quite a bit of similarity and so it's looking at things in that systems level and I think um, like you said and, and Josh mentioned you have this continuum of and, and I think also understanding what does mental health mean and so what does that really mean and, and the concept of wellness and how you're resilient and you handle stress and you know again back to those overextended um, you know high achieving overextended um, I think even culture and climate where's the staff at and like we've said you know um, uh, teachers and, and the amount that they do um, it was wonderful to hear a couple of educators be celebrated today um, because our workforce has been under stress as well and so I think when you um, step back and you think about then that as a um, s systems processing then again what is happening for everyone our culture climate or our staff wellness um, our students and building that resilience and that capacity um, and and those supports so I would say in that regard um, there's not a, a difference. You, you do have to build it up as far as a concept of what are we doing tier one um, for everyone. I know that, that the concept you hear from, from Jen a lot is wellness for all, and I think that's the exact same thing I've heard going through um, this process and so for me um, it was uh, I think I received that support and that training and our team, our core four, um, have increased capacity on answering those questions. I, um, you know, how do we do this? And then allowing that to be adaptive to the context of our schools. Um, so I think in the broad sense, um, what is different? Um, well, we're, we're all wanting to improve access and services and supports. So it's how do you go about 
delineating what we're doing for everyone, staff and students included, and then how are we tearing it up. Um, um, I haven't been a part of Wellness for All, but I can say that's my understanding, um, that really that intent is the same, so. If I may, um, so Jen mentioned three of the schools through from ESU 6, right? Uh, they're through SR funds, they're contracting with Jen to do Wellness for All. So we, there's flexibility, so it depends on the action plan. If the schools want to do Wellness for All, they, they have the funds to do that. So we, we fund all the schools regardless, but, and we, add, we really provide more flexibility based on their action plans, based on their needs, based on the need assessment as well. Tagging on that, I think that's a great point. So our Seward schools um, that are contracting um, and using the supports from then, we're still a part of that process. And so um, we were, Jen and I were talking yesterday, so we're still a part of that TA um, process. So she, while she's a director providing the LMHPs to them, then we're increasing capacity and support and what are we sharing back and forth for what supports um, our schools need. That's what I would add. Just at some point, it would be great just to have and it's up to the board or you, Madam President. It'd be nice to have that presentation from Jen for the whole board. It's, it's quite interesting, and I think at some point it would be worth it. So we, four of us got to see it, but eight need to see it. Yeah, I, I heard from several of you that it was really good, so maybe we can work something like that out. Deb, I believe you're next, and then Jacqueline. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> Everybody. I'll get to you. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, like Kirk said, I this is a subject we could talk about all day, and you know, kids need to feel well, you know, in order for them to learn. Um, I love that part of your strategy is looking at the tier three, and you know, as well, and all of the. Um, things that you can, preventative uh, activities. And so, I, you know, you talk about the tier three kind of prevention things as being, you know, promotion of positive social, emotional, and behavioral skills. And so, I, is that the same as social, emotional learning? And, uh, you know, are we teaching, I know you mentioned some, you know, social, emotional learning skills. Is that the same thing? Well, Josh and I were spending some time talking on the way up here about you know tier one and meeting the needs of, of the students that enter our door and, and what we do to prepare our staff to meet their needs and, and those students to be able to engage in learning. And so um, I think it's to thinking about that concept of wellness and resilience and um, where all of our kids are at on that spectrum. So at tier one, it's about creating that, um, and you heard that teach the first one, um, uh, Michelle, remember her name, same as mine, um, talking about the relationships with students and so how do we set up that um, positive culture in our, in our classrooms and then from the wider in our building and for our teachers to feel a part of that. So that's that tier one, that promotion of, I like to use the term like wellness. So we're, you know, we're wellness, we have resilience, we're ready to engage in learning. Um, and she talked about doing that through relationships so those students then really want to um, try harder, try again when it's difficult. And so um, I think sometimes it's, um, uh, you know, what do we call that? Well, we're calling that getting our, meeting the needs of our, our staff and our students so they're ready to be learners and, and uh, our staff are, are able to meet their needs. Thank you. Jacqueline and Viv Lisa. So I wanna say thank you guys for being here. We had a superintendent at one of our previous meetings who came to talk about the Safe to Help um, hotline and how it had really benefited his schools and community. And um, I remember him saying, it's really important to us, so after the funds run out, we will still figure out how to make it work. And I think some communities have that ability. <laughs> and um, when you have buy-in from the community, buy-in from the board, but not everyone has that buy-in that they need to be able to get funding. And so my question is specific to the superintendents, not that, and I care about what everyone else has to say too. Um, but when we talk about solutions, right, if we were to go to the legislature or any other funding sources in the state and ask for funding, we wanna be able to 
design programs or to ask for funding that can get to the needs that you have. And so I'm wondering when you think about the mechanisms that you have as a superintendent to receive resources to your school district, whether that's through grant programs that you're able to apply for, whether the funding comes through ESUs, that comes from the Department of Education, or if it's something like put money toward um, community colleges being able to provide these resources for our teachers to go and take a class to be trained up on the issue, or if it comes to back to the Department of Education and saying as part of a teacher certificate in the state of Nebraska, you should make it a requirement that a teacher have six or nine hours of college education in these areas so that they can bring that to the classroom. What do you see as the place where it would be beneficial to invest the resources? Um, and so I'll kind of leave it open whether that be money that you can hire staff, money for technical assistance, what are the needs or what is the best use for your school districts if we were able to go advocate for that issue? So resources and sources, all the above. Um, it, it would be great to kind of tackle that from, again, all of those fronts. Um, I'm not sure, and I'm gonna say this from a teacher education, my one opinion. Uh, teacher education has a lot of things already loaded onto the, into that program and everything that we want teachers to be able to know and do when they come out. Um, boy, there's a lot to being an educator and I don't know that you can cover that in four-year college. When I was in college, I was a college kid. That didn't necessarily mean I was an education professional, whatever that, however you want to interpret that. Um, and, and, and I, I don't think you, I really became serious about teaching until maybe the last year, year and a half of, of my um, college education career. So I'm not sure adding to that. It would be great that we had some knowledge, but I don't know that a series of classes, it, it's kind of like special education and human relations. You know, all of those are important to the job of being a teacher. But how many more things can we add on to the to the profession? I think it's important for us to make sure we also mentor those people in. We have a mentoring program. We're going to talk about this. Will become part of that mentoring program. You know, here here are the resources we have. Here where we here's what we're going to do. So I think we will find a way to make that sustainable. I know that's not true in every community. All right. Um, again, my concern is maybe where do we go for the most intense crisis that we have. And, and I do worry about, about that in the future. And, and maybe that is a, a place that we need to spend some money. Uh, I always love to have, I'm a superintendent of schools, I'd always love to have more money. Um, and, and, and even if you, in this case, told me that I had to spend it on mental health, I think that's important enough when you look at the statistics, um, we, have to, we have to continue to address that. I don't know that I've really answered your question, um, but I think it, it really has to be a multi-pronged approach and and uh, I just hope more people become aware that these mental health things and we can have conversations about mental health and it's not that kind of secret thing that's that's in a family and, and I think that happens too much um, I I was an education professional in college I was unlike Ray no <laughs> just <laughs> yeah <laughs> No, you know, um, for us on, on the funding side, I mean, I agree with Ray. I mean, anytime we have a chance at, at grants or other funding, I mean, we're going we're gonna to try to take that and, and run with it. I would say that, you know, in some of our, our things that we're doing coming back, um, we're really looking at going back to some, some basics, back to our foundation with staff this year is talking a lot about building relationships with students, uh, talking a lot about um, just basic rules and procedures, just, keep, you know, to have... Have a have a great environment for students to learn and and be able so so those are some things that that I think we are just doing that don't cost money we're just trying to put our turn our focus that that direction one of the things with our LMHP I alluded to earlier that that uh, we have increased the time and and prior to um, they were coming into our building 
to, to meet with individual kids. We've actually moved them, we have offices in each one of our buildings because our hope is that they can be in classrooms, be around and help lead some staff training uh, at staff meetings. Hey, here are some things that I'm thinking that, that would really help you with de-escalation techniques or, or, or a number of other areas. And so that's one of the ways we're hoping. Uh, and so if there would ever be, you know, um, Ray earlier said, sometimes it, it's not, I mean, money is always an issue, but sometimes it's not just the money. It, it's the availability of the professionals and, and the training. And so if we had more access to that, I mean, I, I think we could, could continue and sustain. Lisa and then Patty. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all for being here. Um, just, I'm not quite sure how to say this, but I wish in my earlier years in teaching that ESUs were at where you are now. I appreciate that ESUs are better coordinating with their schools, but even more so that you're coordinating among yourselves, ESU to ESU, for the betterment of students. And I keep that going. I think that is tremendous. Um, <laughs> It's hard to write, so I write keywords, <laughs> and so hopefully I'll remember what this is. But um, Dr. Collins, um, I zoomed in on when you had five people show up at your meeting over the years, has that capacity, have you had subsequent, subsequent meetings, and has the capacity of attendance changed? We haven't had any since, after, since COVID, okay. and it never improved maybe got worse and I will tell you the people that were there had experienced suicide in their life oh my. from a family member or someone and so I, yeah. the, getting the general public there to to help inform them on the need and and mental health and what's available was very difficult I'm sorry to hear that and some people have um, trepidation about SEL and you mentioned that um, you targeted specific areas of SEL um, in your school to benefit students. Could you give two or three examples of the SEL that helped your students? You, you mentioned your school specifically was doing something and you said the acronym SEL. I'm just wondering if you could give examples. I want people to understand, or any of you, understand what SEL in a targeted, educated system of helping students Maybe give two or three examples of how you're approaching that in your school and how it's benefiting students. I think we all need to understand and be on the same page as to what that is. Anybody? Sure, I'll talk about that um, uh, at preschool. That's, we can take it down to you know colors and thinking about that. That sometimes you know helps us Simplexity, those big concepts become. So like thinking about preschoolers and, and hearing about, you know, they're coming in and sorting out, um, being a group learner now. And, and uh, so when they come in those doors, um, you know, and experience big emotions, you know, when we're working through um, uh, group play from parallel play and um, master of their own domain at times at home, and now we're coming into a group. And so when you put those things, like I, I think about those preschoolers and like, how do we help manage those big emotions to be a part of a group? Um, and be able to um, take, you know, beginning those steps of taking perspectives and others. And, and so that can be like, you know, let's label, let's, let's name those things. You know, you're feeling big, sad because, you know, you, you got off that big bus or that you're, it's not your turn yet at this, you know, the, the kinetic sand table or, you know, whatever it might be. And so some of it is at that concept of just helping them work through those big emotions, those pieces that are getting in their way of being able to engage in, in learning and, and be groupable. Um, and to be, you know, positively and productively engaged with their peers. So that's what I think of when I think of those basic level things. Um, and then how do we um, intentionally um, uh, address that with our students? How do we intentionally include that as a part of our, our instruction? And so at the preschool level, that could be talking about, you know, what zone you're in. Are you good to go green? Um, or are we, you know, feeling a little yellow, a little silly, or maybe a little nervous or apprehensive about these first days? And so um, to me, that's a, a simplified way to think about what that really means is I'm ready now to be a groupable learner. Thank you. Thank you for answering my questions and for being here. Patty. Thank you. Um, 
Your presentation has been very informative and really thought-provoking for me. I don't have more questions. I just have a couple of observations. The first observation is that um, as I was part of listening to the presentation yesterday and then listening to the two of you as superintendents, it's clear to me that there's not one right way to do this, right? That you have to meet the needs of your students, your staff, your community. And those needs vary from one district, sometimes one building, to another. So I think it's, it's really, it was fun to hear how even two of you have, there was some overlap in terms of how you see this being organized and what services you need and how you've met those needs. Um, I also see that you're really at beginning stages, right? So this is not something that's been established for three or four years. This is a, a beginning. Um, and I'm really optimistic that it will be embedded and it will be sustainable because you believe in it and you value the mental health of everyone, everyone around you, students, staff, and so on. Um, the second observation is that, and I was thinking of that, Dr. Collins, when you mentioned about relationships, I guess both of you mentioned that, but establishing those relationships between students and teachers, but I also heard you saying that the way this will be successful is that your mental health practitioners will develop relationships. They have a space. They're in the classrooms. They connect not only with students, but with teachers. Um, and I've heard that described as visibility, which it is. So just some of my observations. Thank you so much for provoking thoughts and for, for the programs and you know what benefit it will have. It'll be interesting in a year or two to see the positive results. And I'm glad you guys had the opportunity to listen to Jen McNally. We actually had her at Wilbur several years ago to help work with our staff on some tools that they could use uh, for themselves as well as some of the students that were creating. Fantastic program, much more established than, than where we're at. So again, an, a, just a different way of pro approaching mental health. I'm kind of at a, yes, we need to educate our staff, but where do we go for our kids that are most in crisis? Because when I'm asked what's the most challenging thing in my career, it's a teacher or student death. And a student death due to suicide is just horrific for, for the emotional well-being of the entire school. And so, you know, I, I want to be able to have our staff identify what those things are what those signals might be, and then have the pieces in place and, and places for those kids to go. Um, I wanted to say to you, Michelle, that I thought your analogy was delightful and that we really don't change very much, do we? <laughs> Sometimes um, it's still the, the big scary in the yellow zone. I yes, might have been is. when I walked in today. <laughs> I've been in the big scary zone several times in my life that I think that analogy worked beautifully to explain what the question was. Um, I uh, want to congratulate you on something that um, I believe is um, very important and that's your courage. This is a, cor a courageous endeavor and it looks to me like you're on your way to succeeding and setting a goal no matter what the obstacles are in our current um, culture, you are keeping your eyes straight ahead on the kids in Nebraska and what's good for them. And I appreciate that kind of courage. So thank you not only for having that, but being here to share it with us. Anybody else? Maureen? I just want to add that our NDE staff that has worked so hard to get all of this coordinated with the other groups, you've done an amazing job. Thank you. And I'm sure there's others on your team as well that aren't here. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and let's give them a round of
Agenda item 3.1 and 3.1A, Commissioner. Yeah, on the, um, just the overview, I've got a couple, uh, uh, I guess they were requested of the board, from the board on a couple topics here underneath this report. But first of all, just a little of the, the housekeeping. We do have uh, three items that were asked to be removed from the consent agenda. Um, item 5.2.B, item 5.3.B, and item 5.3.F. And so when we get to that, that point, we'd have a motion on the, um, that would exclude those three items, and we'll take those up under additional business. Uh, I'm gonna invite on up uh, Brad Dirksen and Lane Carr uh, to address item 3.2, which is a discussion of the educator pipeline investments and educator, ed educator certification enhancements. And then after that, we actually will take, um, take up, uh, and I believe Katie Graham later will t be here for our presentation on 3.2. Three. So, Brad and Lane, welcome. Perfect. Well, good morning, board. It's good to see you. Lane Carr from the Office of Policy and Strategic Initiatives. And Brad Dirksen from uh, the Office of Accountability, Accreditation, and Program Approval. And uh, for the next two hours, we are going to be <laughs> sharing with you. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, in all reality, this is such an important topic, and Brad and I were part of an NDE team that presented at Admin Days. I think a few of you were at that presentation, so some of these slides may look familiar. Um, this is a critical topic, and one that uh, we're ex excited to share with you about the progress that's been made and the opportunities that we have. Before we dive into some of the things that NDE is already doing, and again, some of the policy levers that we have at our disposal uh, to, to work towards uh, shortening or um, uh, lessening the teacher shortage, I wanted to just spend just a, a real quick second talking about some of the causes um, uh, or perceived causes of the educator shortage. And you have a few handouts in Spark, and so I would encourage you to sort of watch those as they come across as well. The first that I wanted to share about is the teacher vacancy survey that NDE puts out annually. And I, I just want to specifically call out that when we talk about the shortage, certainly we're short on a lot of the staff, but it's actually particularly acute in certain areas. And you'll see that we've had consistent shortage areas from 2016 to today uh, in the areas of special education, career and technical education areas, ELA and math, music, school counselors. I was so encouraged to hear a school counselor today talk about the work that she's um, uh, leading and, and will be engaging in, um, and certainly world languages among others. I also wanted to share this like broader educator shortage in context. So this comes from a McKinsey and Company uh, recent report that they put out about the, the workforce shortage in general. And I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but we have to understand that the teacher shortage is part of a larger workforce shortage. Nebraska has a 1.7%, I think, at the last time, uh, unemployment rate, which is incredible. So we are just needing more people. And you'll see one of the additional reasons, some of the other reasons that people are moving out of their jobs. Again, this isn't specific to teachers, um, but lack of career advancement, inadequate total compensation, um, and many others in that as well. And then really specifically around teachers, several themes across both of these, lack of support and engagement, um, a, an inability to collaborate and grow in a meaningful way for teachers, non-commensurate compensation, again, that lack of leadership, and then a lack of recognition of excellence, not only uh, statewide, nationwide, but also within the communities. So I offer those sort of as a little bit of context as we dig into then, well, what do we do about this? Collectively, what is the work that we all need to be uh, engaging in to address the teacher shortage? So I do wanna share then a little bit about what we have already done, some work that has been going on. And so in about December, uh, several NDE staff got together and tried to think, you know, it isn't a monolithic issue of the teacher shortage. We need to really break it down and be specific across recruitment, preparation, and retention of teachers. And so we did sort of an inventory of that and uh, went through the uh, existing programs at the NDE that are supporting uh, teachers, that are supporting 
uh, the educator workforce across these three areas. And this is a handout that you all have access to. It's the uh, link for these slides is also in Spark, so you can click on these specific websites that are linked here as well. You can see there's a lot, you all, that NDE has been doing and does across multiple different offices and divisions. And Brad's gonna speak a little bit about teacher certification and the opportunities there as well. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is uh, an educator shortage grant. We worked really closely with NACTI in April and conv convened stakeholders to talk about, well, what could we do with some ESSER funds? And so you'll actually see those, uh, uh, those applicants that were selected through a, a really rigorous process, um, and we had some fantastic ideas. Um, several of them include, or I just listed a couple here, and you'll see the full list uh, later on um, in the agenda. And one of the ones that I'm really excited about is from NACTI, actually, that is a Teacher Shortage Summit 2.0. So we're really thrilled to have sort of a follow-up on that conversation that occurred in October. And then I just also wanted to share a little bit more about the ESSER investments. So that teacher shortage grant that, we, uh, we, that I just spoke about is certainly one. Um, and then there are other things that we have done with our ESSER funds that support teachers. Certainly this panel that you just had up here um, was able to share about mental health and the supports that that access to mental health for students and staff has been able to um, uh, be extended uh, in that capacity instructional material supports, professional learning, and then a full list uh, throughout that time. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit too and talk about a recent bill that was passed in the legislature, uh, LB 1218, that was a significant um, uh, uh, bill and provided a lot of progress uh, from the state as well. So I'll talk about the first two and then I'll turn it to Brad uh, to sort of bring us home here. But the first uh, with 1218 that we were really excited to see is additional funding, state general fund dollars allocated to teacher loan repayment. So a $5 million per year allocation, and that will begin in the fall of 2023. So we're working out the details on how we make that happen, how we um, advertise about it, because we really wanna make sure that teachers take a, teachers in public and non-public schools and educators in public and non-public schools are really taking advantage of this important um, legislation. You might have seen on our earlier slide that there was some information about the AETP program, the Attracting Excellence in Teaching program. 1218 added a really important provision that takes place this fall, which extends the AETP eligibility to student teachers who apply for the AETP. Um, so we're excited for that. That's, that's significant because it's something that is for specifically student teachers. I'm gonna turn it to Brad to talk about these next two areas. Yeah, a couple other things that was included in uh, LB 1218 was uh, removing the, the ability for us as a Department of Education to mandate basic skills competency as an entrance requirement into educator preparation programs, which has opened the door up to more teacher preparation candidates and provide some flexibility into, into educator preparation programs. So kind of opening up the pipeline a little bit on the educator uh, preparation side of things. There's also a piece in LB 1218 that uh, addresses out-of-state teacher. Uh, it's not directly reciprocity, but it allows out-of-state educators to come to Nebraska a lot uh, in, in a more efficient manner, as long as they've had a, uh, a certificate in another state, held that certificate for a year, have a bachelor's degree that's a, a pathway into the state of Nebraska um, in, in a lot different a different way. Green button. Green button. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, policy levers that currently the Department of Education has and also some opportunities moving the work forward and kind of what we're to look at. I think it's really important to look at one of the very important levers that all of you are probably familiar with, and these are just four rules out of very many uh, rules that the department has around Rule 10 being accreditation of public schools and some non-public schools, approval of non-public schools. And then also educator preparation approval with Rule 20, Rule 21 being certification, but the list could go on with endorsements with Rule 24, basic skills competency with Rule 23, and, and a variety of other rules. But I think it's important to look at uh, the educator pipeline 
from a variety of different uh, perspectives. It's not just certification. Um, there are other pieces of the entire system, and there's different levers within each of those rules that you can kind of pull, move, and change to affect the system as a whole. So it's a good to keep that systems approach when we're looking at rules and regulations. For example, uh, when we look at Rule 10, um, it is required that everyone in state law, it requires everyone to have a certificated teacher in the classroom, in every single classroom. However, there is uh, flexibility currently embedded within Rule 10 around properly endorsed teachers. So as you see on the slide, Rule 10 requires 95% of elementary educators to be properly endorsed in their content area. Middle schools is 90%, and then high schools or secondary schools is 80%. So there's a little bit of flexibility when we're looking at educator shortages of the ability for a, a school administrator to be able to utilize their staff members appropriately and, and, and move people around as they, as they see what's best. And again, I think it's always important with these flexibilities that are currently available to educators and also as we're uh, looking to adjust rules as we see barriers, alternatives that we can create is to keep the students in mind is what is best for students. Not just what's best to meet a regulation, but really what's best for students. There's also some additional flexibility within Rule 10 right now in regards to a teacher that has a subject endorsement, such as like a history endorsement. They can teach in a field area if they take six credit hours in that field. So if they're teaching economics or psychology, sociology, there's some flexibility there. Integrated courses, there's flexibilities. Also, teachers can get a provisional endorsement if they're 50% complete within a program for, for that endorsement area. So there's lots of other types of flexibilities within Rule 10. Those are just a few to kind of highlight um, uh, of what they're already embedded within the rule. So we routed administrator days trying to ensure that administrators understand what some of those current flexibilities are, uh, just so they're aware of those uh, current flexibilities before we start looking at changing um, and having additional flexibilities. But we have engaged uh, uh, of administrators in those conversations a lot, and we start to hear areas that are concerning or, or are issues. One of those areas that have been an issue has been educator certification. Um, so we have really stepped up in certification, changing from an old uh, computer system to a new system, and we have invested significantly in that educator certification system. We've increased our staff capacity. We use ESSER 3 funds, committed $1.2 million over the next three years to increase staff. So we're going from a staff of five to a staff of 10. So we're really ramping up our ability to support. It does take some time to uh, upskill and train that staff so we're not completely at full capacity yet from an operational standpoint, but we're definitely trending in that direction. You can see some statistics on there that we're issuing more certificates compared to uh, last year in and, and, and we're doing those in a lot quicker of a method. We're also tracking our communication and our response times, so we're really data-driven and data-focused in regards to our improvements with the certification office. Are we there yet completely? No, we're not. However, we've made significant improvements over the last couple of years, and we're really trending in that direction to continuing to look at that customer service, that, that approach to um, serve our, our teachers and our educators as best as possible through educator certification. Another piece is we have been engaging in these conversations with um, educators across the state and through especially the pandemic, we're always having an open ear. We want to hear what the trouble spots are, what are the issues, what are the problems that educators are facing, especially with the pandemic and the issues that have happened in the last few years within the state of Nebraska, it's important that the department is responsive to educators and what those needs are. So another lever that we have here at the Department of Education is the commissioner's ability to provide some guidance and some direction to schools. The commissioner's provided guidance on a, a variety of different areas over the course of the pandemic, and that some of that guidance has been continued on to this upcoming school year, which includes flexibilities around local sub-permits, the additional days beyond the 90 days, which is already embedded within Rule 21. However, we wanted to bring it to the, the forefront of, of educators in, in the field to make sure that they can utilize those types of uh, pieces that are already embedded within Rule. Um, the Nebraska Entry Permit is also another uh, piece that was from LB 1218. Again, LB 1218 with that flexibility for out-of-state teachers uh, took effect or was signed in law April 20th by the governor, 90 days later it becomes um, law, so we have to operationalize that. So the, the Nebraska Entry Permit, the commissioner issued guidance around the Nebraska Entry Permit to operationalize it before we're able to formalize it within a Rule 21 change. So one thing you'll see here 
upcoming in the, in the next few months is how do we codify some of that pieces into actual rule and how to operationalize the Nebraska entry permits. So that'll be uh, a future item that's gonna be coming up. Also some guidance around the content flexibility for content tests, paraeducator, and then also instructional hours with rules 10, 11, and 14. Any questions that you may have around this topic? Thank you for asking. <coughs> oh, okay, speak into the mic, okay. Um, with that local substitute, um, do schools generally say somebody um, isn't a teacher and they're a businessman or somebody is a mechanical something or other, do they try and fit the local subs to something that uh, is related to their business or is it just anybody who has an interest would sub using that local permit? Um, really how the, the hiring and the placement of those teachers is really a local decision in regards to what a district's needs are and how they are gonna best fill their needs. Um, the local sub permit is available for anyone that has 60 credit hours of post-secondary education and meets some other uh, requirements. They apply to the department, but how they're hired and utilized is really a local decision. Okay, thank you. Brad, do uh, substitutes, do retired teachers still have to go back and get their substitute license or can they work with their teacher certificate? If they have a teaching certificate, they can substitute teach with that teaching certificate. Once their teaching certificate expires, they can sometimes renew their teaching certificate, but we also have a state substitute permit that is also available to teachers that are retired. Thank you. Mo, Maureen, did you have your hand up? Deborah. Thank you. Uh, I know these issues are complex, for sure. Um, but I guess I want to, try to get into some specific details. And I know you touched on this, but I really want to know the timeline for completion for three things. I attended a summit a year ago with some of my peers on the board. I felt like at the end of, the, and that was, you know, uh, across all sectors of the education community were part of the conversation about what do we do about the teacher shortage? And we know that, yeah, there's workforce development issues, but there's been a decline in the number of teachers since 2008 here in Nebraska. So, and as long as I've been on the board, I've just heard constantly about when are we gonna get rid of the praxis. And so, and I thought I heard, I thought I heard at that summit three things that were short-term goals that we were gonna get rid of the praxis, that we were gonna have a reciprocal certification for our neighboring states, and that there was a class, a specific coursework class that was required that most people felt were not necessary. And so I'm wondering, are those near completion, and when do we think we are gonna take those steps to remove the praxis as a requirement? And I know that's a complex question, but yeah, thank you. And it might be best I try to answer it, and certainly Brad and Lane can contribute to the answer if I'm not, if I'm missing something. But I think on the on the very, we actually did pursue legislation around those points. So LB 1218 actually included those subjects, right? But not in, not included in the final passage of 1218 was the elimination of the basic skills competency exam which is what I think most people, when you say praxis, I think they're talking about the basic skills. Praxis one, sometimes it's referred to. Here's my real recommendation to the board. I believe that we actually ought to go back into Rule 23, start that process again. Um, and I actually would recommend that we would probably eliminate Rule 23. The law was changed slightly, as that we can no longer require that praxis uh, uh, is a is a condition of entry into into teacher colleges, but it didn't remove the requirement that practice basic skills test was part of that going forward for the completion of those programs. And I think it's kind of long-standing debate of how do you do you let a test make a decision, 
or do you let a test inform a decision along the way? And I think those things are what I would recommend that we would actually dive into. It doesn't say we couldn't go through that process and redo that. It would actually, in, in one possible approach, and I doesn't mean it's the only possible approach, is that we'd actually recommend striking all of Rule 23 and resetting that whole direction, and that would be permissible underneath the current law. But it did not eliminate that within the current law, so therefore current law includes those rules, right? And so I think that's our, I, I think Brad presented it somewhat as a policy and opportunity lever. That's one policy and opportunity lever I'd recommend that we, that we consider going down that path. Um, Timeline is, is dependent on all of those different, you know, kind of re requirements ultimately. Now remember, and here's one thing that years ago happened. When you embed the, the specific test in the rule, that paints us into a corner. I do not recommend that we would go down that path because it doesn't allow us to be flexible with the, the times and the types of products that are there and kind of what's happened to, to you know, assessments overall. So I'd recommend doing that. I think the other one that you mentioned, so we, we addressed the in 1218 and that Brad addressed that somewhat in the re reciprocity with other states. And I think our approach is actually not just very good, but unique um, on how we're going to do that. Basically, if a, if a teacher comes with a certificate or permit from another state and a school wants to hire them, that's that entry permit that, that Brad was talking about. And I think it's a really great, that's a great one that I, I want to check the box on. So if we could do that. The, the last one, I think, is the human relations course, but I'm not 100% sure that was the reference. So there are all, are, there are all are alternatives to that approach. And so what we will do is issue guidance on what those alternatives are. We've done it before. We kind of do hit and miss guidance. But what we've kind of done in the midst of the, of the pandemic time is to issue that guidance so people can be a lot clearer about what those alternatives are. Robin. I, I'm just going to follow up on what Deborah and the Commissioner just talked about. Uh, in particular, uh, I want to recognize that we do have a couple of the um, uh, facilitators that were at that um, summit that, that are here today to listen to this conversation. And I, I believe, uh, as we have noticed with other issues, mental health not the least, that when we partner uh, with with our colleges, our universities, uh, that things work a lot better. So I'm really excited to see those those uh, those directors here today to listen to this conversation, and I hope that that um, conversation just continues. Then I just want to ask a question here about praxis, okay, or the competency base. Okay, we do they uh, the colleges, universities do not if I'm hearing this correctly, and I think the commissioner said it as well, cannot ask for a competency test in order to enter the education uh, college. Is that correct? It's a, it's a slight nuance is the department can't mandate it as a minimum entrance requirement, so we can't have it in Rule 20, which is going to require us to change and update Rule 20 in that sense. They can, as an institution, decide that they want to require it. Mm -hmm. However, with conversations, a lot of uh, educator preparation institutions are either removing that requirement or having students sign waivers and really kind of having that discussion with them of what that means. Okay, now is, help me with definitions again. Is that praxis one? That would be the what people often refer to as praxis one, the praxis core basic skills competency requirement is really what it meets. Okay, all right. And then what are the other practices that have to be done? There is a content test also at the end of a program specifically towards a content area. Okay, thank you very much. Certainly. Kirk. Okay, so I was at the meeting with Deborah, and uh, we had a bunch of questions and, and Patsy was there and we had some questions and it, it did just stay on teacher certification. So it, we need to get some things figured out. So we're not going, we cannot mandate Praxis 1, NDE cannot mandate Praxis 1 to, to get into Teachers College. Okay? But they have to take it within that four years or five years, however long it takes them to go. Correct? Am I on the right path? It, it's not a graduation requirement necessarily, but it is a requirement for certification. For certification. Yes. Okay. Correct. In that content. Area. 
in there. Okay, but that's praxis one. Praxis two would be the contents, specific, specifically science or math or something of that nature. So you go through four years of school and you take all the tests you've been taught, you student teach, you, you're looked at and, and everybody says, hey, you can teach. And then you take your Praxis two test and hey, you're good at math. And you go, you get your math job, you teach for a year, the administration looks and says, hey, this person is a good teacher. And maybe that teacher wants, to, since he's, he or she is in math, maybe math and science relate real well, just common fact probably. Do they have to go back for 36 hours and get their masters in order to get, to take the test for the science or how many hours? My point is you teach, you, you're taught how to teach, you pass your math content to what's keeping you, or excuse me, praxis to, what's keeping you from taking praxis to in science? I think you're referring to the process to add an endorsement area mm -hmm. for a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the current pathway is to take additional coursework um, and then take the content test in order to teach in that additional how much, area. How much coursework is it's, that? It's the same amount of coursework as a new teacher in those different areas. There is the flexibility, as I mentioned, in Rule 10 and 14 in regards to prop the percentage of properly endorsed teachers. So a district or a school system can utilize teachers outside of their content area, right. different content areas, right. and there's a limited amount of flexibility for that. Right. Um, one topic um, that has been brought up with the Educator Shortage Summit has been the ability for current teachers to add additional endorsement areas and what those barriers are. Um, there are a lot of conversations about multiple majors and not having a singular high stakes test. Um, I think there's definitely conversations that are going to be had and continue to have around um, how do we uh, provide pathways for our current teachers to add additional endorsement and what are appropriate flexibilities um, <clears throat> with uh, the caveat of keeping students in mind and wanting to make sure that we have the best qualified professionals and um, we're not just giving someone endorsement because they can pass a test because that's one singular measure of looking at different opportunities and pathways for those individuals. Okay, so you're, you're taught how to teach and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna beat on this a little bit. You're taught how to teach you pass your content practice two in math. You know how to teach once you've had a year, your superintendent or your administrator watches you, you know how to teach, you've been, you've been valued and judged, so to speak. You, you don't see the, the ease of just taking content, a different content maybe in science and pass that test because they already know how to teach. What's, why do they have to go back and get another 20, 30 hours in that area, if they can pass the content area, why are you making them go back and spend their money to, for another two or three years to get that endorsement? So, I, and, and I think what you're talking about is what are alternative ways that folks could add endorsement areas, uh -huh. and Nebraska doesn't use a uh, practice. That, I mean, just to clarify that we're not using just the test. It does require that the other coursework's taken. Now, is it possible to create a model where there'd be competencies that were added to that, not just passing the test, right? Mm -hmm. It's possible, but we'd have to define what that would look like within one of our rules. So, I mean, okay. I think the, the hard part for Brad is Brad's job is to implement the, the rule and law right. as you have it, right? And for this board, for us to think about, hey, look, do you want competency type models that would expand endorsement areas, which I think our, our post-secondary institutions would probably also have some ideas, thoughts on how we would, how, how that would be appropriate. I have asked some, some of our post-secondary partners to give that thought, like what's that take for someone if they are a math teacher, maybe they had some science, right? How do they get endorsed in that science to be able to broaden that endorsement in the shortest path possible? Right. You know, and I think balancing that out is what you're asking. How would we go about doing that? It would take rule change for us. Mm -hmm. I don't think it takes any law change. So I mean, other than the rule is a law in that sense, but, but it would be possible to explore that, yes. Okay, well, it just makes sense. We're in a teacher shortage here. Um, it would open up flexibilities for the superintendents. Um, it opens up a whole, whole gamut of opportunities you can have when you have areas that are, you're short in or you have areas or content areas that uh, you have shortage in teachers. So um, just wanted to, to talk about that a little bit. Kurt, can I just add one thing because I don't want, I think it's, 
so like our career education permit is one of those areas where we have provided that flexibility in addition to that. So that we have some models that'd be worth exploring. Okay, so it's not, we're not reinventing the wheel. We right. do it a yeah. little bit. What's keeping us from going that direction? Um, I don't think anything's, we've gone, we've given actually quite a few provisional endorsement areas as well for folks, okay. but they're still, you know, working towards it. But there would be an opportunity for us to look at that process, certainly. Okay. Okay. Um, well, and then we talked, you talked a little bit about reciprocity from state to state. Um, and you talked about timeline, Deborah. Um, timeline. I mean, we got to go back in and, and do a lot of changes are you talking a year so some of that it's not direct reciprocity but that Nebraska entry permits really opening doorways and that was passed by the legislature signed by the governor um, April 20th 90 days later it's state law so the commissioner's guidance is that bridge right now and we're working on promulgating rule 21 to really codify what those Nebraska entry permit regulations are so you'll see that within the next few months at the board so we are looking at that uh, pathway to really open up the doors not direct reciprocity but kind of a bridge into Nebraska and removing barriers we are allowing it now so I'm using okay. the guidance to implement the law okay and the guidance is a precursor ultimately to making sure the rule can be done because the law did change that allows us okay. to do that so we're taking that guidance as kind of a step so we could immediately apply that for for this year so it it, it, it exists now okay is what so that's a really good thing I mean but we have to actually ultimately put it into the rule to kind of fully implement I think in the in the long run so okay. so just a couple examples help me out here so if I'm a elementary teach teacher in Northeast Nebraska I'm fluent in Spanish I could go across into South Dakota take a test and teach Spanish in South Dakota I can't take Praxis 2 and teach Spanish in Nebraska even though I'm fluent in Spanish that's, that's actually a really good example of one endorsement area that has some flexibility and actually the current revision of Rule 24, which we're in process of doing, um, provides even additional flexibility. The world language endorsement right now, um, the educator preparation institution can waive up to 15 hours under current regulation in Rule 24. Um, the board's looking to increase that amount of flexibility, which was actually passed last August um, and came back from us from the governor. Um, but we provide additional flexibility to actually provide uh, endorsements in individuals to demonstrate competency in other ways. Okay. So in a sense, waive all 30 hours of, of, of uh, content in, in world language specifically for those teachers that are fluent in Spanish or fluent in other languages. So there is a, kind of a model out there with world language. Okay. So you have a model set that you could do t in other areas, math, science. You, there is a model out there, so we don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. Okay, that's great. Um, middle school math teacher situation. Hey, we got some open classes in high school. That's a different praxis test, content test. Middle school, you, you sent me an email, so I just want to clarify it. So the middle school or 5-8, um, test is different than the 912 test okay so the middle school teacher again I'm back to this uh, great middle school teacher great with kids knows how to teach been teaching there 10 years he can't just take the high school praxis 2 test and start teaching high school if they need that so they don't take the dink not under the current regulations that are right there. There again, there is that flexibility in regards to per properly endorsed percentages. Okay. So a, a local school system could utilize that flexibility. Um, but that is one of the conversations. How do we allow and reduce barriers, create alternative pathways, which okay. is some of the board's regulatory priorities. And we are continuing to have those conversations about adding endorsement and creating those flexibilities. Okay. And so same thing would be, you got elementary teachers that it would be great FCS teachers, which we have a huge shortage on. They can't, is there an FCS Praxis two test? I do not know that. I'll, I'll claim ignorance. Katie, is there? Yes, there is. Okay, so there is. Same, same situation. You have proven teachers that can teach, but right now the system is you've got to go back and take 30, how many hours? I mean, mainly 30, get your master's basically in order for you to take this, the test that you could pass without taking that? 
I don't know that I would put a number of hours okay. on it because it's really going to depend on what courses they had, okay. right? I mean, but yes, if they didn't have all the courses, they would have to take those courses and then still under, again, under the rule okay. that the board has some ability to uh, address, could, uh, it, they, they currently would have to do that. We could have those conversations and have had those conversations, quite frankly, about how to create those other pathways to do that. Okay. Yes. So my point is we're in a teacher shortage here. It's been a long time. These are some really, to me, very simple ideas that we can do without making teachers, A, spend their summer at UNK taking summer courses, paying that at the same time when they can pass the test. They know how to teach. They're, they're literate in the content. Who's driving the classes? That they have to take it must be us huh? at rule 20 whatever are we driving that or is that a collaboration with the teachers colleges yeah i think it is somewhat of the collaborate it's certainly in the rule has been built right so i mean you could say oh yeah it's that but it's not that rule is not constructed without the interaction with those with okay. those institutions do you too. think they would push back if we did something like that oh, some are in the room so i don't know i can speak for them so. <laughs> Okay, that, excellent. You helped me out tremendously. I appreciate that. I will tell you on the substitute teacher stuff, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, but it took a guy I know who uh, is my son six months to get his local sub teacher. So we got to get better at that. Then Lisa, then Deborah. Um, some good conversation here. Kirk, I just want to make sure I'm not totally confused because I, I, I sense the feeling of, okay, we have a great teacher in their endorsed area, but I feel like you're walking down that road of watering down. A great teacher is a great teacher in their endorsed area, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if they were asked to go to a different content area out of their endorsement, that they're going to be that great teacher. Yes, we can have 15 to 20% at the high school level out of their endorsed areas. Uh, I know that my understanding from educators that have been asked to teach out of their content area, that's a slippery slope for them right away at least in our public schools anyway. Um, so I just want to ensure that you're not looking to water down the content of what a teacher needs to do in order to be teaching in an area because we have a teacher shortage. It's important for me that our teachers be well endorsed in their content area if we are going to do the justice that our students deserve. Um, so I, I, I just need that clarification from you, if I could get that from you, because you've got the clarification. Like private and parochial, <laughs> they don't always have to be in private and parochial. They don't always have to be endorsed in their areas, right. I believe, or at least they don't have to follow the same standards as the public. So I just want to ensure that I have a good understanding of where you're going with right. this. I am not watering down the, the teacher uh, or the educator. I'm not watering it down. I'm trying to give flexibility to superintendents and administrators that if this teacher who knows how to teach and can pass Praxis two in another content area, let's let him, let him or her teach. Uh, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. You guys were first. I've had my thing up, but. Before me, so. All right, go ahead. Pat. Uh, it's okay, you guys, you're all getting, I'm gonna get to all of you. <laughs> Microphone, okay. Uh, Brad, you and I have talked about this before and uh, we're, Right now, um, a person going into the teaching program gets in there, uh, passes the Praxis II content area, and then goes to get certified and can't be certified. We talked about that, and 
I just wondered, is there a timeline on how the changes can be made? I know you, you said you were gonna be, or your staff, or uh, can you explain to me when the change will happen so that they can automatically, after going through the teacher preparation program, student teaching, all of that, and the count to certi get certified and haven't taken the praxis. Uh, explain that to me again. It's a while since we talked about it. And if how is that in the works to be changed so that they can go through the program and be certified right away if they've met the requirements, general requirements? Does that make sense? Yeah, there's uh, a variety of different regulations that are at play. We have Rule 20, uh, Rule 21, 23, 24, and they interplay with all those rules. We have um, some regulations that are um, currently being routed through the process um, have come back to us uh, with Rule 20, 21, 24. The board's going to see all those regulations within the next few months. Okay. Um, so some of those issues may be addressed through those regulations, but even as we're updating those regulations, it doesn't mean that that's the final stop. Uh, okay. So if there's different pieces, um, we'll continue to address the, both uh, the basic skills competency uh, piece as the commissioner proposed some, some potential routes that we could go through. Um, and also we're continuing to look at the Praxis content test as well as was brought up at the Educator Shortage Summit. Um, continued conversations are had around that, um, especially through organizations like uh, the advisory to the board, which is the Nebraska Council on Teacher Education, which is a partnership of educator preparation institutions, uh, administrators, teachers, and the department that have these types of discussions at their meetings um, and really trying to propose and make some uh, meaningful changes to those regulations. So I'm glad here in the next few months and then I wasn't sure about that final piece. We hadn't talked about the final piece after going through those rules, so I'll ask some other time later. But thank you for that explanation and I'm glad it's in the next few months. Patty. There are so many things I want to say, so I'm trying to narrow it down so that I'm as succinct as possible. Building on um, Kirk, both your comments and Mo, your comments, and I'm coming at this from the perspective of a teacher educator, right? Because that's where I lived. There are three categories of coursework that people in teacher education take. Your gen eds, right? All those things that people in teacher ed said, I'm not gonna be a music teacher, or why do I have to take music and Western culture, right? They're, they're what provide us with a broad base of knowledge. But it isn't just content. I know so many people who know their content inside and out and they do not know how to teach. So there are content coursework, there's content coursework, and there's pedagogical coursework. And I guarantee you, Kirk, as much as I'd like to believe it, my experience is the way I taught college students would not have worked when I went in and taught kindergartners, right? There are different sets of skills depending not only on the developmental level of your students, but also on the content. Math teaching is very different than inquiry-based science teaching. So I'm not opposed to having some pathways, but I guess what I'm saying is we do anyone who is trying to be a teacher in a content area a disservice if we don't prepare them with a pedagogy. I also am passionate about teaching as a profession. The last thing I want is for us to, eat, whether it's intentional or unintentional, to really do things that reduce high quality teaching and learning. And I sympathize, believe me, you know, I'm very familiar with schools that have numerous openings and struggle to find, and during the pandemic, you know, Everybody was going in and covering classes because you had teachers absent. We have those kinds of emergency situations. But I think we need to be, we need to keep in mind, it's not just about filling a shortage 
It's about finding different pathways for people to become successful teachers so that all of our students have opportunities to learn in the best ways possible. Okay, that's my sermon. Okay, Deborah. I appreciated that sermon because you bring an expertise that I don't have, which leads me to my next point is thank you. I learned a lot today. I appreciate all that you guys are doing uh, because these are complex issues. I, you know, I have thought a lot recently about how I've been on the board for four years, and the one thing I know for sure is that there's so much I still don't know, you know, because it, these are so complex. So uh, I appreciated the discussion today and learned a lot. Um, and I just have a question for you, Dr. Blum said. I want to make sure I understand a next step regarding the comp competency. Comp <laughs> All right, I'm going to say this: the competency-based test, <laughs> often referred to as Praxis, that if we want to look at changing Rule 23 or getting rid of it, is that something that we need to bring to our Rules and Regs Committee? Is that correct as a next step? Yeah, and so okay. if we're gonna make changes in that, and, and we, we've been trying to reflect as a team, like, okay, okay, how do we now move on that? Obviously, we've been interested in implementing what was passed in 1218. Right. There was a change as it re relates to this, and I know Brad has worked on rule, that's in Rule 20, right, Brad, that removing that requirements in Rule 20. We've already given guidance to the, to the, all of the post-secondary post -secondary institutions that that's there. What I would recommend is if we want to address uh, how Praxis Core works or how that, then we should take that on. And, okay. and there's maybe several ways it could be done. I throw out one simple way and then that forces the conversation anyway. So. Thank you. Robin. Just want to make sure everyone understands uh, we pass changes in 23, 24, 25, 108, 99. Is, there, is that it? Or is there a final step to this? In other words, if the NDE, if the state board passes a change in any of those, is it all done? <laughs> Patsy, can oh, I? Oh, oh can yeah, I no. speak? Patsy, can I respond? Uh, yes, you can. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh. Yes, Robin. It has to go somewhere else, and that's the comment that I wanted to speak on. So, um, one part that I think that we have not talked about or discussed in this entire conversation is the rules and reg process. And we discussed some of the rule and reg process in the rules and reg committee, but I realized maybe we haven't discussed that process as a whole, the board, and understanding that. And the reason why I think that's important and to kind of discuss what I think Robin was talking about is we don't get to pass rules and regulation without a process. Part of that process is the public comment process, and so being able to navigate the different opinions and thoughts that come from the state of Nebraska, any citizen who's able to participate in that public comment process. We have teachers who are passionate about their industry and they have thoughts and voices that want to be heard um, as it relates to these things. And so we, as a board, have to weigh that. But as we probably all recently received a letter um, our policies and our, our rules and regs go to the governor's office. And so the governor has to sign off on these changes. And while I don't know personally, I've heard that has been a challenge. Some of these, can you guys hear me? Hello? Some of the conversations that we have had is, is the current governor going to support these changes that we are going to propose to make because if we don't have that support, our rules and regs could be sent back to us. And so I am hoping that everyone who seems very, who is very passionate about this today 
um, and, and believes that there needs to be changes if you have relationships there, um, it's time to start leveraging those relationships and starting to have those conversations because that has been um, a topic of conversation is can we get the support and knowing, and one of the things I've been saying to other board members and talking about in the rules and regs is as we are going through an election season and we know without a doubt we're gonna have a new governor come January, I think it's time that we start to initiate those conversations with whoever is going to be elected our next governor because we are going to have to work in partnership and in tandem um, on the policy side of those things. So I think um, that's a part that needs to be answered. Um, Robin, I, I have more thoughts, but I, I want if you have response. Robin. Yeah. Thank you for answering my rhetorical question. <laughs> so um, just wanted to make a couple of comments. So one thing I wanted to comment on is I believe that the executive committee did delegate the rules and regulations committee the responsibility of looking at what should be our rule and reg priorities for the upcoming year for the board. And so I do think that this is a place where the rules and regs committee needs to uh, be focused and to bring that information back to the board. So my understanding is that is in process. And so we'll be working on that going forward. Um, as far as this particular presentation goes, um, I want to just talk to the board members sitting around this table. We heard we got a lot of good applicants to talk about or grant applicants to talk about teacher certification and the, how we can solve some of the teacher shortages and different innovation. And I want to just kind of put a point here that that started with us around this table advocating that that area got more ESSER funds and attention. And so if we care about something, we do have the ability to impact that change. And I think all of the things that happened here are really great, but I think it happened because we, as a board, pushed for it to happen. And so I want us to kind of celebrate that today and also reflect on it that that's why we're here, is to make sure things like this are made possible. Um, one of the other things, I don't need the answer from it, answer today, but one of the things I asked Brad about a year ago at one of those conferences is, as we're looking at teachers coming to Nebraska or leaving Nebraska, what data are we collecting from those teachers to determine where are they coming from, where are they going? Because if we're collecting the information about who's coming here, where we're going, we can better respond to what those needs are, whether that be looking at the reciprocity uh, with other states and where those things are. And so um, don't need an answer today, but would like an email response to discuss what type of information are we collecting on the teaching industry. Also, if we have teachers leaving at the local level, what information is being collected and aggregated across the state so that we can collect that information as a department and see where we need to respond to why people are leaving, what their reasons are, and, and being able to respond to that. So would like to get more information about that. The last question that I want to touch on, I believe we approved ESSER funding or funding for additional staff members for this particular department to be able to increase some of the efficiencies or inefficiencies um, that I believe Kirk was referring to. And so question I do have is, am I right in that assessment? And if I am, what changes have you seen or what improvements have been made? Yeah, we did, uh, or the board committed 1.2 million towards uh, over the th course of three years in SR3 funds to the certification office. Uh, we had a staff of five. We've increased that to a staff of 10. We've had three new um, analysts, certification analysts, to assist in processing applications. It does take a period of time to train those analysts because it is an extremely complex system. So they are in process of learning a lot of those things. So our capacity has increased. We are processing certificates a lot quicker than we have been previous, in previous years. Part of that was some of the slides that was up there. We have also hired and increased two additional help desk uh, support 
to answer the incoming emails and questions that uh, constituents have in regards to certification and the questions. Um, and we just recently hired a temporary employee to answer in the phones frontline to have those conversations and be able to create support tickets uh, so the analysts can help answer those questions. We've uh, really started to track and look at our data so we can make decisions around when do we need to ramp up, do we need to add temporary employees, what is our current needs. So we're enabling ourselves to make those data informed decisions in regards to staffing and what staff is going to be needed in the future, um, especially as those SR3 funds run out. Then we'll have to look at all the different levers that we might have in regards to the certification fees, what were our funding levels, and we're having those conversations. Brad, is that information in Spark, these slides? Okay, thank you. Patty. Thank you. Um, on that particular slide that you're referring to, uh, I, I hope I m didn't miss it, but I noticed that conditional permit applications are way down. And I, I made the assumption that that's because of increased efficiency within the department, because you now can check, do criminal background checks and things like that more quickly. But I guess as an example of what Jacqueline's talking about, can, can you clarify why they went down? <laughs> yes, that's a good, a good point. And yes, conditional permits are down. Uh, conditional permits is when it's getting close to the school year and a school system will request a conditional permit because an application hasn't been processed and the teacher's starting you know, within the next few weeks. And we prioritize those conditional permits. Seeing the number going down, meaning that there's less school districts requesting those conditional permits, those last minute things that have to be done. Sometimes it's just the nature of, we've hired a teacher late and we need to prioritize applications. But that is exactly, we've processed many more applications at this point in time than we have in previous years. So that is the reasoning for less conditional permits at this point. Thank you. Well, that seems to be it on that topic. Shall we move on? Let's see. Yeah, so we'll bring up Katie Graham. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. And I, and I really appreciate the board's conversation on it, and I, it gives us a chance to think through these priorities that we need to do next. So uh, another, uh, uh, another priority for us has been around career education. So Katie Graham, thanks for, thanks for presenting on this topic. Thank you, Commissioner. I am delighted to be here today. Um, as the Commissioner said, I'm Katie Graham. I have had the privilege of serving as the State Director uh, and Administrator for the Office of Career Technical and Adult Education uh, for almost four years now. And we are, uh, I'm excited to talk about a longstanding issue, which is the state of Nebraska funding for career and technical education. All right, in your um, handout, because it's a little bit small on the screen, I wanted to um, give a high-level overview of the federal investment in career and technical education. Um, Perkins is the uh, federal law and the funding source for the nation, and it's really dedicated to increasing access to high-quality career and technical education programs of study, which is critical to ensuring programs meet the ever-changing needs, of course, of our students and employers. So big picture, and then we're gonna break it down specific to uh, Nebraska numbers. Um, but as you can see at the top of this, uh, there's about $1.2 uh, billion that the um, United States allocates towards career and technical education. That then flows through um, all of the states based on a formula which is primarily based on population. So we get one of the lower allocations. Um, it has been increasing slowly, and you can see we're right at about $7.9 million for this coming fiscal year. Once we receive those funds, uh, there's a lot of uh, earmarks and things we have to do. Perkins is not an entitlement grant, so there's a lot of things our state um, and you all as a board have had to do to make sure that we continue to receive these funds. They are split in two main ways once we get them at the state, uh, things that we can use at the department and lead, and then the majority of the funds, 85% of the funds in fact, flow directly through the department to local education agencies, both at the secondary and at the post-secondary level. So if you look, we'll start at the state side on the left-hand side. Um, you can see that our state funds uh, represent totally about 15% of that full amount. And that's split between 5% administration, which are pretty restrictive, and you can see the uses of funds there. So that's things like reviewing applications, grant monitoring, providing technical assistance, um, and making sure all of the provisions of the grant are implemented and our recipients um, have what they need. 
uh, then 10% of those funds can be used for statewide leadership activities. Many of the activities, or some I should say, are required. So there are required set-asides from our leadership funds that we must do. Uh, we must set aside $60,000 to prepare students and individuals for careers that are non-traditional for their gender. We also set aside funds to make sure that we're recruiting students from special populations into career and technical education. And we also have a set aside to support students uh, in state institutions or correctional institutions. The remainder of those leadership funds are primarily discretionary, and we use those to support career and technical programs, career and technical education programs that support statewide activity, statewide impact. A great example, this past year, we um, updated our programs of study. So those are the sequence of courses that we work really closely with business and industry and educators to make sure they're updated to the most um, uh, cutting edge and technical skills that we know are gonna be required uh, in their future occupation. So we use statewide leadership funds to carry out that process as an example. Then the majority of funds, the 85%, you can see on the right-hand side, flows through by formula that's outlined in the law uh, to be distributed to secondary and post-secondary uh, programs. Um, again, at the local level, it's also not an entitlement grant. So the locals also have to do things uh, like submit a four-year application, an annual budget, meet performance indicators to receive those funds. In our state plan, which was uh, submitted for 2020 to 2024, the board approved, and we worked through an appropriate split of funds between secondary and post-secondary, uh, which is pretty consistent with um, what most states do. Uh, so we're currently, of that remaining flow through, 60% goes to secondary programs and schools, and 40% gets split between the six different community colleges and the Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture. So I know that's a lot, um, so we'll go to the next slide and I can show you specific Nebraska numbers, um, so I think that might help as well. So again, we serve as the eligible agency to receive these funds. Um, the total fund, 7.9 million, 85%, you can see is about 6.7 million that flows through. Of that 85%, we do have the ability to reserve 15% of that, not for uses at NDE, but to earmark different um, funding options for locals to apply for, either through competitive grant programs or if they're in a rural area. And these are the different conditions outlined in law. If they have high percentages of CTE concentrators or participants, or if they have high numbers of concentrators or participants, or if they have disparities or gaps in performance, we can create different programs or earmark um, so they can then apply for that 15%. For the past number of years, we've used that fully, all 100% of that 15%, to provide our revision action grants, which I know we've talked about revision before. But again, that goes right to schools uh, in, in just a very specific way. And then the remaining flow through, as I mentioned, is the 60-40 split. And you can see that $3.4 million is the total funds that get split between uh, all 244 school districts that choose to participate. And I believe currently this year, all but five districts are. So the majority of districts are splitting, um, as you see here, just over $3 million, specifically for career and technical education. I put on the right side here what, um, how we distribute those funds to the local districts and community colleges. There's also a formula in the law. And uh, for secondary, it's primarily based on the proportion of students and school-age students who live in that district and how many of those um, are living below the poverty level. And for post-secondary, it's based on the number of students who are recipients of the federal Pell Grant or are receiving assistance from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So what do we do with all those funds? Um, Perkins really outlines required uses for both the state and locals. So what you see here are the six required uses of local funds. There are also 20 permissible uses. So in our state guidance, we help identify and prioritize based on what is required. You can see these things include providing career exploration and career development activities. Perkins funds can be used from fifth grade all the way through 12th at the secondary level and then of course at the community college level. Uh, funds can also be used and are required to be used for professional development for teachers, faculty, school leaders, administrators, specialized support personnel, um, and paraprofessionals. Uh, a lot of funds are used uh, and again required to make sure that the programs that are offered make sure, uh, ensure the students are gaining those skills necessary to 
pursue high skill, high wage, high demand occupations in Nebraska. We also have a focus on integrating those academic core areas in career and tech ed, so we're teaching that math and that science or even world languages in the context of a future career. And you can see the last two here, making sure, making sure our students are achieving at high levels. We have a number of indicators we're required to report federally uh, annually to make sure that our students in career ed are achieving high levels. And then of course, evaluating the effectiveness of you know, using all of those funds. So I put over there on some of the key activities, what we see locals you know, using funds for specifically, a lot of times is developing new programs and thinking about what it would take to add a new health science program or if they wanna add a new manufacturing pathway, you know, what would that look like? Uh, certainly career development and exploration activities. Equipment is probably one of the biggest buckets. Uh, they, uh, CTE classes are traditionally higher cost. One, because there's usually fewer students in there, so it's a higher per pupil rate. And there's often very technical and sophisticated equipment, um, and that must be industry grade, that needs to be purchased. So many of our schools have great partnerships with local area businesses and industries, and they work to obtain those. As you can see, that three million doesn't spread that far. Uh, so we've got really innovative locals who are trying to figure out how to get that incredible equipment for students. Right now, we also see a lot of districts using funds to support and create work-based learning programs, making sure those students have opportunities to not just learn about work, but learn through work while they're still in high school so they can make informed post-secondary decisions. And of course, professional development is required, but it's also one of the biggest buckets I'd say our locals use uh, Perkins funds for. Just to give you an idea also, we have, um, there's a requirement in the law that once we do that formula, if a local school district's total allocation is not at least $15,000, they must consort and group with other districts um, to be effective, knowing that a $1,000 allocation, you can't do a ton with it, but perhaps if you group up with other districts. So the majority of districts in the state consort and our incredible educational service units serve um, as leaders to help with the administration of that grant and a lot of the coordination. So uh, our larger districts stand alone, like Omaha, Millard, they are able to, um, they are over 15,000, so they run it completely themselves. So all in, we have about 40 secondary recipients uh, which includes 25 standalones, everyone else consorts, and we have six post-secondary recipients and one consortium, which includes NCTA. So now we're getting to the good stuff. All right, so that map on the right-hand side, uh, you can see Nebraska is shaded uh, garnet. Um, and in this case, this isn't a great map to be called out for. This shows across the nation which states do and do not provide categorical funding for career and technical education. And I looked, I, I keep looking, so I just wanna make sure I'm right every time, and Advanced CTE uh, is just completing an updated survey, but we remain the only state in the nation that does not provide categorical funding for career and technical education to support these programs. Uh, and we've got a lot of evidence to show the value and the return on these programs and why they work not only for students and their futures, but for the economic development and workforce development of our state. So I just wanted to share the four most common approaches to state funding across the nation briefly, uh, just to give you some ideas of opportunities we might have uh, if this were to be uh, a priority or an area we could work together to uh, go to the legislature for. So uh, the first one is a student-based formula, and this is by far the most common across the nation. And this is where uh, uh, districts would receive funds based on the number of students enrolled in CTE programs. So that could either be, be uh, proportionately or on an enrollment basis. It could be weighting classes at different levels or some sort of other differential weighting uh, that might be used. Another uh, common but less common approach would be unit-based formula, and this is where funds are distributed based on factors like the number of instructors or administrators that are employed by local education agencies, or even the equipment that might be needed to uh, be purchased to deliver that instruction. The cost-based formula is more of a reimbursement uh, formula where states can uh, reimburse districts uh, and based on their actual cost of instruction to provide career and technical education. And then the final method is where we see CTE centers. So these would exist separately from the high schools and funds could go to support um, area or regional career and tech ed centers. 
I did want to mention, while the state doesn't provide or earmark any categorical funding, so there's no line item specifically or a part of a formula for school funding, we are fortunate that through Revised Statute 79772, as I put up here, uh, it established the Center for Student Leadership and Expanded Learning. And the Center for Student Leadership and Expanded Learning is the umbrella that helps support all seven of our career and technical student organizations. And uh, we pulled uh, the past several years to get an estimate, and through our general funds, uh, roughly $440,000 are used to support the statewide leadership and administration of those programs, but we also have to use part of our Perkins leadership to supplement as that isn't enough to lead and support all of those. But I did want to mention that is uh, the primary way right now our state is investing in career and tech ed. Thanks, Dr. Graham. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Maureen? I, I don't have a question. I, I do have some comments, and it's very apropos to this, to this week. Uh, on Monday, I attended, uh, I was invited to the Grand Island Senior High's uh, Academy open house that they haven't had, been able to have for a couple of years. And I just want to share with the board that the thrill it was for me to see my school district that I taught in, but at the elementary level, but to see the vision that between the administration, the school board, um, and the community have all come together for this school community partnership to build these fabulous academies that they've got going on. And when we talk about teacher shortage, they have teacher, a teacher academy, grow their own. That is absolutely amazing. And the students I talked to that were at their table cannot wait to become teachers. I sat next to an officer, a Grand Island policeman, and asking him how his job was dealing with the academy that he was working on. And to know that the investigative work that they're training these students on when they are in high school, these kids are not missing school. And that's one of the goals that the district and senior high have come up with is to see that their uh, absenteeism, the absenteeism that we have on our priorities and whatnot, our strategic plan, uh, that's going to be, be much lower in the, in the end by 2024, 20, 25, I think. But um, the excitement of the community business people in that room to be part of this partnership is amazing. Uh, and uh, I recall having toured their uh, one academy school uh, earlier this spring, and a gentleman who was leaving there that had worked with the students that day, he said it was, in, uh, it was all about flying, becoming pilots. He said, this is by far the greatest program in the United States here in Grand Island, Nebraska, in this academy. So Nebraska is doing some great things, and Grand Island Senior High certainly is, and I know that there are others across the state. But I just had to share that because it was an exciting time to be part of that that day. So thanks for all your work, Katie. Thank you, Mo. Any other comment? Oh, go ahead. Lisa? Microphone. It's on, but I got to get my body closer to it or it closer to me okay um, I have a couple questions uh, a few years ago I think it was before the pandemic uh, we lowered the grade level that could um, be involved in CTE I, I believe it went down to fifth grade is that correct so that was in the reauthorization of Perkins. When we went from Perkins 4 to Perkins 5 in 2018, they lowered the um, eligible grade level that Perkins funds could be used on. And it used to be 7 through 12. And in Perkins 5, it went down to 5 through 12, indicating we know we need to start a lot of that career exploration earlier. My question is, um, have you had any indicators as to um, how that lowering down to fifth grade uh, the participation rate or, or what you're seeing by lowering the I was excited that it was happening but I just want to know what were the results of doing that 
and I hope it's all positive. <laughs> It's a great question. I'm not sure I have any answer for you just yet. Um, oh, it's only okay. been a couple years right. since they've been able to make that change, so I'm not sure we've identified how to track some of those outcomes yet, but I think it would be interesting to explore how folks are using those funds in earlier grades in elementary. I know we're even working on structuring a lot of great middle school programming, so fifth grade and yeah. that's to come for sure. Well, I look forward to hearing about that. And then the 15% set aside, um, is, is that equally, when you say um, secondary, like middle school, high school, is the grant application, uh, even the fifth grade level can apply for those set aside grant funds, if, is that correct? So I think you're referring to the reserve, so yeah. where we can earmark, and that would be by district. So districts, all districts who participate in Perkins and community colleges and consortiums or even groups of districts can submit any application they choose um, for any project or any program. So it could be focused on elementary or middle. It would be up to them to decide what they okay. want to apply for. All right, yeah. thank you. I'm excited about all that's going on. Jacqueline. Hi. So I here today. Um, it sounded like, and I don't want to misquote you, so I want to make sure I'm right. When we got to the slide before this one and we were discussing how CTE funding is allocated, I wrote down, is this a legislature issue? Because it sounded like you said we can go back to the legislate. We'd have to go back to the legislature for permission. Well, you didn't say permission, but you said go back to the legislature to, to amend this. And so, is that a statutory issue that we're talking about? Because where we need to have a statute change to change that, or what specifically were you referring to? And then also, I wrote down on the 85% you said we use a secondary formula and that secondary formula that you referred to seemed to me to be a form of a student-based formula based on the amount of children who are um, at or below the poverty line. It was a 30-70% breakdown that on that particular secondary formula slide. And so I am kind of confused about when you say our, our approach to the funding, that secondary formula, what do you consider that if we're not one of these four? And then where is the mandate coming for how we have to allocate that? So I, I, I will start with this one. When she's saying common state approaches, Nebraska provides no state funding. So that's why she was saying going to the legislature on, on that particular front. So it's not how we allocate federal funds. It's the fact that we don't have state funds and we're the only state, I mean, that doesn't do that. Am I right, Katie? So. That's right, Commissioner. So the, um, the common approaches and everything related to what we might or might not go to the legislature for is because we don't do either any of these four. The formula that is on um, this page comes directly from Perkins, which is the Strengthening Career and Technical Education Act for the 21st century. And this is how we have to allocate the flow through funds to locals with the federal um, investment. So the secondary formula is a federal formula? Yes. So when you get to that last slide, I don't think it was made very clear um, when we say Nebraska is the only state that's not using one of these approaches, can you elaborate you bet. on what's missing? Yes, that's a great question and clarification. I'm specifically talking about categorical funding. So earmarked by the state to only be used for career and technical education flows through to districts. So often with the student-based formula, um, they might take the foundational formula, the general funds that flow to schools, and they might um, give additional based on students enrolled in career ed programs or weight different courses, and that might adjust the general funds or the foundational funding that would go to LEAs. Um, the last slide is not about categorical funding. It doesn't flow through to districts whatsoever, but I did want to just note that what Nebraska does do 
is only through the department where in the law the law didn't have a line item it didn't say how much needs to be it's just that we will um, the department will support the administration and leadership of this center and that has resulted in about four hundred and forty thousand every year from what the legislature provides to NDE and then NDE then uses that to support the center so I I don't want to misquote anyone, but I just want to make sure what the purpose of that slide where Nebraska was set aside or <laughs> uh, distinguished from the rest of the United States oh. is that you were the thought or the in, what it's, I guess, communicating is what I'm trying to get at, is that Nebraska is the only state that does not have a specific line item in our budget or does not have a specific funding mechanism that is specific to career and technical education? Is that what we're? I believe so. It is that there is no categorical funding. We're the only one that doesn't have either the specific funding formula or line. Commissioner, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to find a good way to say this too. The legislature does not appropriate funds for this, every other state, their legislature appropriates state funds for for matching or, or similar activities as, as Perkins. And, and we can keep but, validating that, but you see what I'm, and yeah. I think why she's trying to, we still have a school finance formula, like we could get really complex on how the finance formula works and what the state contributes to, but but what I think what, what Dr. Graham's saying, there's no categorical aid appropriated by the legislature in the state budget process and that's why we're the red dot in the in the map every other state would have something like that okay but in being fair to nebraska right there every state has its own funding system for its education system and so it, it's we're not always comparing apples to apples like it's I think this is apples to apples because some states, you know, do they increase their overall appropriation to K-12 for this purpose? And that might take a little bit more of a, uh, I don't know how advanced CTE, it's from advanced CTE, right? I do think they try to take into account those other types of variations, but we'd have to check on, on their analysis. Oh, an e yeah. yeah, thank you, Ryan. ECS would be another place we can kind of double check that, so. Patty. I'm, I guess, just checking my, my own understanding, but it appears to me that this, on one of our budget issues that we talked about in committee, this was there, right? To increase funding to career technical education, and what I'm getting from you, Dr. Graham, is you're providing us with the rationale, at least in part, for why that is a budget issue right now and why it's one of those priorities that we had listed. I think that's accurate. Kirk. Thank you. Um, so I asked Katie to be here. Um, I went and spoke to the CTE. Is it an annual convention this spring? And the first paper I saw that she put in, my, in front of me was this map here showing Nebraska not funding their CT, uh, CTE. Um, we all know we're in a work shortage everywhere. Teachers, welders, nurses. I own a manufacturing facility. If I lose my welder, I don't know what I'm going to do. If, if I lose my CNC operator, which I did because they moved a plant to Mexico, and my CNC operator went to, to run a restaurant, and so I needed a CNC operator, and, they, and thank goodness a company moved to Mexico, which is awful, out of Hastings. They moved, but they, this guy needed a job. That's the only way I have one right now. And, and it is a major issue in this state at 1.7, I think that's what Lane said, with unemployment. We are in dire straits in this state, and we have a captive audience, 9 through 12. I don't know how far it goes to middle school. We have a captive audience that we can catch and we can have them explore, and we can have them be interested in jobs that are skilled that will pay 
$100,000 a year if they just go to a two-year school. Two-year school. We, and we all know we're sending a lot of people to four-year schools that maybe would be better off at two-year schools. We all know that. We all know that. Or they're going to the university and getting a funny degree and maybe not being able to do anything with it. That's just, that's just my opinion a little bit, but I think it's pretty based. But if we're able to catch these individuals, these kids, and give them interest, I already have a kid from Sandy Creek. We've got some good um, CTE programs that have m manufacturing. You talked about Grand Island. That's an academy. That is a separate building in itself. Sandy Creek has great stuff they're doing. York, Seward, they all are doing it. They're doing it on campus, though. So Grand Island's an anomaly, which is a great anomaly. So what we would like to do, and what I told Katie is, we have got to catch these people now. And since we're the only state in the United States of America that doesn't fund its CTE, this, this is a workforce development issue. We should not be taxing our ag farmers and our, my house for workforce development in the state. This is a, an issue that I know the large business associations, I know the trade unions, I know the community colleges would hop on board and get funding for CTE. And my plan is, so everybody I'm transparent is, I already have senators interested in joining this with me for the next year to try and get a line item in the budget to support CTE for the first time ever because we have to have the workers and if we don't catch them in high school I mean CNC operating and welding and nurses or CNAs your teachers are your next administrators right your CNAs are your next nurses and if we can do that training we have to go to the school though with the equipment, and that's, that's the key. We've got to get the equipment to the school, and don't let me forget to talk about the, the teacher or the educator on that, but we've got to get them to the school. But the way to do it, we can sure put it in a line item with NDE, but you saw with Perkins, all the strings attached with the Perkins money. We have a better chance, in my opinion, to do it through the legislature, run the formula through the legislature, that way there's not all, you know, there'll be some strings to it. Let's, let's not lie about that. There'll be, but there'll be far fewer strings. We funnel it through NDE or the ESUs because they have the, they have the opportunity to, you're gonna have to track it, right? NDE knows how to track money and get this money to the schools. We don't all live by a community college. If you're in whatever in the sand hills, you're not living next to a community college. You've got to be able to have the equipment on site and this money. Just say you double the Perkins money. But I saw this and I, and I didn't know that part of that money goes to the community colleges, right? This would be high school funding only. So if we could just match what we're getting from Perkins to start, I don't want to put a limit on it. I don't want to put the limit at three or four million dollars. I'd like it to be seven to ten million dollars and if you get and if we're able to and you mentioned earlier about hey if you know somebody talk to him about some of this stuff in government because it's got to go through his desk we have connections on this board with the large business associations the large ag um, associations and the trade unions that are dying for electricians plumbers and the whole nine yards and it goes deeper than that you got FCS you got Chefs, right? We, there's a whole realm, and I told that, and I don't, if I'm repeating myself, I need some lunch, but I told that group at Kearney, I told them, I gave the, an opening three minutes, and I said, to me, this room, meaning the, the CTE education conference I was at, was the most important room in education, period. And that was the comment I made and I really do think it is because it's able to give kids a skill right out of high school. You have kids leaving certified welders out of high school right now. They don't have to go to school. They're, they're tax paying citizens ready to go at 18. And even if they need to go to Southeast Community College, you're able to do that in two years and you don't have debt or very, very little debt and you've got a high paying skilled job. So that's what I wanted Katie to come here. Now, who teaches it? That's always the issue. You've got a teacher shortage, right? I've got two guys in my manufacturing plant that I'd be 
happy to get to Aurora Public Schools and teach their two trades. But we've got to make it doable for them. We can't make them go back to school. And we talked about, I was at, a, at the CTE discussion at the state, can you get a three-year permit or something? Can you explain how that would work? Sure, we do, and I think Brad mentioned it. We have the career education teaching permit, which has been around for several years at this point. Um, and it uh, has a couple different ways that someone can qualify to teach a career and technical education course based on either their work experience, a certain mm -hmm. number of years, um, if they have passed different credentialing or licensing exams, like if you have an RN, uh, they might be able to teach you know, some different okay. courses in health sciences. Okay. And that is for three years, it can be renewed. Okay, so that was one of the, I've got, and, and I have a little tiny manufacturing plant my two is thousands in this state that can come in. That employers would be more than happy to give them for an hour or two to teach diesel mechanics or CNC or, or welding. But they got to have the equipment on site because not everybody's close to a community college. And so what I will be doing over the next couple months is working with legislators, working with those associations to try to get this in a senator's, what do they call them, their most favorite bill type deal and get it to the legislature to, and hopefully we can get it through a committee and get it on there so we can do workforce development on, from the state of Nebraska and not on the backs of the farmers at the local school districts or even the, the generous private entities that are donating the, the money. So I want to let everybody know that's what I'm doing and I'm on it and there's a lot of interest in this because it's a huge, huge issue. And that's, that's my lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Kirk. <laughs> all right. First of all, thank you for the, this report, and we're all incredibly interested in what you're doing, and your enthusiasm evades the room, just comes through the whole entire room. So um, it sounds like you got a partner. So <laughs> anyway. Um, we're all your partners and are wishing the best for CTE. So thank you, Katie. Okay. <laughs> we are going to go to lunch. We're going to do consent. Oh, we're going to do consent first. I forgot. I, you, Kurt, you said you were hungry and I was trying to meet your needs there. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? With three items removed. With three items pulled. Um, and put in the five, last five points. five point. I've got them, I think. Oh, no, I did them the other way. I put marked them in the other way. Okay, 5.2B, 5.3B, 5.3F, and we'll take them up under additional business. Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda with the three identified items removed. Thank you, Patty. Do I have a second? Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Per board policy, there is no discussion on the motion to approve the consent ag agenda. Andrea, would you please call the roll for us? Fricky? Yes. Neary? Yes. Penner? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Kojons? Yes. Eight yes. Thank you, Laura. The uh, motion passes. All right. So um, I have good news and I have bad news, Kirk. Okay. <laughs> the good news is we are going to lunch. Please get your lunch. You have 15 minutes for a break and then get your lunch. You, are, you can come back up here and eat it, but then we'll go on with business after 15 minutes. Yeah. So you have a 15-minute break. Public comment is our next order of business. We will now move to our public comment period and take up the remainder of our agenda after, pub agenda after public comment. Agenda item 9.1, public comment. This period may be available to any person who wishes to address the state board on any subject within its authority, including items appearing on the agenda except for contested cases. 
Up to two hours will be allowed for public comment period. A majority of members present and voting may take action to extend the total amount of time allowed for public comment period. Uh, total amount of time allowed for the public comment, comment, per, comment period. A majority of members present and voting may also take action to allow or terminate the public comment at any time during a meeting. Please note that public comment should be on topics related to the State Board's constitutional and statutory authority. Those wishing to speak must be signed in at the table outside of the meeting room. Persons speaking to the board during public comment should state their name at the beginning of their allotted time. Anyone refusing to be identified will be prohibited from speaking. Each person may address the board for up to five minutes. A majority of members present and voting may take action to reduce or extend the amount of individual time allotted to all speakers. If at any time persons appearing before the board exceed the time limitations set forth in the policy or on the agenda or become abusive or threatening in language or behavior, it shall be the responsibility of the president to declare that person out of order and to refuse permission to continue to address the board. We have 20 public comment cards submitted. Correct? 24, actually. Oh, okay. We have 24 public comment cards. Okay. Um, is there a motion? No, we don't have to do any of that, do we? Okay. All right. Okay. I will, uh, Robin will call the roll of the names of the first 16 speakers who will please sit in the designated chairs in front of the room. And once again, I apologize if I mispronounce uh, names. There is no intent to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we have a total of 24, uh, Madam President and they are listed in the order in which they have signed in. Thank you. Dr. D. Tonak, Jackie Egan, Steve Berkey, Lynette Stevens, Dick Votravers, Eileen C. Votravers, M.D., Angie Eberspacher, Cindy Guthrie, Cammie Riley, Lori Woosley, Gloria Mason, Larry Mason, Amber Parker, Tina Lassick, Kelly Brady, Jenna Durr. Dr. D. Tonak. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. D. Tonak, a retired educator of 50 years. And my first hat was a master's in mathematics. And at that time, there was a seven-year window in Nebraska. I got applied and got a lifetime certificate. I'm still alive, so I still have a, a teaching certificate in Nebraska. I was one of those people who when an opportunity to be a physics teacher came about in Kearney, I wanted to do it. I begged, I'll get my coursework as soon as possible. So I was one of those with the conditional part to teach my physics. And I'm listening to Mr. Penner and I applaud looking for a variety of ways to be able to wear the hat to teach whatever. In this case, it was physics. But I have to admit, I got a lot from my coursework, a lot of how to do the labs. I spent many a Sunday afternoon and night trying to get those labs to work. So there is more than just a test. Um, 
In fact, most of you on the board have heard me say this, so here I go again. I hate the praxis test. It is a bad test. It is a bad test. I have tutored people in the mathematics part. It, it, it's not what you want. Look for some, broaden the ways to do what we need to do, but please don't, uh, don't just look at that window. It's not a good sieve. It certainly is not something you want to use. My focus that I want to say to everybody in the room is we need to work together in a positive way to ensure every Nebraska classroom is led by qualified, caring educators. That's what I've heard this morning in your presentations from all of you as well as the people with the awards and their, and their good work. We have to have an environment that's nurturing, working with a variety of students, and diversity is not a bad word. Keep using the word diversity. We want a variety of leaders. We want to work with a variety of students. I certainly saw what's going on in a classroom of kindergartners, five-year-olds. Now, I'm a high school and college teacher, but I was helping out at Campbell Elementary. And you know, what are five-year-olds doing? They're learning how to cut. Some of them had not used scissors before, but no fingers were cut off. And they were coloring, and they were learning to count. That's what's going on. And the skill of those teachers I saw, how they can do five things at once. Uh, I marveled at that. Also, last year, I uh, had the privilege of supervising some student teachers in math classrooms. Great things going on. What are the big ideas in what? in mathematics, and so what? Who's going to use this? I applaud your attention, Mr. Penner, to CTE, CTE programs. But you don't always need um, technology, I guess. What is it? Hampton has one where they're working with cows and plants. So, well, I don't know if that's technology, but that's something additional. I encourage you to keep looking down that line. My last full-time employment was at the Science Focus Program here in Lincoln often nicknamed the zoo school. Look at the choices we have within our public education. There are choices galore. And you don't have to look far beyond public education to see where that's happening. So I am nervous, though, about what I hear some what I call fear mongers who seem to be driven by anger and misguided national groups. A phrase I heard this morning on the news dealing with um, a lawsuit, reckless speech. We all, reminder to myself as well, we all need to be careful about that reckless speech that we might let, let slip out of our, our mouths. Um, I hear a lot of people who are saying in anger, but they'll say, well, in my own school, it's just fine, but. So let's look at Nebraska. Let's focus what's going on in Nebraska. We must find ways to continue to fill our Nebraska classrooms with these skilled educators. I heard good news today. You're working on the certific certification, but I'm going to say you still have to speed Sorry, it up. Sorry, Dee. Your time is up. Thank you Thank for your you. work. Jackie Egan. I am Jackie Egan, and I'm a retired social worker. I served at HHS out of Dodge County in the 1980s when great political changes resulted in massive institutional changes, not necessarily for the better for the people being served. I'm speaking today in support of you, the Nebraska Department of Education. As it is currently, it is set up with duly elected representatives from districts across the state of Nebraska serving on the NDE board. These board members select and hire their own commissioner who then searches, selects, and hires deputies with specific expertise to address the educational needs of the state's students. 
the commissioner uses, as required by state statute, many adequately and appropriately educated experts as deputies. Our current NDE is research-based, outcome-based, and effective, as seen by performance graduation rates and many other indicators, certainly this morning's award reci recipients. Our current NDE is stable, employs deputies who are appropriately educated experts, and you all are committed to Nebraska students, including students of color. As required by statute, NDE must gather a wide range of opinions from stakeholders. The governor retains authority to approve or modify requirements proposed by NDE as he or she must sign off on all proposed regulations. Our current NDE employees are not just working a job to move up politically. Our current NDE set up, <coughs> I'm sorry, our current NDE setup is more democratic and more participatory, more stable and more effective than a code agency such as the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services, for example. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Steve Berkey. Again, my name is Steve Berkey. I uh, grew up helping raise cattle and crops on a family farm in Dawson County. Uh, went to country school and a small high school, which turned out to be excellent educational preparation for my undergrad years at Dana College in Blair. And then I went on to get two graduate degrees from Wartburg Theological Seminary in Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, an MDiv is a four-year professional degree, that, which led to me be, becoming an ordained pastor from which I recently retired. Uh, Lutheran church tradition. I, I also did several years of additional academic study and have a, an STM, a master's in sacred theology, and my thesis focus there was the relation of theology and science. I currently live in a beautiful rural area of Lincoln County. Uh, my public comments today are directed in regard to the movie The Mind Polluters, which has been shown around the state. This is a documentary style film that has been interjected into various State Board of Education campaigns in this state and really around the country, I think. Um, given my background in science and theology, I've found this disappointing that this movie is so misleading and really rife with mis misinformation, two hours. Sadly, the film is also designed to be a rhetorical kind of hit job against uh, almost all educators and especially public schools. That's one of the main purposes. The filmmakers operate out of what I would call uh, kind of a retro Christian mindset that has a very schizophrenic relationship to science. That is, on the one hand, the filmmakers and the people behind this want to take advantage of all the fruits of science and technology. So they have tons of video and podcasts and websites and social media. But on the other hand, when it comes to studying science, uh, whether that be biology or even the history of the universe, the movie declares that really all this research in cosmology is ultimately irrelevant. That science has to be supplanted or negated by their reading of Genesis 1 through 11, so those few chapters of the Bible. And, uh, and so the, the people, what they advocate in the movie is really a return to an imagined past and to continuing to fight old battles, centuries old battles, against the likes of Copernicus and Galileo and Darwin and Einstein, all of those folks. Uh, I'm only a little bit tongue in cheek when I say good luck with that, if that's your goal. And I think it's also very ironic as we're here at the Innovation Campus that that is the approach that's, that the, some of the folks in the movie take. Another thing that's uh, troubling is the movie takes serious liberties with the commandment to not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, it's disturbing to see how these pious filmmakers, their names are Mark and Amber Archer, they, they promulgate broad and casual accusations that schools in general and educators are grooming children. It's one of the big points that they talk about. 
So these filmmakers brand their, their enterprise, uh, their nonprofit ministry that they call it, they, they brand it as taking a bold stand for the truth, but the content of the movie shows uh, clearly a different reality. They attempt to damage the reputation of public schools and the vast majority of teachers in order to promote their supposed religious solution. So I'm here today as a religious leader and a citizen of our state and feeling compelled to lift up these strong cautions about the message of this movie and, and those people who would advocate or promote such an approach to education. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Lynette Stevens. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Lynette Stevens. I live in Gothenburg, um, Nebraska. I grew up in northern Iowa, went to college there, and then moved to, Bra to Nebraska many years ago. I have taught and coached in five different school districts in Nebraska from 1979 to 2010. Benkelman, Gothenburg, two rural districts north of Gothenburg, and my latest one was in Schuyler. I'm now the teammates mentoring program coordinator at Gothenburg Public Schools, and then I also substitute teach. I was one of those teachers that retired, said they would never teach again, and when the pandemic hit, I went back and got my substitute license, so I'm back in the schools. First of all, I would like to thank this Board of Education and Commissioner Bloomstead for your diligent work and dedication to the education of the students and teachers and administrators in the schools of Nebraska. You have been, you have persevered through the most adverse situations in public forums, in newspapers, in phone calls, in emails, in texts, in letters, and even a verbal attack in a Wendy's restaurant in Kearney. Some of these board members have been ridiculed, sworn at, attacked by words and actions, lied about, called pedophiles, groomers, and sex traffickers for the past two years. I have witnessed all of this, and I am embarrassed by the actions and words of other human beings in our state. In all my years of teaching, I have never taught, I have never seen, I have never heard of, I was never trained in, was never exposed to, never directed by my administrators or school boards, was not taught in any of my Masters of Education degree, and was never asked to use these acronyms, CRE, SEL, SRT, DEI. They are made up of conspiracy theories, which were created in the last 18 months to create fear in our state. Three words come to mind these fear-mongering people have constantly construed. Equity, it's the freedom from bias or favoritism. Diversity, which is the practice of including people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds and different genders and sexual orientations. Inclusion, which is the practice of providing equal access to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded because of their race, their gender, their religion, their nationality, their immigration status, and their ability. These words and are used by educators to make sure that all students deserve a school environment where they are valued and welcomed. Now these terms, equity, diversity, and inclusion, are being vilified by those who are seeking to serve political agendas. Um, I was going to comment on um, mind polluters. Mr. Berkey did a good job at that. I was also going to comment about Protect Nebraska Children Coalition. I'm not going to go there right now. But in closing, the state school board needs to make sure that schools use evidence-based practice to guide your decision making. That teaching depicts an accurate description of American history. That curriculum, or that students have the right to learn from factual and evidence-based curriculum. 
that the health and well-being of students and educators is taken into account when making decisions about education and ensuring that public funds are directed to public schools where all students are welcome and educated fairly. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Dick Votravers. Thank you, that's a good job with my name. Most people don't do that well. <clears throat> My name is Dick Votravers, that's how I pronounce it. I'm a resident of Lincoln. I am not an educator, I'm a retired actuary. I worked in the insurance industry for 40 years almost in Nebraska. I offer this testimony both as an individual and as a member of the NAACP Lincoln branch. Our members have been observing State Board of Education meetings for the past 18 months. We have watched a number of public speakers give testimony opposing the department's proposed health education curriculum standards and also the teaching of critical race theory, among other dislikes. I am speaking today in strong support of the policies, actions, plans, and leadership of the Nebraska Board of Education and the Nebraska Department of Education. Our observers have found the Department of Education leadership and staff to be extremely knowledgeable, systematic, organized, and current in evidence-based instruction. It appears the department is providing excellent resources which are available for implementation and implementation in every school district in our state. Our group strongly supports educational equity, which the department is championing. We believe it is crucial, as the commissioner states, quote, to address the inequities of the past by focusing on opportunities to learn for all students and, and by a relentless focus on outcomes, unquote. We support NDE's efforts to reduce the disparities in test scores between student groups by using and recommending the use of ESSER pandemic funds for the, by the districts. I received an excellent public education in Grand Island, and I'm a proud graduate of the University of Nebraska. The landscape in Nebraska is not the same as it was when I was at Grand Island Senior High. I don't have the exact data, data but my guess is that 95% of our students at that time were non-Hispanic white. In 2021, the percentage of non-Hispanic white students in GI public schools was 39%. It's 24% in Omaha. It's 64% in the Lincoln public schools and only 14% in the Lexington public schools. Statistics for the state as a whole showed 65% non-Hispanic white and 35% non-white. With this shift in demographics, it's necessary for our state board and our local school districts to change their approach to certain aspects of our education. Critical race theory is not being taught in, the, in our state's K-12 public schools, but I believe that all students should be taught age-appropriate factual history that clearly demonstrates both the greatness of our country as well as the areas which we have fall, in which we have fallen short of the words in our Constitution and Declaration of Independence. I loved American history in high school, but I didn't learn our history from all viewpoints. Since I retired, I've studied the Reconstruction period, the post-Reconstruction period, the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision, the resulting coup by white citizens in Wilmington, North Carolina, the court-sanctioned discrimination of separate but equal in the South, and the lynching of accused black defendants. I certainly feel sympathy for the black Americans who had to endure these discriminatory acts and disappointment, and disappointment and discomfort with the actions of white Americans, particularly Southerners. Likewise, reading Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee helped me understand the many broken treaties and promises by our government with the First Peoples of North America. But I don't feel personal guilt that's for something that happened 75 to 150 years ago. Only when I educate myself to past injustices am I able to think clearly and speak out against current and fut or future injustices and advocate for reconciliation. Our students of higher education and the students in Nebraska public schools need to understand our whole history, not just the portions that our political leaders feel protect their group identity or their point of view. All students should be thought to, to all students should be taught to think critically, and that means understanding historical events from all points of view, including the contributions of people of all races, ethnicities, and genders. 
Thank you for your time. May you continue to serve all the citizens of our great state of Nebraska. Thank you, Dick. Eileen C. Votravers, MD. You had practice with that name. Yes, my name is Eileen Votravers. I'm a retired pediatrician who practiced 31 years here in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I'm a resident. I'm honored to speak to this esteemed board and commissioner of education. As a member of the uh, uh, NAACP Lincoln branch, and on my own behalf, as a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the International Dyslexia Association, and the Nebraska Dyslexia Association. I'm speaking today in strong support of the policies, services, resources, and supportive guidance the Nebraska Board of Education has determined that the Nebraska Department of Education, or NDE, must implement and provide for our public schools, private schools, and parochial schools. As a product of an excellent K-12 education in Kearney Public Schools and an education in the public medical school at UNMC, I commend NDE for providing cutting-edge, evidence-based, equitable, comprehensive information and services to our schools their staff, students, and their parents. Most of my volunteer time in the past 12 years of retirement has been spent addressing reading deficiency and dyslexia instruction and intervention. I applaud NDE under the direction of Dr. Bloomstead for developing the dyslexia technical assistance document in 2015, the first year after he was hired. In 2021, Amy Rohn, Director of Special Education and her staff, under the guidance of Dr. Bloomstead, expanded it with assistive technology and accommodations, suggestions, and updated it with the current science of reading so that the one in every five students who have dyslexia have the opportunity to learn to read accurately and fluently. I commend Amy and her SPED staff for knowing even prior to the 2018 reading legislation that struggling readers in order to learn to read require systematic, cumulative, and explicit instruction in sound awareness, sound symbol or phonics, syllables, base words with prefixes and suffixes, grammar and sentence structure, and semantics or meaning. This is called structured literacy instruction, which is essential for about 60% of all of our students to even learn to read and benefits the other 40% of students with improved fluency and comprehension. Once LB 1052 and LB 1081, the Nebraska Reading Legislative Bills, were passed in 2018, NDE promptly embarked, it appears, on a massive review of reading research, hired highly qualified and knowledgeable staff, and created extensive online resources for school districts and ESUs to develop programs using structured literacy instruction and high quality instructional materials. Both of these have been shown to benefit all students. I congratulate the board, commissioner, and NDE staff, especially Drs. Corey Epler, Marissa Paisant, and Abby Burke, for promoting and providing the essential guidance for districts to incorporate structured literacy and the science of reading in their schools for all students and guidance in the professional development of their educators. The Nebraska Reads and Nebraska Instructional Materials Collaborative websites are excellent resources for parents as well to use to evaluate their local schools programs. The board, Dr. Bloomstead and NDE, have been visionary in developing these resources. 
with your long-term commitment to adhere to the science of reading, the 60% of Nebraska students in fourth grade who are reading below the proficient level and the reading score gaps between student groups will improve. In closing, every parent and citizen here or listening today Thank owes you, a debt Eileen. of gratitude to the board, Thank Dr. You. Bloomstead, and Angie Eberspacher. Hello, my name is Angie Eberspacher and I'm from Beaver Crossing, Nebraska. I have one primary question. Why is NDE still promoting the national sex ed standards on its website? After a year of public comment, the state board tabled the sex standards to be resurrected at the board's whim. Earlier this year, every board member had the opportunity to permanently scrap the sex ed standards, yet all but one voted to keep them alive. But have they really been tabled? Indeed, NDE has hidden and buried this information, and it is there if you know how to navigate the NDE website, which is intentionally complicated. Under the guise of professional organizations is a list of acronyms that promote the original copied draft of the sex ed standards. These are at least six clicks to navigate to get to this information. The amount of deception and lack of transparency is alarming. Allow me to enlighten you in reading the meaning of some of these acronyms. SHAPE Nebraska is a state affiliate of the American Alliance for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. Currently, five of the board members for SHAPE Nebraska contributed to the development of draft one of the health sex ed standards, including Lacey Peters and Matt Avey. Both Lacey and Matt were employed by NDE when the sex ed standards were being copied and pasted. In fact, Lacey Peters was an instrumental link between Deb Neary and Lisa Schultz in pressing to get the sex ed standards adopted. There is no such thing as coincidences. SHAPE Nebraska lists SHAPE America as a resource, which is a proud member of the coalition that developed the National Health Education Standards, that's a quote, and pro provides a link to the National Sex Ed Standards document that Nebraskans refused to adopt. It's right on the website. Also listed among the acronyms is SOPHE, which stands for Society for Public Health Education. Click on this resource and it will take you to the SOF homepage. Click on focus areas to see a long list of topics including anti-racism, health equity, LGBTQ+, and sexual and reproductive health. The SOF site also provides access to their Center for Online Resources and Education called CORE, which includes many free guides that can be downloaded for teachers to use in their classrooms, including the one that instructs teachers how to include social and emotional learning throughout their curriculum. Why are free curricula and lesson plans supporting these standards on NDE's website? Do not hide behind the excuse that NDE staff didn't know because Shape America is their own entity and is only listed as a resource. Nebraskans have repeatedly asked for transparency. They have overwhelmingly opposed the comprehensive sex ed standards written by CECAS, Planned Parenthood, and the Guttmacher Institute. This deception is another example of why Nebraskans have lost trust in the NDE and the State Board of Education. I was here for the entire meeting today, and I would like to also refer to the MHTTC, another acronym, Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network. I just heard about it today at this meeting, and I did a quick research on, as I was sitting there on their website, and their resources include racial equity and cultural toolkits, one titled Confronting White Nationalism in Schools. When res other resources include healthy health equity initiative and guidance on gender affirming care, civil rights and patient privacy, National Center for Lesbian Rights, National Queer and Trans Ther Therapists of Color Network, and the Race Matters Institute. The ESU6 administrator said NDE and ESU are partnering in this program for, and interesting to me how none of this information was shared at your meeting. It's all cloaked under the guideline of mental health. Mental health. I implore you as a board to finish and investigate this national program to see if it's really the best program for Nebraska students and parents. We need to know whose best practices we're looking at. NDE is using the back door for teachers to access free lesson plans and guides that are full of radical gender theory as well as radical Marxist race theory. Nebraskans overwhelmingly rejected these topics. Either NDE and its state board members who support these issues are complicit in hiding this information from parents, or they are inept 
and too ignorant to know how to research 501c3 educational organizations to understand what they are promoting and using them as resources. Neither of these options are acceptable. Respect the Nebraska voters who elected you. Demand that NDE clean up its website and stop offering these materials to teachers and take the time to research the programs that are being presented to you. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Cindy Guthrie. Hello. My name is Cindy Guthrie, and I'm from Kearney. I'd like to begin a review of the recent past, showing board member Deb Neary working behind the scenes to influence and manipulate the health standards development process, initially written by teachers from across the state, but then were taken over and further manipulated by activists working secretly with Deb Neary. In early 2021, possibly January, Lisa Schultz sent a text to Neary in which she stated, quote, we are going to make some linkages to suicide prevention, especially for LGBTQ students. Both Oregon and Idaho have had a lot of success with that approach. It is possible that the advocacy plan developed by Lisa Schultz included using suicide to convince people that the LGBT and comprehensive sexual education aspects of draft number one were necessary to save the lives of children because both Oregon and Idaho have had a lot of success with that approach. On March 5th, 2021, Ms. Schultz texted Neary, informing her that Schultz had national experts ready to review draft number one on Wednesday, March 10th. Remember that Lisa Schultz, personally selected by Neb Deb Neary, had developed an advocacy plan for the inclusion of LGBT and comprehensive sexual education in the health education standards. And now Lisa Schultz was bringing in national experts. Ms. Schultz had also volunteered to meet with people behind the scenes to discuss her experiences in convincing the Omaha Public Schools Board of Education to adopt comprehensive sexual education in Omaha. Lisa Schultz, the person Neary personally selected for the writing team, texted Ms. Neary to inform her that she'll love our new health standards fact sheet. This means that some or all of the facts and information used by the State Board of Education and the Nebraska Department of Education especially those portions related to LGBT matters and comprehensive sexual education came from Lisa Schultz, who was one of the people specifically selected for the writing team by Deb Neary. And on another point, I was here at the meeting this morning, the whole time, leave for a 15 minute lunch and come back to find the public comments had been changed from the end of the meeting to right after lunch. Do you think that should have been announced before lunch was dismissed? Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Cammie Riley. Hello, my name is Cammie Riley, and I'm from Norfolk. I will provide a review of the recent past, which further shows how board member Deb Neary put specific activists in place to manipulate the health standards development process, which were initially written by teachers from across the state, but then were taken over by the activists working with Deb Neary. By late afternoon on March 10, 2021, the day the first draft of the health standards was released, Lisa Schultz had provided the NDE a set of talking points and a fact sheet to be used in order to defend the first draft. Within 20 minutes of receiving Ms. Schultz's email, Ryan M. Four, who is the NDE Board Relations Rules and Regulations Officer, had forwarded Ms. Schultz's email to all NDE board members. It appears board members and NDE staff leaned on these documents as calls, emails, and media interviews ensued. If you recall, Lisa Schultz was handpicked by board member Neary, had been working on an advocacy plan several months in advance of this, had provided a fact sheet to the NDE on comprehensive sexual education and LGBT issues, and had been working with the national experts. As soon as the public began contacting the NDE in response to draft number one, there was obvious bias against people with conservative views. In an email on March 11th, 2021, a member of the subject matter experts team and an employee in the NDE referred to a concerned grandmother as crazy because she did not agree with the sexuality training in the standards. The, e the email was sent to Lacey Peters, the PE and health education specialist for the NDE. On about the same day draft one was released, March 20th, 2021, 
Lisa Schultz put Jay Irwin in contact with Neary, informing her that Mr. Irwin was ready to mobilize. Mr. Irwin was UNO professor of trans studies at the time. This is the same Lisa Schultz who was hand-selected by Deb Neary to work on the health educa education standards and who developed the advocacy plan, fact sheet, and talking points for the board members and the NDE employees. On approximately March 11, 2021, Lisa Schultz texted Neary and referenced a big partner meeting on Tuesday, presumably March 16th, at which they would discuss draft one. It is unclear who the partners are, but it may be Andrew Elman, Abby Swatsworth, and Sophia Jodwessel, with whom she was collaborating at the time. Or possibly she was referring to certain financial supporters, which have been significant financial backers of the Omaha Women's Fund, which was Lisa Schultz's employer at the time. I just want to add um, the two award winners today. I was very impressed with both of them. Um, Michelle Fouts has said um, things about her class, and you could tell she loved her children. Um, she, she said she loved building relationships, and I, th I think that's wonderful. Those are the teachers we need. Um, that something that stuck out to me was she said, they will do anything for you, meaning children that you teach will do anything for you. They will add two plus two. They will do what you want. You tell them to jump on one foot, they're going to do it. They look up to your teachers. They want to do anything to make you happy. Children don't want to disappoint their teachers, just like they don't want to disappoint their parents. They believe you. If you are a teacher, they believe what you say. You as a board need to remember you have the responsibility when you're condoning teachers teaching children words and ideas like gender, trans, and telling them that they could be in the wrong body, they're going to believe you. Why wouldn't they? You're to be trusted. You're no different, you as the board members, if you are agreeing to teachers that this is okay, you need to be held responsible and you need to feel some shame. Thank you, Lori. Excuse me, thank you, Cammie. Lori Woosley. Hi, everybody. I'm Lori Woosley, and I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I graduated from Benson High School and a proud member of a graduate class with a BA from UNO. I'd like to continue with the timeline here that my two previous speakers have started. After March 10, 2021, Lisa Schultz informs Deb Neary that she has four youth for May, referencing the Board of Education meeting. Lisa Schultz later informs Neary that she had hired four new youth social media influencers and that Schultz's assistant, Tiffany, was now speaking regularly with Ryan, which may refer to Ryan Floor 4 in the NDE. The bylaws of the Board of Education require members to treat fellow members and staff with kindness, civility, respect, patience, and honesty. It appears that Deb Neary did not disclose to any of the state board members that the person she had personally selected to work on the health education standards had made arrangements with youth advocates. On March 12, 2021, Neary asked Lisa Schultz for, for help preparing for a TV interview on draft one in front of one of the Omaha schools. The prepared comment includes a reference to youth suicide due to youths being bullied for their gender identity or sexual preferences. You might recall an earlier text that Lisa Schultz to Deb Neary stated, we are going to make link linkages to suicide prevention, especially for LGBTQ students. Both Oregon and Idaho had a lot of success with that approach. Apparently this approach was part of the advocacy plan, talking points or fact sheet prepared by Lisa Schultz. The name Lisa Schultz, 
who board member Deb Neary made sure to be appointed to the process of the Department of Education. On March 16, 2021, Lisa Schultz advised NDE's Corey Epler, we have a plan for the next six months and we will be ready for the April 2nd meeting. We meet with the key partners today. The plan and the key partners are more obvious later in the communications between Ms. Schultz and Deb Neary. On that same day, March 16th, Ms. Neary informed Board President Maureen Nichols that she had a Zoom meeting with the Women's Fund of Omaha, directed by Lisa Schultz, and to develop the public relations strategy for the health standards. So, by March 16th, 2021, Lisa Schultz, part of Deb Neary's personal selection for working on the health education standards, had not only prepared a number of documents advocating for gender ideology and comprehensive sexual education, she was now developing the public relations strategy for the health standards. I'm thankful for the Freedom of Information Act and the truth that it revealed. The emails provide evidence of contradictions and shed light upon some board members' actions. I'm curious, however, with such evidence revealed that no action has taken place. Personally, I don't believe this type of character is becoming of a Board of Education member. I expect that the bar would be set higher for Board of Education members. Regarding the teacher shortages we heard about today, have you all perhaps looked at the root cause? Has there been any consideration to the comprehensive sex education proposals or the CRT or the 1619 project, et cetera, that could be affecting teachers. Are our teachers being asked to teach things or accept certain behaviors in the classroom that they believe are harmful or against their beliefs? And is this a factor for why teachers are leaving? In addition, I heard Grand Island touted today but as I understand, in 2021, Grand Island Public Schools, based on the 11th grade ACT proficiency, that English is at 19%, math is at 22%, and science is at 27%, yet, we ha yet they had an 87% graduation rate. I don't understand how that could happen. I trust that you all have Nebraska students in mind, but I question, what is your intent? And also, lastly, I would like to applaud Kirk Penner for bringing up the trades. I remember in 1984, Technical High School closed in 1984. Many of those students went to Benson, and a lot of those students were completely lost because they were the type of students that would have been excellent in trade. My, gra my father graduated from Tech with a trade and was able to provide a great living for our Thank family. Thank you. Thank Lauren. you. Gloria Mason. Hi, I'm Gloria Mason from Kearney, Nebraska, and I'm going to continue with this timeline. But I want to add that the timeline was developed by reviewing a large number of emails and text messages received through the public record request served on the Department of Education. And in that, also make mention that initially, uh, these standards were written by teachers from across the state, but were then taken over and manipulated by activists working secretly with Deb Neri. September 26, 2019, Ms. Neri contacted Ryan Floor by email. This is a direct quote from this email to him. I want to make sure that Lisa Schultz is selected to help write the NDE health standards. Please let me know what I need to do to make sure that she is selected. September 30th, 2019. Miss Neri contacted Ryan Floor and stated, I will not involve myself in the selection process as we've discussed. I want the, I want the process to happen organically as it should. Apparently, between September 26th and September 30th, 2019, Mr. Floor spoke with Ms. Neri and recommended that she sh should not be advocating for certain people and that she should trust the process. 
October 20th, 2019. Miss Neri emailed Ryan Floor and Matt Blum Blumstead informing them, I am very disappointed that none of the folks that I recommended to participate in the Nebraska Health Education Standards writing team were selected. Now I do not have anyone on the writing team that I can keep, that can keep me informed. I also want to know how I can make sure that Dr. Hurton, Rodriguez, Lisa Schultz, and others that I recommended can be included in the process somehow. Please let me know what the next steps are to include them now. Apparently, Ms. Neri was no longer willing to remain uninvolved in the process and was unwilling to allow the health education standards to be developed organically. October 23rd, 2019. Abby Swathworth, I may not have her name pronounced right, from out Nebraska was recommended by the Equality Officer for the NDE. And this lady was recommended solely on her LBGT advocacy. In the email exchange, Lacey Peters, the PE and health education specialist with the NDE said it was not pertinent whether Ms. Wattsworth had any knowledge about health and or health education. Soon thereafter, the list of writing, the lists of writing team members were ex and experts were revised to include the names of Lisa Schultz, Matt Avey, Liam Hurton Rodriguez, which were all selected by Deb Mary Neri. Abby Wattsworth was also added in spite of the fact that no one knew whether she had any knowledge about health education. I do want to add one thing. As I sit here listening, this is the first time I've been here, as I sit here listening to all of you, you have much knowledge. You have much knowledge, and I do not deny the fact that you have much concern about the things, but I see a lack of wisdom in some things that you are trying to do. We need wisdom and understanding. Wisdom is so important in what we do with our children, not just knowledge. Thank you, Gloria. Larry. Larry Mason. My name is Larry Mason. I'm from Kearney. Uh, on September 16, 2020, Lacey Peters started a website of resources with Zainanab Rida, which contained equity picture books and other resources for schools included in the resources were books such as I Am Jazz, I'm a Girl, Pink is for Boys, and Julian is a Mermaid. <clears throat> These and other picture books are produced for the ages as young as three years old and deal with gender identity. Ms. Rita replied, wow, <laughs> these are great resources, trash. This shows that the officials of the Nebraska Board the NDE are interested in more than simply developing board broad standards. Specific resources are of interest as well. On December 18, 2020, Lisa Schultz and her team are working on an advocacy plan for the health education standards. In the email to, him, to an employee with the NDE, Ms. Schultz specifically discloses that she is working on an advocacy plan so she needed to know the timeline on NDE, NDE and establish, had established 
for the adoption of the new health standards, health education standards. This same Lisa Schultz board member, Deb Neary, had made sure to be part of the process. You guys need to wake up and figure out what's going on with our children. Thank you, Larry. Amber Parker. Amber Parker. This is a source who you let lead the first health standards, and it sounds like to the present at this time as well, all with the exception of Kirk Penner. Thank you, Kirk Penner, for standing to protect children against pedophile grooming. What I'm about to read, I want to censor any children. If they are present, give parents time to get your kids out of the room. This is who, all of them except Kirk Penner, including Commissioner Bloomstead, has defended and allowed to lead these health standards. If you have kids and notice them touching their genitals, let them know that masturbating is completely normal, but something they should do in private. You wonder why we call you pedophile groomers? Right here. This is the source. This is who's leading this. This has been a Planned Parenthood operative over our Nebraska State Board of Education. And shame on you, Neary, for what you're doing. And I pray these seats are taken and filled by people who truly love and care about children and are not willing to let in open doors for the, those who would want to be predators to them. But all of you have open doors for predators towards them, towards these first health standards. It's greatly concerning. Today, I want to bring your attention to the agenda. Interesting enough, there's no page numbers. It is 5.3.G. Authorize the commissioner to prove an amendment to the teaching strategies contract. Michelle Milken shares, under the guise of customizable assessments, public and private preschools in Colorado experimented with toddlers whose student activities and social emotional behaviors were tracked using the Teaching Strategies Gold System. Funded with $30 million in Race to the Top subsidies under the Obama administration, as she had reported in 2014, parent Lauren Coker, C-O-K-E-R, discovered that Teaching Strategies Gold Assessors in her son's Aurora, Colorado public preschool had recorded information about his trips to the bathroom, his hand-washing habits, and his ability to pull up his pants. Now, why do I bring this up? It's interesting because, again, going to 5.3.G, you don't write teaching strategies gold. You just have authorized the commissioner to approve an amendment to the teaching strategies contract. However, on the Nebraska Department of Education website, you do have its teaching strategies gold. Again, Michelle Malkin goes to share, Sunny Flynn, a mom with kids in Jefferson County, Colorado, asked all the right questions. What security measures are being used to protect this data? Who exactly has access to this data? How long will the data be stored? What is the proven benefit of a kindergarten teacher putting all of this data into a database? With little public oversight, Google has infiltrated schools through its free Google Apps for Education suite. As Michelle had reported previously, Google is building brand loyalty through its questionable certification program that essentially turns teachers into tax-subsidized lobbyists for the company. GAFE enrollees are trained on Google products, earn certification, and then open up consultancy businesses and bill their school districts and regards the public to hawk Google suite of products to other colleagues. 
I want to go back. Um, there's another agenda. There's a lot of talk on the data, and my question is, where is this data going? According to the FERPA Act, and I don't think I have that on me, which stands for uh, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Parents need to be aware that uh, student data can be released without consent to non-governmental organizations and entities that have legitimate educational interests. Now, this was back in uh, 2016. I'm looking to see what it is at the present, but you need to, uh, the Pineapple Express is the way to go. Um, I'm saying Pineapple Express, I wanna see your project, sorry, I keep saying pineapple, sorry, uh, Project Express is the way to go opt out your children. These are social engineering pro programs, they are Marxist agendas, it is to bring division and take away, dumb down Thank the you, students Amber. as worker bees. Tina Lassick, <laughs> Tina Lassick. Hello. Uh, my name is Tina Lassick, and I'm from Bellevue, Nebraska. I'm also going to provide further details from a timeline of events which show board member Deb Neary's manipulation of the process of development of the health education standards. On March 31st, Maureen Nichols emailed a set of attachments to all board members and several NDE officials which defended the sexual education in draft one of the proposed health standards. This included information provided by Lisa Schultz earlier in the month, including the link to suicide, which Lisa Schulz identified as being helpful in Oregon and Idaho's advocacy efforts. On April 15th, Deb Neary began reaching out to facilitators who could meet with the board members and work on a values statement to supplement the non-discrimination position statement the board had developed under Neary's guidance several months earlier. The individuals board member Deb Neri contacted seemed to include one common trait. They were in support of the LGBTQ lifestyle. On April 23, 2021, Deb Neri reached out to two members of the Board of Regents, Elizabeth O'Connor and Barbara Weitz, to see how the Board of Regents dealt with public comments on controversial issues. According to board member Neri, her discussions with the regents heightened her disappointment with the way the NDE was handling public input on the proposed health education standards. In an email to Tiffany Jokel at the Omaha Women's Fund on April 23, 2021, board member Neri stated, quote, I am very disappointed that Ryan and Maureen see this as a both sides need to be presented at all the time. It is irresponsible, in my opinion, when one of the sides is based in science and fact and the other is based in religion. That is why it was important for me to learn how the regents get around the both sides nonsense. They only allow 30 minutes of public testimony a month and they do not put much emphasis at all on the public input." Unquote. Ms. Neary represents that she had spoken to more than one regent, but in fact she only spoke with Elizabeth O'Connor. Barbara Weitz did not respond to Ms. Neary's email until May 2nd, and Ms. Neary informed her on May 3rd that Elizabeth O'Connor had answered her questions already. Therefore, Ms. Neary only spoke with one regent, but led others, including the other board members, to believe that she had spoken to at least two. And I want to add that I downloaded, read, and commented on the proposed health standards twice last year, both for the first draft and the second draft. I was absolutely appalled at what I saw and read. It took me hours to respond. And I think that um, the health standards that I see being proposed violates the little, the childhood latency period, they call it, where children need to be let alone to be children and not have sexual information provided to them at such a young age, second, third grade. Second grade had to p choose their pronouns. Fifth and sixth graders being taught completely inappropriate sexual actions, which I, as a lady, can't mention here. Um, and I, you know, it just makes no sense to me whatsoever. Some of the information I could see perhaps being presented, you know, junior high and high school, but not the little kids, the ones, you know, the information that I read proposed to be taught to these children by their teachers whom they look up to was just so appalling and inappropriate. I can't believe that you would approve such a thing. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank Kelly Brady. 
Hello, Kelly Brady from Bellevue, Nebraska. The world is not fair. Teaching students that it would be fair for everything is a disservice to those children. VP Harris, quote, equitable treatment means that we all end up in the same place. Children do not start off in the same place and they don't end up in the same place. Equity of outcome eliminates personal responsibility for one's actions. It's disincentivizing excellence. To have equity, it always comes at a cost to someone. Hello? Okay. One of your quotes, you say, I, like many of you, was not familiar with CRT and the concerns that are now becoming a distraction to the necessary work ahead. Distractions? Parents are not a distraction. Our concerns are valid and necessary. A distraction is working three times on sex ed proposals for over a year and wasting our money. That's a distraction. Professor Charles Pierce from Harvard Education Psychiatry. It's up to you teachers to make sure that all these sick children well, are well by creating the international child in the future. Another quote from Blomstead. We must create a space that's genuinely and intentionally embedded in racial diversity perspectives on conversation and actions. You remind everybody, historically marginalized. Another is emphasize the future investments to in, uh, address trauma-informed care and restorative justice. So I guess America is historically systematically racist. I don't think so. Sorry. SEL, as defined by the radical organization, CASEL. We define social and emotional learning as an integral part, it, a part of education and human development. SEL is, SEL is the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply knowledge and skills, attitudes, develop healthy identities, manage emotions, achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make res, uh, responsible and caring decisions. Sounds so wonderful, doesn't it? That's not what it means. SEL is a delivery for CRT. The whole child, which is a, a ways to a means to academic, cognitive, physical, psychological, social, and emotional development. Why are teachers handling these things instead of education? When I get sick, I go to a professional doctor. If I break my car, I go to a mechanic. I don't go to a teacher. So why are we having you handle medical health, mental health, social emotional, social justice? Why is this in our schools? Equity implies that the individual may need experience and receive something in order to maintain fairness. Again, that comes down to everybody starting in the same place ending in the same place. No. It also is a way for some people who have been felt that they have been wronged in some way, that they've been held back by their race, gender, sexuality, and marginalized identity factors. Therefore, equity requires giving something to make this even or fair. It is re redistribu redistributing resources. It also pushes the CRT button. SEL requires a culture shift, which places emphasis on emotion, identity, power, which conditions children to view the world the same way as they think it is. You guys are not in charge of our children. Not at all. The parents are. SEL also advocates for collectivism a nation, a race, a social class. Collectivism emphasizes relationships within a community. Again, 
you guys are in control. The parents need to be in control. You put the blame on us. I don't think so. Just so you know, I will be here at every meeting I can possibly be at until our children are safe. And saying that we're a distraction, no, you're the distraction. Things need to change, and we're going to make sure it does. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Jenna Durr. My name is Jenna Durr from Kearney, and today I speak on behalf of the Protect Nebraska Children Coalition. Last year, this board began considering the adoption of health standards that focused more on sexuality than health. Anyone speaking against these standards are painted as bigots, anti-LGBT, bullies, hate groups, anti-science, anti-public schools, anti-teacher, racist. These allegations came from organizations who most benefit from the standards, advocacy groups closely connected to Planned Parenthood, members of the media, and even some of you on this board. Have you heard anything the people of Nebraska have said over the past 15 months? Let me remind everyone. We love our kids and grandkids. We want all kids to receive a great education. We want great public schools. I had an excellent public education. We want the wonderful educators in this state to be supported and successful in educating the next generation. We want graduates to excel at reading, writing, math, science, history, and logical thinking. We want to improve educational outcomes for every student throughout the state, and we want our kids to maintain their innocence, to be safe, to not experiment with risky sexual behavior at a tender age, to not be shown pornography by trusted adults. We want political and social agendas left out of the classroom. While many Nebraska students struggle to achieve even basic competency in core subjects, the board chose to develop controversial, unscientific, and medically inaccurate sex education standards. Even worse, the process was directly manipulated by Deb Neary and others as the draft one standards were directly copied and pasted from a group called SECUS, an advocacy group with the specific goal of advancing a social and political agenda through the teaching of comprehensive sexuality. Sex ed for social change is the proud slogan of SECUS. Generally, SECUS has a few goals, advancing CSE, which includes teaching how to derive sexual pleasure dismantling systems of power and oppression, applying an intersectional lens to inform policy. Furthermore, SICUS supports abortion on demand and pornography for students. It believes sexuality education should begin at birth and be formally included in the curriculum for every grade. And while it notes that parents should be involved, their most revealing conclusion is that parents are incapable and recommends professionals teach the lessons it believes children should know. We do not want standards from organizations that believe sexually explicit imagery is appropriate in education, especially when the same organizations benefit financially and provide curriculum to satisfy the standards. These are not the values we want in our schools. We want to trust our teachers and not worry about what they are expected or required to teach. We want teachers to teach our kids facts and how to think, rather than what to think about selected facts. We want schools to focus on academic excellence for all children, and that's not hate. Additionally, I'd like to address social emotional learning as well. According to the NDE website, it advocates for SEL as a mental health and wellness initiative. However, the truth about SEL is raising significant concern from parents all across our country. It claims to teach children how to build positive relationships, learn empathy, and regulate their emotions. The reality is that SEL creates systemic change through the viewpoint of critical race theory. We understand you aren't teaching CRT as a theory. You're instead using the theory to transform the reality of the system. We wonder if any of you on this state board, the commissioner, or employees of the NDE know that in-class surveys are given to children without parental consent through these SEL programs. This is a massive collection of mental health data which will follow our children through life. 
The data is collected by subjective surveys from companies such as Panorama. It's then interpreted through an equity lens to create the perception that our education system is racist and oppressive. That data is then used to push ideas such as gender ideology, progressive politics, and as a reason to place the government over parental rights. We would like to invite you to join us and support parental rights by changing the policies to opt in. The surveys are directly data mining and creating a profile of our children, and the security of such data cannot be assured. We hope Thank all you, sides Jenna. can agree. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you for the group that's up here, and now the next group will come forward. Sue Greenwald, Judy Durr, Olivia Benge, Brooke Ritter, Jean Grishin, Liz David, Heather Schmidt, and Laura Rosher. Sue. Hello, my name is Sue Greenwald. I'm a pediatrician and a parent, and I'm from Kearney, Nebraska, and I represent Protect Nebraska Children. We hope that all sides can agree that minor children should not participate in any surveys without parental consent. Our coalition will be participating in a nationwide movement to encourage parents to opt out from in-class surveys. We're excited to partner with parents throughout the United States on this effort. And I'll be talking more about that in a bit. But I do want to talk about information that has all come from all of my citing is from the NDE website about what happens to the data that's collected. There is something called the Nebraska Statewide Longitudinal Data System, or SLDS. The Nebraska Department of Education began development of a student and staff level warehouse um, in, of that system in two, 2004. Um, from the data access and use policies and procedures updated in August 2013, this document is on the site, the NDE collects and maintains personally identifiable information from education records of Nebraska students, including personal data, which identifies each student. These data may include, but are not limited to, name, student identification number, address, race, ethnicity, gender, date of birth, place of birth, name of parent, data regarding student progress, assessment data, data regarding eligibility for special ed, free or reduced meals, or other compensatory programs. That's a quote. So my question is, what happens to all this data? Does it have an expiration date when students graduate or, or staff resign, retires? Uh, does the data go away? Well, apparently not. It actually gets sent to the feds. According to the same page on the MD website, uh, the Department of Education has an initiative to collect and analyze the data, and it centralizes data provided by state education agencies, reducing the burdens to the state. How nice of them. Uh, maybe you find it reassuring that the Department, uh, Department of the Federal Government knows that your child had a free lunch or received special ed services, but I don't. The SDLS has a, a manual called the Data Access and Use Policies, and um, it sounds, uh, it, it talks about the FERPA Act that's been mentioned, uh, which is a, a privacy act that says that access to records will not be provided to others without the consent of the student's parents or the student, except as provided below. Below is section eight, which lists eight separate bullet points of loopholes to this FERPA protection. Uh, one of them um, is about authorized representatives. Um, FERPA requires written consent um, unless, and this is to personally identifiable information, not random, but personally identifiable Im information, unless the dis disclosure meets one or more of the following conditions. One of those conditions is disclosure to an authorized representative, an asterisk, after authorized representative of state and local educational authorities auditing, evaluating, or conducting compliance or enforcement activities or an authorized representative 
um, conducting studies for or on behalf of the agency, which would be the NDE, to develop, validate, or administer predictive tests, administer student financial aid programs, or improve instruction. Remember, improve instruction because that refers to school improvement. The asterisk is explained. Authorized uh, representatives may have access to personally identify information without parental or eligible student consent. All those people that have access include contractors, consultants, and other parties outside the agency. Under these regulations, districts may disclose student personally identifiable information to the NDE, and the NDE may disclose personally identified information to the authorized representatives to conduct the work of the NDE. The authorized re representatives include second step panorama, all of the SEL things, the shape uh, assessment that you talked about, CASEL, et cetera. These surveys become a digital permanent record, and the companies doing them um, have immunity from the privacy laws that are applying to the schools. Is it any wonder that the entities that are backing SEL are among the most practiced people in the world at collecting and selling personal data, including the Zuckerberg Initiative, the, ba the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the World Economic Forum? Project Pineapple is, a, is an option to opt your child out of data collection that will follow them through their whole life. And um, we have these forms here available to anyone who wants them. We have. Thank you, Judy. O Olivia, excuse me. Thank you, Sue. Judy Durr. Okay. Judy Durr, Amherst. Um, I do want to thank each one of you for your service. I do. And well, I'm also going to provide some further details from a timeline of events which shows board member Deb Neary's manipulation of the process of development of the health education standards. On approximately March 22nd, 2021, it appears that Ms. Neary began contacting friends to encourage them to provide positive and supportive input for draft number one. Ms. Kangas emailed Ms. Neary stating, it was wonderful to talk with you on the phone yesterday and I am so glad we got to have a conversation about the proposed health standards. I wanted to follow up and ask you to please email me the survey you mentioned. I would like to fill that out. Thanks again for taking the time to talk with me. On April 12th, Ms. Kangas emailed Ms. Neary once again stating that she received Ms. Neary's email with the link to the survey. On March 22nd, 2021, board member Deb Neary began to encourage the NDE to bring in experts to talk to the board about the need for LGBTQ sex education in the health standards. She specifically mentions her hand-picked advocate, Lisa Schultz, as well as Dr. Deb Tomek and a parent of a transgender student as experts she would recommend for this task. Board member Neary reminded NDE board members and staff how she found LGBTQ advocates to bring along a couple of their fellow board members who didn't understand some of the wording she was able to get into the non-discrimination policy the board had passed the previous year. On March 30th, 2021, Deb Neary emailed a document titled Sample Talking Points to President Nichols. This may be the talking points referenced by Lisa Schultz earlier in the month. The talking points include many references to the process, which unbeknownst to most people and some state board members and some employees of the NDE were not being allowed to happen organically. Instead, the emails outlined today and many others discovered showed that what was supposed to happen organically was being guided by the hands of several individuals including at least one member of the State Board of Education and Lisa Schultz. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Olivia Binge. Hi, my name is Olivia Benj and I'm from Kearney. I'm also going to provide further details from a timeline of events which show board member Deb Neer's manipulation of the process of development of the health education standards. On April 26th, board member Neary emailed President Nichols, Vice President Patsy Coe Johns, Commissioner Blumstead, and Ryan Ford to try and get the NDE to change the way they were receiving public comment. Board member Neary, Neary specifically stated, it is not enough to just listen to public comment, and I tend to think it is irresponsible if that is all that is allowed. And I'm not only concerned about our board having the information they need, 
but I also want to set the example for the local school boards. It's a horrifying thought that they would merely leave the decisions about these standards to only the public comment portion. At the same time, Neary was attempting to bring in an LGBTQ advocate as a facilitator to help create a value statement for the Board of Education. She was also trying to minimize the predominant morally conservative message the board was receiving from the general public, many of whom included professional educators, medical providers, counselors, and overwhelmingly, parents and grandparents of K through 12 students. This is even more thoroughly by Ms. Neary's email to Ryan Four on May 5th, 2021, in which she tried to get the value statement on an upcoming agenda and stated, I think the value statement is important as we make our health standards decision. In a following email, Mr. Four agreed to put the value statement on the agenda. In text messages on May 8th, 2021, Lisa Schultz and Neary make it obvious that they are not only advocating, that they are fighting to keep as much comprehensive sexual education and LGBTQ advocacy and the health education standards as they can. Neri was concerned about a third draft, which was too cleansed. Today, many of us have reviewed information which is highly concerning about the conduct of board member Deb Neri and several others who were aware of and therefore complicit in her manipulation. There are dozens of other very troubling emails which we could have also reviewed and of which have since been published in newspapers such as the Omaha World Herald, the Washington Free Beacon, and the Norfolk Daily News. However, this review explains the significant breach of trust, transparency, and accountability which occurred during the development of these standards. Until the credibility of the State Board of Education and the NDE is restored and those implicated are held accountable, Nebraska stakeholders will not accept any future consideration for the development of health education standards. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Brooke Ritter. All right, hello, my name is Brooke Ritter, and uh, this is my first time speaking publicly like this. I'll get better. Um, I am recently a transplant of Nebraska, Ed Kearney, and we moved here for the schools. Uh, the schools, the people, the rain. Um, I can't say enough good things about Kearney in our area, but uh, amongst the accolades and obvious benefits of living in Kearney, I forgot to do my research on the state as a whole. First thing that struck me was the low proficiency rates and teacher shortages. Then I hear that my child's innocence was on the agenda. It's almost like you have to be trying to screw things up this bad. I am going to be honest, much like the school board before me, I take no responsibility for anything that is or has happened in education uh, as far as Nebraska is concerned because I came from somewhere else, but I also, like my school board, I promise you things are going to change from now on. And if I might, I have some suggestions. Maybe do your job. Just what's written, nothing else. Instead of uh, teaching my child to cope with her mediocrity, maybe focus on uh, proficiency. You see, when people feel good about themselves, it's because they aren't stupid and it is, oh wait, no, no, sorry, I'll do that again. Uh, instead of teaching children to cope with their mediocrity, maybe focus on proficiency. You see, when people feel good about themselves, it is because they have earned it. They aren't stupid and they have higher self-esteem as a result. And then you can negate the need for mental health expenses. Stop wasting resources on data collection. Obviously, it has no bearing on proficiency rates. Uh, free up our teachers' um, time by not asking them to be social workers, therapists, parents, doctors, sexual groomers, and gender confusers. Oh, yeah, and if there's time, maybe some math. I find it humorous that instead of a commitment to increasing teacher pay and making the job not micromanaged and uninspired, you focus on diversity of teachers. What does that matter when we have such a, sh a teacher shortage? 
and say silly things like teachers have been pulled and they say that pay isn't the reason that they're leaving the profession, right, but it not it probably the reason that they aren't entering the profession? Lastly, I wish to say that this board has bastardized the Open, Open Meetings Act and all Robert's Rules of Order that I know, but unfortunately for you guys, or unfortunately for us, actually, if nobody objects, you guys just get to continue. So I'm sorry to say I have way too much time on my hands, and I can be here from now on, so that's not going to happen. It's actually against the law for you guys to participate in a meeting that is against the Open Meetings Act, and you have been informed. Thank you. Brooke, thank you. Jeannie Grishin. Hello, my name is Jeannie Grison. I'm a pharmacist. And I'm here today again to go on record in opposition of the proposed comprehensive sex education. In addition, I want to offer some solutions to this board on ways to protect children, which I uh, but could be part of your mission on your um, website. And I was doing some research. In 2011, the UK started a mission to protect kids, which makes me wonder why the United States or Nebraska is not leading the way on something like this. They had four pillars, which some of it would apply to an education system and some of it would go beyond education. But it's very fascinating and maybe it would plant the seed in some of your minds that different ways that you could go and spend your time. The first pillar that they had was called a wallpaper of children's lives. Banning sexualized images in public spaces, which would include public education. The second pillar that they had was clothing products and services for children. Penalizing retailers, marketers, and advertising inappropriate images and logos for children. You might wonder, why is she talking about that? That's really, is it a really a big deal? Well, I'm gonna give you the example of a child I just saw at an event I was at. The child couldn't have been more than four. I'm walking with his dad and the slogan on his shirt said, I'm only here for the sex. And he was maybe four. So that's why that's pertinent. Um, children as consumers was the third pillar. Establishing laws protecting the right of children and to sue companies using explicit messages to entice buyers. And the fourth pillar was making parents' voices heard. Expediting the process of parents voicing concerns to regulators and businesses. So this plan of these four pillars is absolutely fascinating. The government sent out, uh, set out these new measures to protect children from the creeping tide of commercialization and sexualization in society, which couldn't be more prevalent in the United States. Ministers welcome the progress to date in implementing the recommendations of the mission of, quote, let children be children. And I think that could resonate very big here. So this begged me the question, what is this board doing to protect children from being sexualized and commercialized in public education? Could this board create initiatives to remove any of this sort of marketing from the public school environment and let children be children? So that got me on the whole um, start of looking like, okay, what's on the, your website on how you're protecting children? And it brought me to your Nebraska annual safety requirements for schools, because I was thinking, well, how are you really protecting children? Because I wanted to know. So you have required training, highly suggestive training, policy requirements, and curriculum for students, um, protocols, et cetera. The two columns I want to focus on are required training and highly suggestive training. So I'm looking at the things that you have in place to protect kids. Bullying prevention and education, no required training, only highly suggestive. Suicide hotline obviously is marked in yet. Dating violence, the required training is for employees um, highly suggested training is suggested for students. The one that is super alarming is sexual misconduct. There is no required training and not even highly suggested training. Sexual misconduct and sexual violence, nothing on required training. So I asked the question, why? I ref soccer for youth soccer. 
I coach soccer, I coach basketball. For me to be able to do that, I have to take a class and go through hours of training every year to be able to be around children for two times a week for two hours. If I'm around children, and I might only be repping a soccer game, but I am on the same field as these children, and I am required to be trained against sexual harassment, sexual abuse, any type of abuse with children. And the Nebraska Department of Education does not have that requirement for teachers that spend eight hours a day with my children. That's really alarming. So I think the first uh, place of business for you to go to is to look at this annual required training for schools. But off of this training schedule, I want you all to know that at least they're requiring PPE to be required for all schools. It sounds pretty fair and right, doesn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Jean, Liz, Davids. Good afternoon, board members. Here we are again. I just barely made it before the sign-up time limit came to a close because you chose to make a major agenda change today. Public comment was supposed to be item nine, and you made it item, you haven't even gotten to item six yet, so that's interesting. And instead of taking the normal 45 minute lunch break, you took a 15 minute lunch break, also very interesting. I was sad to see that two of the board members had to eat their lunch during public comment time. That seems a little unprofessional, and I imagine they were a little bit uncomfortable having to do that. Uh, but you certainly had stacked the public commenters uh, front-loaded with people who support you, even one of the board members' uh, spouses, so that was interesting. Uh, but I would like to uh, point out that we do actually agree on a lot of things in this room with those first public commenters. We all want children safe. We all want children thriving in their education. We all want accurate history and accurate science taught, every single one of us. We all want all children to feel welcome and comfortable in our Nebraska schools. We all want the most up-to-date, database successful research to be what educators use to teach our children. We all want that. I appreciate hearing from one of the speakers about the progress that has been made in various areas of Nebraska education to address the current needs of our children. How encouraging to hear about the wonderful progress Nebraska educators are making in uncontroversial educational and life skills, another thing we all agree on. And I trust that addressing legitimate needs of struggling students is the reason for many of those positive changes that are made in local schools and at the state level. But I'm not so naive that I wouldn't also assume that nefarious outside influences would also use this defense addressing legitimate needs of struggling students as their reason for doing any number of things. And for the past year and a half, hundreds of Nebraska parents and teachers and administrators and professionals and therapists and doctors have come out to say, scrap the standards, or we can compromise, scrap the tiny bit of the standards that are controversial. And still they remain. Uh, human biology is not controversial. Human biology is understood for all time, recognizes the inherent differences between male and female anatomy. Human biology values male and female differences, including the reproductive system's inherent differences for the life-giving potential that they have. And sure, there's more to sex than just the possibility of reproducing human life, but there's not less than that. And the recognition of human anatomy, the mechanics of reproducing human life, and the parameters for the best ways to keep one's body most healthy have been the hallmarks of excellent health class curriculum and teaching for years. Students knowing accurate information about their own anatomy and how to best keep themselves healthy should be the foundation of any health class, shouldn't it? This is vitally important information in our age of uh, misinformation when the internet is full of inaccurate information and even the most recent outbreaks of an obviously sexually transmitted disease are not referred to as such and those people can't then protect themselves. You are on the wrong side of history if you think that the way to keep kids safe and help them thrive is in, to introduce them to sexually explicit information, to introduce concepts to them that were unthinkable just a few years ago, to affirm them in the current trendiness of confusion about reality and everything we've understood as human beings for millennia past that have resulted in human flourishing. 
Kids are struggling. We all know that. We're all here because kids are struggling, and we want to help them do better. Have you ever read a transition story of a person who has transitioned? They've had the bottom surgery and the top surgery. Have you read the detransitioning stories? They are heart-wrenching and gut-wrenching, and I hope you sob when you read them. That is not helping struggling kids. We do not want to put them on a path towards that. The current data is damning. Kids are suffering because of this misinformation. Progressive European countries right now are backing off from affirming transgenderism to their young people because of the devastating effects it's having on their societies. Robin Stevens and Deb Neary, because you promote sexualizing our kids and confusing them to their destruction, you're on the wrong side of history, and we will vote you out. We will vote in Elizabeth Techmeyer, Marnie Hodgen, and Sherry Jones, who actually listen to Nebraska voices and actually listen to all Nebraska parents. Elizabeth and Marnie and Sherry and Kirk will make the best choices based on the parents, administrators, teachers, and experts' input, and not based on donations from the NSEA or any other self-interested groups. Thank you, groups. Liz. <laughs> Heather Schmidt. Heather Schmidt. Heather Schmidt. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I would like to talk about privacy today. The FTC issued a consumer alert on August 3rd titled Back to School Children's Privacy. They had a statement in a previous um, policy they issued, or statement I guess, that said children should not have to needlessly hand over their data and forfeit their privacy in order to do their schoolwork or participate in remote learning, especially given the wide and increasing adoption of ed tech tools. Going forward, the Commission will closely scrutinize the providers of these services and will not hesitate to act where providers fail to meet their legal obligations with respect to children's privacy. PPRA governs administration of surveys, analysis, or evaluation. Four of the eight protected categories are political affiliations or beliefs, mental or psychological problems, sex behaviors or attitudes, religious practices, affiliations, or beliefs. As we continue the discussion on the health standards and the use of, and use of reflective questions, I want to read questions asked of my ninth grade daughter through her e-learning health class. Consider your environment, genetics, family history, and current health behaviors. How do they make you susceptible to communicable disease? Three points. How do they make you susceptible to non-communicable diseases, including diabetes, heart disease, and stroke? For three points. What is the potential severity of the illnesses you are most susceptible to? For two points. How do your personal values, attitudes, and beliefs influence your views about dating and sexual behavior? Two points. How might your current dating behaviors affect your short-term health, long-term health? Two points. In 25 words or fewer, what factors do you think have most influenced your gender identity? In 25 words or fewer, describe the dating norms in your family. In 25 words or fewer, describe one relationship norm in your family. How do you think it will change as you grow older? My daughter couldn't be here today, but she wanted me to tell you that this invasion into her privacy made her feel violated. I would like to say it was very fun to see Dr. Votravers here. I met her years ago when um, she was working on the dyslexia technical assistance document, which I would like to say has helped our daughter tremendously. That was back when Nebraska didn't do dyslexia. <laughs> um, our current reading scores, as of last year, and I, I am assuming this is right, I got this off your website, it was difficult to find, so I, I can't, you know. Uh, ELA in grades three through eight is 48%. ELA for high school students, 46%. So the scores show we really have a long way to go with literacy. Could we please get back to that one? As Frederick Douglass says, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you, Heather, Laura, Rauscher. I had planned something completely different to share with you, and you all are becoming so familiar with me because I've been coming to some of these board meetings too. And yet many of you, I've never even heard your voices. I wish we could just sit together and have a conversation back and forth about what you really feel about our children, and we could share with you our own opinion too. Instead, I was woke up at five this morning, and this is what I'm told to share with you. In Matthew 16, 11, Jesus cautioned his disciples to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Leaven was to the Jews of that time a symbol of evil, first mentioned in Exodus 12 with the declaration of the first Passover. Leaven, which is yeast, is an image of sin. It is hidden, it works silently and secretly, it spreads and pollutes, and it causes dough to rise or to become puffed up. 1 Corinthians 4, 18, 5 through 2 also alludes to sexual immorality. Both Jesus and his apostle Paul compared false teaching to yeast. It is also compared to hypocrisy in Luke 12, 1. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever is spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops, as noted by many previous speakers, such as secret dealings with federal and or one world agendas. They will be known. The remedy for hypocrisy is to forget about what people may say and do and fear God alone. The fear of God is the fear that conquers all other fears. For the person who fears, which means respects and honors God, need fear nothing else. All that man can do is to kill the body, but God can condemn the soul. He is the final judge, and he judges for eternity. It is logical that we put the fear of God ahead of everything else. You, our state school board members, have the privilege and obligation to oversee what our children are to study. The book of Corinthians, written by Paul to a society thick with corruption, is much like today's society states in 1 Corinthians 9, do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicator, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, and the covetous, drunkards, revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. God does, God does not condemn you. Just the sin that you cling to is condemned. There is hope for all who are willing to confess their sin and turn from their life of hopelessness to the healing power of the love of God. Jesus' blood shed was shed for all created people. You do not have to change your way before you come to him. You come and experience his love and acceptance. Then you want to change because of the joy and freedom you now experience. No one knows the day or the hour that he, Jesus, will return, but we are told it will be as in the days of Noah. There was rampant sin, worldwide decay, and much DNA experimentation happening even back then. Please choose to clean your own life and the curriculum you intend to use on his beloved children before your choice condemns you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Madam President, that concludes our public comment. We'll uh, take a five minute break. We're now back in session. We're on agenda item 6.1. Vice Chair Robin Stevens will provide a report from the executive committee meeting. Thank you. Uh, President Co. Johns, uh, everything that I have and everything that you should look at is on Spark, okay? I am going to read just very, very brief stuff, uh, and then um, I want you all to please try to give some look to 6.1.A, 
uh, which is a lot of the work that the executive committee has been doing, especially uh, with the commissioner. So uh, yesterday our meeting, the executive committee reports on its meeting from August 4th, and then we had a Zoom on July 22nd. Okay, uh, so uh, there's a lot of material in the Spark uh, about the July 22nd meeting. Uh, at the July 22nd meeting, the committee and the commissioner discussed executive committee roles and conducted short-term planning for the committee. The draft short-term plan is attached in Spark, which I've already mentioned to you. Uh, board members are encouraged to review and discuss with any member of the executive committee. Uh, so when you have an opportunity, please read it. Feel free to contact any one of the four of us. The committee intends to discuss the commissioner's appraisal process this fall and will bring any changes to the process to the board for approval. This concludes the executive committee report and I should also state that we have no action items. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Item agenda 6.1A, is that right? Yes. You did? Yeah, he did, okay. I thought it looked familiar there. Agenda item 6.2, Chair Marie Nichols, please provide a report from the Budget and Finance Committee meeting. Thank you, President Cole Johns. Thank you to the Board and Finance Committee members, uh, Patty Goobles, Jacqueline Morrison, and Kirk Morrison, or Kirk Penner. Yeah, very good. <laughs> oh, that wasn't good. It's all right. <laughs> uh, 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 for your uh, diligence in our committee work yesterday. I appreciated it. Um, we had no discussion over previous committee notes. The committee reviewed all action items and discussed questions with NDE staff seeking clarification on recipients of the revision grants and further explanation for the work to be done on the FDA federal grant. Additionally, the committee had questions about the method and rationale for the procurement on several of the contracts which was discussed in detail. We had discussion around the biennial budget request submission. Bryce Wilson and Jen Udemark of uh, our staff, uh, they discussed with us, went over the budget timeline, the process of submitting our budget request and highlighted numbers from the current budget in detail to provide a base for the committee to move forward as it prepares to approve the Department of Education's budget submission at the September board meeting. NDE then presented four potential budget issues to the committee that could be included with the September proposed budget submission. The committee had discussion about additional information that might be helpful to the committee as well as other potential budget issues that could be included in the budget request. The Department of Education will be providing further information to board members as we pr prepare for the September board meeting. Jen McNally and uh, Dr. Brendan McNiff from ESU5 presented on their mental health wellness program called Wellness for All. This program supported over 200 plus students during the previous school year. These services are being provided in 10 ESU5 schools and three in ESU 6. This concludes the budget and finance report. Thank you, Maureen. Maureen, is there a motion on item 6.2C? Yes, Madam Chair. I move to authorize the commissioner to contract with Cooter Incorporated. Is there a second? I'll second. The motion was made by Maureen Nichols and seconded by Kirk Penner. Um, Andrea, please call the roll. As for discussion. Oh, discussion, I forgot, yes. Okay, any discussion on this motion? No, no. no. okay. Andrea, please call the roll. Neary? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Nichols? 
Yes. Goobles? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Penner? Yes. Cojones? Yes. Eight, yes. a motion on item 6.2 D yes madam chair I move to authorize the commissioner to approve the 2022-2023 revision action grants is there a second, I'll second. Se Patty okay the motion was made by Marie Nichols and seconded by Patty Goobles is there any discussion on the motion Seeing none, Andrea, please call the roll. Morrison? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Cojones? Yes. Neary? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Penner? Yes. Eight, yes. Maureen, is there a motion on item 6.2E? Yes, I move to authorize the commissioner to contract with the recipients of the educator shortage grant. Is there a second? Yes. The motion was made by Maureen Nichols, seconded by Lisa Fricky. Is there any discussion on the motion? Yes. I guess I'm just curious and want to understand why these are not in consent agenda. Because they are new. Oh. So if it's a new, we can't. Okay. All yeah, right. Our, Thank our you. Great, a great question, though. Our policy is that if it's a new contract, we bring it for. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Got it. Please call the roll. Okay. Stevens. Yes. Neary. That's a great question. Yes. Morrison. Yes. Cojones. Yes. Penner. Yes. Goobles. Yes. Nichols. Yes. Fricky? Yes. Eight yes. Maureen, is there a motion on item 6.2 F? Yes, Madam Chair. I move to authorize the commissioner to award grants to the named ESUs for pre-K through grade two support. Is there a second? Lisa. The motion was made by Maureen Nichols, seconded by Lisa Fricky. Is there any discussion on this motion? Andrea, please call the roll. Goobles? Yes. Neary? Yes. Cojones? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Penner? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Eight yes. Maureen, is there a motion on item 6.2G? Yes, Madam Chair. I move to authorize the commissioner to accept the federal grant award to enter into cooperative agreement with USDA Food and Nutritious Service. Nutrition Service. Is there a second? Second. The motion was made by Marie Nichols, seconded by Robin Stevens. Is there any discussion on the motion? Andrea, please call the roll. Penner? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Neary? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Cojones? Yes. Eight yes. Maureen, is there a motion on item 6.2H? Yes, Madam Chair. I move to authorize the commissioner to award school year 2022-2023 fresh fruit and vegetable grant award notifications. Is there a second? Okay. You're going to second again, Patty, okay. Motion right. was made by Maureen Nichols, seconded by Patty Goobles. Is there any discussion on the motion? Andrea, please call the roll. Cojones? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Penner? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Neary? It won't turn. Yes. Eight yes. Maureen, is there a motion on item 6.2 I? Yes, Madam Chair. I move to authorize the commissioner to contract with Westat Incorporated. Is there a second? Thank you, Deborah. Is there any discussion on this motion? Yes. Andrea, oh, there is. Okay. <laughs> it has been so long. I was just <laughs> you were rolling. I was rolling. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. 
We had um, some discussion about this particular item in our committee meeting yesterday. Uh, part of that discussion I have asked in our budget committee that when the board is presented with some of these contracts that we be presented with more information as it relates to procurement because I think that there is a lot going on with some of these contracts and how we, whether we are following the procurement or we have found an exception to the procurement rules and are using that exception. And I'm particularly interested in knowing when there was an exception to the procurement rule and the reasons for which um, we decided to go with an exception. This particular contract is one where, um, I don't know if the exact term is exemption, exception, exclusion, I don't know what that word is, but when you go outside of the normal procurement laws, there are reasons when you can do it, if there is an emergency, if there's a sole source, different reasons for that. And so this um, is one of those instances, and I don't believe that the information was provided in the committee meeting that um, for this information, it's, there was since a verbal update um, explaining the situation, but going forward, I think these are areas that the board should be taking a closer look at. And so I've asked the um, budget and finance, or the staff members who participate in the budget and finance committee to provide that information to us. So I just wanted to make the full board aware that I've started to ask for that information. I think it's important for us to look at on this particular item. I'm going to vote no because I think there's, because I'm more worried about the procedure and the process than I am with the contract. So for those reasons, um, I just wanted to let you guys know what was going on and if you start getting more information or we have more conversations, that's what that's about. Everyone understand that? Okay. All right. Um, so we are going to, I think we're, we're ready for the vote, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Andrea, please call the roll. Neary? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Pricky? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Morrison? No. Penner? Yes. Cojohns? Yes. Seven yes, one no. Maureen, is there a motion on item 6.2J? Yes. I move to authorize the commissioner to contract with complaint investigators a Siri Partners LLC, Emily Adams, DBA Data Driven Enterprises, Lisa Arbogast, Nicole Stewart, and Prism Investigations LLC. Is is there a second? Patty. Okay. Is there any discussion on this motion? Andrea, please call the roll. Fricky? Yes. Neary? Yes. Penner? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Cojohns? Yes. Eight yes. Maureen, is there a motion on item 6.2K? Yes, Madam Chair. I move to authorize the commissioner to contract with Hourglass. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Andrea, please call the roll. Whoops. Is there any discussion on the motion? Andrea, please call the roll. Stevens? Yes. Neary? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Cojohns? Yes. Penner? Goobles? Yes. Yeah. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Eight yes. Agenda item 6.2 L. Bryce, is there any discussion on 2023-2025 biennial budget request submission? Well, Bryce Wilson, finance officer, project safety concerns. My 
Yeah, we have a short presentation of two hours to cover with you guys. So um, we want to make sure you have a good base for the uh, understanding of what we're going to be doing this next couple of months. So uh, we, I would in all seriousness, I'll try to go through this fairly quickly, um, but want to make sure that you guys understand what the process is and what we're going to be coming before you uh, next month to ask you to approve our 2023-25 biennial budget request. Um, so kind of with that in mind, I'm going to go over and set kind of a base for you quickly of what our current budget looks like and what this request is going to, what our ask is of you next month. Um, additionally, in October, we'll come back before you one more time and ask you to um, approve our deficit budget request. So there's a couple of things we got coming up. Just for a quick background of the department's budget, um, we have about uh, $1.8 billion that flow through the Department of Education. Of that $1.8 billion, a little over $1.7 billion is aid, meaning it's flow through funds going out to school districts primarily, ESUs, um, it's also VR clients, DDS work. So it's a, it's a few different places, but this breaks out that different aid portion. Uh, you'll see that blue section there is the education aid, so that's TIOSA. Um, out of that 1.7 billion, a little over a billion of that's TIOSA, that's special education funding, some other programs as well, but those are two of the bigger ones. Uh, you also have vocational rehabilitation, 43 million, D disability determination, 15 million, uh, included as well as the services for the blind and visually impaired, services for the deaf and hard of hearing, and the professional practice commission. So there's, there is quite a bit of different programs going on, um, but that's a quick breakout of just the aid portion. During this, bu this biennial budget request, there's different components of that budget that we have to submit. Um, it's important to understand our starting point is the 2022-23, so the current fiscal year budget that we're in, that becomes our starting point. In this process, this biennial budget, we're not really asking right at this moment when we submit it to the, to the uh, state for um, their consideration. We're not at, this isn't a process where we're determining how those funds are allocated within the department. This is a process where we ask for changes primarily to our budget. That can be increases or decreases. Um, it has the base year budget allocation is the base, like we mentioned. Um, we have to have, if there's any building renewal requests, so we do have one um, for the, uh, let's see. For the, for the hard, deaf and hard of hearing um, offices, they'll have some issues there. We have submitted information technology plan. These are all just normal um, parts of this process. And then the budget issues, that's the piece where we really need the board's input and approval. And then budget modifications is part of the state's process as well where they can identify a different percentage. It's, it's been different things, 10% in some years, but essentially a modification is if the state was going to cut your budget by 10% or 5% or whatever they set that threshold at, what are you going to cut? What's coming out? You have to identify those things to get to that 10%. That's not the most fun part of the budgeting process, but it has been part of, it's been a reality in some years since we've been here. Uh, as we noted, a couple of different funding types that flow through. We got aid, which is the big portion, the 1.7 billion of the 1.8, and then we have operations. So operations of the department is about 111 million. We'll break that out for you here in a second. But that's things that include salaries, benefits, uh, rent, contracts, travel, supplies, equipment, those types of things. Again, just kind of so you can see it in a pie chart, where the operations of the department is very small when you can look at the total amount of dollars flowing through the, depar through the uh, department's budget. Uh, funding sources for the department are made up of really there's four things listed there, but there's kind of a fifth that is broken out of the federal funds, but general funds, um, which are state revenues that come to support the department, cash funds are things like teacher cert fees, uh, the lottery funds are also fall under the cash funds, federal funds are obviously grants, uh, money that comes from the federal government. A revolving fund is kind of an accounting um, fund that's just used for us to use when we, when we move fund between different agencies at the state so that um, it doesn't get double counted. So it's really more of an accounting exercise. It's not real money coming into the department that we can spend unless we're getting money from another agency. Um, 
Within federal funds, there's also indirect cost funds that are essentially funds that recognize those overhead costs that the department has. Those have flexibilities to be spent um, and, and cover a lot of those overhead costs like HR costs, um, central accounting type of costs, those types of things. By funding source, so I think it's, it's an interesting to look at this. When we look at the overall uh, Department of Education budget, you see that 78% of it is coming from state funds, uh, federally funded 21%, cash funds 1%. So heavily state funded when we look at the overall budget of the department. But when you break that out um, and we talk about just the operations of the department, so that 111 million that's our operating budget, 63 million or 60% of that is federal funds. So the department's operations are heavily funded by federal funds, not state funds. Only 36% of our operating budget is state funds. Again, 2% cash, which is lottery funds or teacher cert fees. And then you see about 2% for that revolving fund. Uh, so when we break down that operations budget, so what are we spending that 111 million on? 67 million of that is for education administration, so that's the kind of K-12 uh, birth, I should say birth through age 12 um, work that we do. Almost a little over 26% of that is related to vocational rehabilitation, so about 30 million there. Disability determination, 9.4%, and then you have the uh, services for the deaf and hard of hearing and services for blind visually impaired up there as well at two, around 2% 2 for both of those. All right, so that's a really fast, quick overview of our current budget and what it looks like just for kind of an, an understanding. Now we talk about the budget issues, and again, this is where when we submit this budget request, this is our opportunity to identify those uh, areas that the board and the leadership of the Department of Education have identified are those strategic areas of need. Where are we not being funded? What are those areas that we want to uh, work to address and need funding for that to, to do that work. So these are add-ons. We've identified four um, right now that we've brought before you. We've also talked about a fifth, um, the safe to help that you guys heard about, I think, at the last board meeting in June. I think you had a presentation on that. The funding for that runs out during the next biennial budget request. We don't have that one up here yet, but I think that's one we, we want to consider um, and is definitely on the table for being part of our budget request. So. Um, that, that very likely might be in the, um, the budget, the proposed request that we bring to you next month. I'm going to start out with the advanced early literacy. Uh, this is really tied to the Nebraska Reading Improvement Act. So that was passed uh, several years ago. I don't know, five years ago now. I, it, the fun, the time flies when you're having fun, I guess. But um, there, were no, there were no state funds that came along with that. So it became an opportunity for us to figure out how to to meet that statutory requirement without any funding tied to it. Um, yesterday when we talked about this one in committee, was asked, well, how was the $10 million um, determined? That was, um, when that was passed, that we, we entered into a contract with a agency to help us do a comparable study amongst the nation, nation leaders and those states that are doing really well at this, those high watermark um, states that had successfully implemented this and were, and were meeting those goals and we looked at what they were doing. Um, there was engagement with stakeholders to determine what does that need to look like for Nebraska. So there's been a lot of background work on what this looks like. That included um, things like prefer, or professional development, high quality materials, family and student supports, um, communications, and um, and accountability being part of that work within that 10 million. So there's, there's a lot of different things going on there. The bottom line, we're gonna give you, get you guys more information on that information. Corey can do a much better job explaining that 10 million than I can. Um, that is much more in his realm of uh, work. But we'll get you information and, and that'll be coming out before the September board meeting so you have time to review it and look at it and ask questions. Um, and that'll be the case with all this. So. We also have school improvement as one of the areas that we identified. Uh, this is really the work of Shirley Vargas and her office, which is Shirley Vargas, um, and why, why there's a, such a big need um, for more support and funding for that area is just to get more support within the department to be able to um, 
assist with and address those areas of need around multicultural teaching, um, the focus on achievement opportunity gaps, the comprehensive support and improvement schools. Um, we talked about in the committee how yesterday that's anticipated those ATS, uh, CSI, AT, I lose the acronyms, but those schools are all going, there's going to be more of those schools coming up and so there's more need there. Um, so again, ties into the work of the department and the board on that uh, request as well. Early childhood workforce, the step up to quality program is continuing to increase um, the amount of the providers there and there um, as, as we get gain more of those um, providers that are meeting those um, I guess levels of quality, there's more need for funding to support that and, and pay for those additional services or quality. So that's one. And then this one I don't have to say a whole lot about. I think Katie did a really good job explaining why we have this included in our budget request on career and technical education. And, and uh, I know Kirk threw in a few comments of why it's important as well. But it is, that is, um, as Patty mentioned, that is part of our budget request because of the need there that's been identified. So some of these are not the first time that we've asked for these in our biennial budget request. Um, they've been asked for before, uh, but they're, I guess, priorities that we felt still need to be addressed and um, want to bring them before the legislature to give them that opportunity to fund those specific items. Um, I talked about modifications already, so I'm going to kind of skip through that one, but just a timeline. So uh, like I mentioned, we're going to come back to you at the next board meeting in September and uh, request that the board approve or give the commissioner the authority to uh, submit our budget request. That's due September 15th. Um, October 7th, we'll be, we'll be back again to uh, have you review and approve the deficit budget request. We will be bringing those potential items to the board or the committee and the board uh, next month so that you have an opportunity to see those beforehand. In January, the governor uh, will present his budget request to the legislature that hopefully will include some of these budget requests. Um, but it, whether it does or not, we'll also go before the, Matt, the commissioner will get the opportunity to go before the appropriations committee um, February, March to talk about our budget requests and then end of the legislative session is when we'll find out what ends up being signed into law and becomes, um, I guess, our new budget reality going forward. So that's a really fast overview of budgeting um, and our process and our requests. I want to give you guys a heads up on that and um, give an opportunity to have feedback and input over the next month. Any feedback, questions, or comments for Bryce? Lisa. Pardon me? Lisa. Oh, there you go, Lisa. Wait, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's on. It just goes off and on. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I hate concussions, and I was forgetful before I fell, so who knows where that's coming from. But I wanted to know how much of the lottery funds do we receive uh, for the department approximately? And there's a reason just approximately I'm asking that question. Is it a substantial amount? I'm going to throw out a number. I, I'm it, just doesn't gonna... have to, it doesn't have to be within let's say uh, $50,000, I mean. <laughs> that's, that's not, it's a small window. Um, okay, how about? So I think it's a, I think we get around um, 50 or 60 million a year. Oh, well, within a million, no, okay. No, that's not right, 10, it's, I think our share is 15 million. I think the total okay. is around that. Yeah. And, and that's the reason. Can I, I highlight one thing though? I, sure. I don't want to leave the impression. That's spelled out on how we have to give out those funds. So I, like know, yeah, I know, I know. I'm getting to a point. <laughs> I, I get frustrated with legislation that requires that we do mandate do, to do something and funds don't flow through with it. So my question is, 
I know those are earmarked, but if they're going to require us to do um, like three slides back, was that uh, reading literacy or early some literacy. early literacy, that. And they required it and we need funding. Would there be tension potential for them because they mandate it to give us some wiggle money from from the lottery funds? I would okay, say you're acting like me now with that microphone. <laughs> I, I never turned it off. But, oh. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think that there's potential for that after when the next period comes up for how to use those funds. Um, they looked at the last couple of years during the legislative session on reallocating the Department of Education or education's portion of how those funds can be used. Ultimately, they didn't come to any agreement on that. Um, on those new proposed uses of those funds and so they reverted back to how it had been used the previous five years for another three years. So we have three more years essentially of what has been done with those funds and they will be working over the next year to two years to come up with a new plan to try and get approved um, by the legislature about for the end of those three year period we're in now. Thank you. I just hope we have some early conversations about possibilities because I know lottery funds are important and what they're going to now are important, but I don't think all of those things that are being spent on lottery funds right now are mandated by the legislature. I think when they mandate, they need to provide an option for funding so that we can sustainably continue doing what they're requiring us to do, which is hard when there's not funding to follow through. So that's, that's all my point was about that. Maureen? Yeah, this may be off track here, but with the potential of the, when, when you talk about potential opportunities, this could be down the road further yet, but with uh, casinos being built in Nebraska, is there that opportunity potential to be able to be getting money for the department that we have not normally been able to get because of the revenues coming in from those facilities? Well, I guess I would say there's always potential, but it's not identified to the department at this point. In fact, the projections for the lottery funds that they put out actually reduced the projection of lottery funds coming to the department because of the casinos being built and that people gambling, doing it in other, uh, those funds being redirected elsewhere to casinos instead of the lottery. That makes sense, thank you. Jacqueline. So I wanna first say to your division, um, you guys have been handling a lot of extra things that have come at you with ARPA funds, or I guess here it's ESSER funds. Um, and I know that that's a lot and it takes a lot to staff up, it takes a lot to get people on board and so I want, that does not fall on deaf ears and so thank you for that. One of the things that I had a question about and maybe this goes to the commissioner, we had conversations this morning about the mental health, I wanna make sure I get the right, the mental health systems initiative, right? And we know that part of that is funded with ESSER funds, if I'm correct. There is going to come a time within the next year, or the next year and a half, where those funds start to run out. And we know Safe to Help is one, we know that this initiative is one, and I'm certain we're doing everything that we can to make the most of those uh, funds while we have them. However, when we're putting together our asks to the legislature, have we sat down to, de and I'm, ha has it been a discussion to determine out of the programs that we have invested in, these are the ones worth asking for and continuing the process? Because if we're gonna ask for safe to help, but we don't ask for this mental health initiative, you know, where do we start to determine which of these have the highest amount of priority? And then I think with those conversations, I would just say, I, I understand this year has been a unique year with the ESSER funds, 
But going forward, I think this timeline is too narrow. Uh, we are discussing, you know, what do we want to ask for as it relates to career and technical education? What do we want to ask for as it relates to safe to help? And when we get back here on September 2nd to make a vote, um, we we have less than a month, and then if we don't agree on sept September 2nd, and this is due on the 15th, I think that we've we've limited ourselves. And in my opinion, these are conversations that should have started six months ago, and I know that, or three months ago, and I know that that's super ambitious with everything that's going on. But I think as we look to next year, and or the the biennial in two years, we need to start discussing what this timeline should look like a little bit better. Yeah, I'm going to take it as a question anyway, <laughs> if I can provide an answer. I, I actually agree, right? So one of the conversations that we've had for, uh, I don't even say years, right? We've asked for budget items like Bryce mentioned. Many of these have been kind of just rolling that we roll them forward. But I do think a really good conversation for us, and again, I'll credit Jacqueline had a great point about our uh, legislative and regulatory priorities when we had a little sidebar the other day too about how does all that come into an alignment right and so when we're thinking about what we want to uh, request out of the legislative process whether money or legislative change that can come together and I think for us to think about our kind of our new committee structure and how we would do that well and how we would get that initiated um, yes we're probably on the short window of time here we're also unique that is probably that's one dynamic with a with a, a, a non-code agency like us the other agencies have actually not this the different timeline but a different process right and for us to think about that interaction with the board in a different way and start that process sooner I, I, I agree and it might be too ambitious to get six months ahead uh, given everything else but I think if we keep knowing what our priorities are that can keep informing the the process as we keep going it's a rolling conversation that we need to have always so so my other question Matt was as it relates to the mental health systems oh, initiative yeah, and if there were plans for how to fund that into the future and if there was any consideration or discussion about asking the legislature for more money for yeah, that program. Yeah, and it's really, there has been conversations, including with, we do do partnerships with HHS as well, and so there have been kind of some conversations about who should ask for what funds towards what activities, but I would, I actually would recommend uh, that we would put that consideration together for something for, for you to consider. It's not necessarily a bad thing if we ask and a different strategy comes along, but I'd rather ask if the board so is so inclined towards that end, so. And, and maybe next year it can be on the calendar, since we're creating the calendar, and then it'll remind us that they had it time to be on target. Okay. Oops, Robin. Is, is this PowerPoint on Spark? It's not yet, it will be. Okay, thank you. In, in this month's information, okay, thank you. Because that'll, that'll help with some of the concerns that. Uh, it is now, you ask and you okay. should receive oh, right there. <laughs> Your wish is. His command, her command, right? There you go. Okay. All right. Anything else? That's it. Really good. Okay. Thank you, Bryce, very much for the information and answering all the questions. Item 6.3, Chair Patty Goobles, please provide a report from the Planning and Evaluation Committee meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Planning and Evaluation Committee meeting was called to order at 12.13 p.m., not to be too specific. <laughs> committee members had no corrections um, or comments about the previous committee notes. Our committee discussed a number of action items. The first action item was to grant conditional approval under Rule 14, 92 NAC 14, which is regulations and procedures for the legal operation of approved non-public schools this uh, request is being made for a legacy Christian non-public school to operate during the 2022-2023 school year. That school is in Holdridge, Nebraska. 
Through discussions and an on-site visitation, it was determined that Legacy Christian School has met the requirements for conditional approval to operate for the 2022-2023 school year. After the school year begins, an additional on-site visit will be conducted to verify compliance with Rule 14 requirements. So that is our first item that was recommended for action at today's meeting. The second, which was 2.1.B, uh, we have two very similar requests, action items. The first one, they're both related to Rule 11, 11 teacher waiver requests for schools to be able to operate early childhood education programs for the named district. The first one is a teacher waiver request, Rule 11 for Grand Island Public Schools. Grand Island Public Schools had three unfilled, actually they started with four unfilled preschool teacher positions. They were able to fill one, but they ended up with three preschool teacher positions that were unfilled. And they do have three candidates who've met the basic requirements for Rule 11 teacher waiver. Grand Island Public Schools has submitted documents required by Rule 11 to apply for a waiver for these three individuals. And they have also submitted uh, detailed supervision and internal mentoring programs for the three candidates. The second action item related to Rule 11 teacher waiver request is from Lexington Public Schools and for approval of operation of early childhood education program within that district. Lexington is requesting a Rule 11 waiver for an internal staff member who has agreed to continue her education to complete her bachelor's degree with an emphasis in early childhood and to serve as a preschool teacher. Lexington has submitted the required supporting documents for this waiver. Our next action item for consideration, 2.1.D. Um, this original action item was to authorize the commissioner to set statewide assessment cut scores for the NSCAS science general and alternate tests, assessments. Following dialogue and discussion about the setting of cut scores, for NSCAS science and the alternate assessment. The committee will be recommending that the state board take action today to approve identified cut scores with the understanding that those cut scores are transitional and will remain in effect for one year. The rationale is that the science cut scores are important so in, to have them approved now as opposed to waiting for another month, that they're very important to have um, action on today, in part school, so school improvement work being done by Shirley Vargas um, can be done in a timely fashion because there needs to be um, identification classifications and designations made of schools as soon as possible. And also, schools have had these science scores for some time. It seems appropriate to try and get them cut scores as soon as possible, and if at all possible, at the beginning of the school year. So districts can start sharing that information as they deem appropriate. Um, in addition to that, there will be a second motion related to the cut scores. As I said, those science cut scores are, the way it's being proposed, are transitional, so they apply solely for this year. The second motion that I'll be making is to have during the summer of 2023 the NDE department review and revise, if necessary, the cut scores not only for science, NSCAS science, 
but also for ELA and mathematics. Um, cut scores for ELA and mathematics are, are due to be reviewed in the future, the near future anyway. It makes sense to try and look at all of our assessments as a package, I guess I would say, so that we're making sure the process for that standard setting is consistent from one content area assessment to another, and, and also to make sure that there's consistency across the cut scores. So you'll be hearing that motion from me soon. Um, we, we also had a consent agenda item that I want to bring to your attention because it really is a, a follow-up action item from ad hoc committee work that was conducted um, some time ago. This was the ad hoc committee for the standards development process. And as you recall, there were five recommendations that came from that committee. Work has been done and is being done on a number of those recommendations already. One of the recommendations was that we recommended that the commissioner um, contract with a consultant who would help the agency really as an almost like an external evaluation to really come in and look at the standards development processes and procedures, to really do a, a thorough kind of evaluation with suggestions for improvements. So the agenda item that was on the consent agenda was for the commissioner to contract with American Institutes for Research, or AIR. I don't want to call it AIR, but I'll call it AIR, I'm not sure what, how the acronym is really referred to. Um, the review, as I mentioned, will be an external evaluation, but it will also include research related to standards-based education, comparison of other state standards, development processes, and focus group interviews with stakeholders. There were two organizations that submitted proposals Four organizations were originally contacted, but two of them submitted proposals. And the real benefit of the contract being given to AIR is that through that contract, it will provide additional support from Region 11 Comprehensive Center, or R11CC. So in other words, we'll be getting additional support and information through that particular group without additional costs. So it makes sense that we will have um, our state agency being provided with additional resources, additional information, and so on as the department is going through this standards development review and improvement process. So that was passed today, thank you, on the consent agenda. We, do, we did have some discussion items. Um, NDE staff and committee engaged in a discussion about Nebraska's college and career ready standards for mathematics. The second draft of Nebraska career, college and career ready sta uh, mathematics standards was released recently and feedback is being received on that draft. It's not anticipated that there will be any significant changes to draft two, and if that is the case, then the math standards will come before us next month with a request for board approval. We also had a committee update. NDE staff provided an update on the fall 2022 accountability requirements and federal flexibilities. Um, I'm not going to say too much about that because my understanding is that that will be part of our work session for next month's board meeting. I, I hope I'm understanding that correctly. Anyway, that was what was anticipated. 
So with that, before we take any action, I would like to call Dr. Epler up because we realize that um, our typical process is to present, for example, cut scores in one month and then bring them back the next month for approval. But as I mentioned, we, we have rationale for why we are requesting approval at today's meeting. But you need to have an opportunity to really understand the standard setting process that, was, that took place, uh, what the cut scores, recommended cut scores and proficiency levels are. So Dr. Epler. Great, thank you. Um, I had some additional help yesterday, but it's just me today, so I'll do my best to make sure that I'm able to articulate um, this decision and the, the request that we're asking for approval around uh, the cut scores for NSCAS science. I, I started yesterday with just a timeline of NSCAS science because um, it's taken us quite a while to get to this point. Um, the science standards were approved in 2017, and then because of the significant shifts in the science standards from the previous set of standards to the new standards, we allowed for an additional year for implementation before we began working to assess those. Um, uh, what that meant was that 2019 was the first year that we actually piloted any items relative to the revised science standards. Um, then in 2020, there, was, there were no assessments because of the pandemic, and then in 2021, just uh, a year ago, we were able to field test items, which would allow us to be at an operational test in 22. Um, so again, as we think about science standards being approved in 2017, and here we are in 22, setting cut scores for the first time, that isn't normal. <laughs> um, but again, um, it, it's uh, the reality that we're facing and uh, looking forward forward to moving uh, science education forward as well. We talked about this in committee yesterday too. One thing that I might mention is that on the seven year cycle for standards revision, uh, science will be coming up. Uh, I think we are starting to look at them in 23. Uh, they would need to be approved in 24 by the board, which the timing for this review of the standards process is really nicely. What we hope to do is to use science as a context for implementing this uh, improvement suggestions as a part of the, the process uh, with AIR that um, Patty mentioned as well. So uh, without uh, trying to be, get too technical in the weeds, we hear a lot about cut scores. Um, it's also referred to as standard setting for assessments. And essentially, uh, this is the process that uh, states or when we talk about large scale testing uh, of how scores uh, or the point of achievement are determined to, in order to categorize the student's proficiency. So in Nebraska, there are three levels of proficiency. We talked about that just a little bit yesterday and with the shift of the, the top level of proficiency, the name change that we had from uh, college and career ready benchmark to now using advanced on track and developing. And we set cut scores as a result of new assessments, uh, which ultimately are um, happen as a result result of revised standards um, and a revised table of specifications for those standards or what is ultimately tested. So uh, just to visually show what that looks like, so with the three naming levels advanced on track and developing, uh, you can see on the right that um, the on track and advanced categories are where we refer to students being proficient. Uh, below that, we would refer to those students as being non-proficient. So um, today, the, the cut scores that you all are, are being asked to approve, there are two. Um, one between advanced and on track and one between on track and developing. And again, what that allows us to do is to be able to determine the percent proficiency of students on NSCAS science um, and the NSCAS science alternate. Just to talk a little bit about those two assessments, so we assess in SCAS science in grades five and eight. That is different from ELA and math where we assess in grades three through eight and then at the high school level. Our high school science assessment is the ACT, but what we're asking the board to approve today is just grades five and eight. 
for the NSCAS alternate science, uh, this is the 1% the of students who have the most significant cognitive disabilities. Uh, we are asking for cut scores to be approved for grades 5, 8, and 11. Now this is where it gets a little technical, and again, I'll do my best to make sure I'm able to explain it. Um, the, the standard setting process is really um, a measurement approach using a method that allows a group of panelists, um, and in this case, Nebraska educators, to make judgments around um, particular items and the likelihood that a student would get that um, item correct or incorrect. So our panelists, uh, the selection and training uh, happened in June and July. Uh, is Nebraska educators that have science education expertise. We had teachers, curriculum directors, post-secondary faculty, district assessment coordinators, etc. Um, they do use a measurement theory uh, method um, around uh, um, uh, multiple rounds of judgments. Um, and so the content experts, the panelists, utilize their content expertise professional conversations and impact data from the 22 assessments to be able to make um, recommendations around um, the likelihood of a student being uh, able to um, get that item or task correct. So what that might mean is a, a little bit more, hopefully a simpler way to describe that, is that the educators are determining scores that are most likely for each proficiency level. And they really ask themselves a question. If you think about those levels of uh, proficiency that we talked about, um, an example might be, would a student that is barely advanced get this question correct? And so the educators make that determination, that judgment individually, and then they present those individual recommendations uh, as part of a group, and then, part, then they start to have the professional conversations um, and the discourse around uh, if a, a barely advanced student would get that question correct. Doing that the same for the developing uh, level as well. Would a student that is barely developing um, get that question correct? Uh, they review the data between rounds. Um, they aggregate and present the data to us as recommendations around a range. So what we're presenting today is a median cut that's uh, supported by a de defensible range of a score that's statistically significant. Um, and then from there, um, what we're presenting to you today are the recommended cut scores that reflect the recommendations of the panelists. So we're presenting the scores that our Nebraska educators said reflect uh, the cut scores uh, between those levels of proficiency. So let me get to some of the, the specifics around this. So this uh, reflects the actual cut scores recommendations. This is for NSCAS science. Um, you can see the scale score for the assessment on, for grades five and grade eight on the right. And then what we're recommending based on the panelist recommendations is that the cut score for fifth grade between advanced and on track is 190. Um, for eighth grade, it's 240. And then between on track and developing is 110 for both fifth grade and eighth grade. Those scores don't mean a lot uh, just by themselves. So the next slide, I'm going to share with you what that trans uh, transfers to relative to proficiency level um, according to NSCAS science. So based off of those recommended cut scores um, and uh, using uh, the percentage to show impact, uh, what this would mean is that for fifth grade, 64% of fifth graders would be identified as being proficient on NSCAS science in 22. 52.1% of eighth graders would be um, identified as being proficient on NSCAS science um, this spring. And you can see what that means relative to the breakdown between advanced, on track, and developing. So again, I'm just going to go back because uh, I know this is um, quick and we had a good conversation about this yesterday in committee, but these would be the scores that we would recommend uh, the board approving and then the translation of those cut scores into um, a proficiency level um, according to uh, those particular scores. I'm going to go into the NSCAS science alternate, the, the cut score recommendations uh, for fifth grade, eighth grade, and high school. Between advanced and on track, the recommendation from the panelist is a score of 250 for fifth grade, um, eighth grade, and high school, and then 200 between on track and developing. And you can see on the right there the um, alternate science scale as well. 
So um, the impact data relative to NSCAS science alternate, utilizing those cut scores, you would see that 50, excuse me, 46.3% of fifth graders would be proficient on NSCAS science, 57% um, in eighth grade and 45.5% in the high school. And again, you can see the breakdown uh, between advanced on track and developing. Um, uh, Patty mentioned some of the, the reasons for uh, the, the need to um, have the approval this month. Um, the reason we're asking for approval this month. The short turnaround is really a function of getting the data back. And uh, the test occurred in the, in the spring. The window closed in May. Uh, we had a tight turnaround to get all of the data back. Uh, and then recruiting educators to be a part of the panel. So the panel occurred late June, early July, and then uh, again, a, a tight turnaround to be able to get all of the statistics done um, to be able to um, present these core, the cut scores at this meeting as well. So I'm gonna stop there. I know that is very high level, and I, if there are questions, I'll do my best to, to answer those. Commissioner, I'm not sure anything you wanna add on around this? Okay. Um. Corey, could you please explain how in setting these cut scores it was a little bit different in terms of the result than with ELA and math? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that is, is a little bit different in particular with science is the nature of the assessment itself and the, the standards themselves. Um, so I think um, that, that's a, a, a big difference there. Um, the science assessment, uh, we've moved to more tasks, so a group of items that reflect the task rather than just, I'm going to say, a multiple choice test. Um, so the, the assessment itself is, is really um, uh, a different than ELA or math. The other thing that I, I might also mention is um, because of the significant shift in the standards themselves, um, it also presents uh, an opportunity to, this is really great baseline data for us as we think about how we um, ultimately improve science education. So um, the standards are, are certainly more rigorous than our previous set of standards. We didn't put up uh, our previous science proficiency levels because again, it's comparing two different things, two sets of standards um, that look a lot differently. So so um, uh, some similarities to how ELA and math uh, would work, but per um, the earlier conversation, you know, using these cut scores this year, but then at the commissioner's recommendation, coming back next summer and taking a look uh, simultaneously at ELA, math, and science. Um, I think it's exciting to take another look at science next summer because we'll have another year of data. Um, we'll have more items in our item bank. Um, again, it takes a lot to build an item bank for a summative assessment, um, but I think that's something that um, will be helpful next year. So I hope that, Patty, gets at your, your question. Yeah, I don't have a question. I just, Robin, we sat in on a session at uh, NDE days at Administrator Days last week, and one of the questions from the administrators was, when will we find out when these cut scores are coming out? Because it's important to us to hopefully be finding out very soon. And the response was, probably within the next week, which is right on target to what we were, what you had just mentioned as to why we're voting today. So I just want you to know as board members that administrators want these scores out there, these cut scores out there. Now I thought of something, by the way, so <laughs> it took me a while, but important to the conversation, not just this, and, and I know Patty already spoke to it, it's this notion of getting the alignment in our system. We've made a lot of changes in our assessment system. Every time we change our, our content standards, we have to go through a process like this. Every time we do that, and I think what I started to hear from superintendents is, hey look, now it's extended over this period of time. Can you come back next summer and make sure that that, gets, that alignment gets done as well, right? And that we take a real fair look at what we're measuring. It's tough when you're first setting, setting uh, cut scores too to make sure to do it well and right, and I think one thing we're kind of running into even with science, and, and maybe it ought to become part of our regular process, is you do a transition year when you're looking at it going, is that still making sense? 
in the whole in the whole scheme of things. And so, um, you know, I think what I see is folks want to be real fair and real honest about what the what those measurements mean, what we're really measuring. But as you know, for a period of time, you see that we do field tests with uh, with items and and trying to check the validity and reliability of the whole assessment instrument, that doesn't happen overnight and it does take actually having to go through those motions to get that done. And so I think this will be a really much more productive way for us to look at it. When it stretches out over time, at least in kind of my feeble-minded uh, approach to this, you start to change kind of how decisions get made about those different things. And I think this will actually be in the long run getting it into that into the next summer time frame, uh, just better for schools, better for us to ensure that that process has been consistent. And, and I did very much appreciate the conversations that we did have in the committee, so thank you. And I, I guess I just um, feel the need to point out because we do hear about proficiency, you know, our students' proficiency at 51, 52% and so on. With this particular assessment, it's important to note this, is, this was the first administration, right? I think that also provides um, more ammunition for having a transitional year because it is a first administration. I think you also have instances where it takes schools a little while to kind of catch up to the instruction that's necessary especially when we made such a big switch mm -hmm. to being very inquiry-based mm -hmm. with science, as opposed to what I understand in the past, it was much more kind of vocabulary and factually oriented, where this, is, this requires much more critical thinking mm -hmm. and problem solving. So I think it's especially important with the science to kind of think about, I would certainly expect that we're going to see some differences even even without changing the cut scores so maybe these cut scores are going to be more realistic but well we won't know that right mm -hmm. until there's an administration of it so any further discussion i have a question as oh, it relates thanks. to the process so you stated that there were some, there we go. Um, so there were educators who come, came together, it sounded like they started separately and assessed whether or not they, what they thought a student should be able to answer based on their um, knowledge set and what would be an advanced question, what would be on, on the grade level and then all of the educators came together. And so one of the questions I have is, how were the teachers selected and what was that process like? Because I can, depending on which school and the means of that school that a teacher is operating in, the proficiency of the students is probably a bit different. And so how did you ensure that you had diversity as it related to the teachers who were participating in this process? That's the first question I have. We invited every uh, school district in the state to submit nominations uh, through their science leads. I will tell you we did not have very many. As you can imagine, this process is pretty technical. So everyone that um, I would say applied was so, uh, had the opportunity to participate. We did have diversity across school uh, size of schools and uh, ge geography, um, small schools, large schools. Um, but uh, we also had a few that were not able to make it because of the pan COVID. Um, so we had to have a little bit smaller of a group. So working through the science uh, district leaders and then they were able to identify individuals that they would recommend to apply to be a part of that. And then, like I said, everyone that applied was selected. So how standard across states um, is this process that we are utilizing, is this what most states do to determine what those benchmarks are going to be, or is this unique to Nebraska? No, and again, I'm not the measurement expert. I only had a few classes in my graduate program, but the ag hoc, 
and Hoff method. Um, I was just doing some research this morning to be able to speak to this since Jeremy and Audrey aren't here, um, is a very common approach that's used for all la large scale assessments. Um, and in fact, the, the thing I read this morning said it's defensible in court in terms of being able to stand up to um, the recommendations of a panel. So it is a consistent process that's used in other states, not only in K-12 education assessment, um, but across other areas as well. So as part of that Anhoff method, do they also have requirements or details about how to make up that cohort or what that should look like um, to be able to fully implement the method? And with our pool being limited, were, were we sure or what was the certainty in the process that we were meeting those requirements? We worked with an external contractor. I can't answer that specifically. I'm not sure I can uh, reach out to our uh, contractor. We use a third party contractor to be able to do that for us, uh, simply to have a level of separation between the NDE um, and the actual process. So I can get information back from them relative to the certainty of a smaller group, ensuring that it's reflective of all the students uh, in, in the state. And then the last question I, I'm not really clear on, and I think I'm lis I listened to what Patty said, and I, and I listened to what you said. Are we saying we're voting on this for the next year, and then you're gonna revisit this matter again? Um, like, is this, how long will these particular benchmarks be in place, and then when will they be reevaluated? And if they are reevaluated, what, Will you be picking another panel? Will it be the same panel? Can you go into that? Because I, and and this is just for information yeah, purposes. Yeah, for sure. I, I I'm not really clear what we're exactly well, voting on. I will say it won't be me doing it in a year, but um, the uh, the opportunity uh, I think to revisit the entire uh, process is something that uh, we'll be able to do. I doubt it will be the same panel uh, simply because of timing and circumstances and all of that. So, but what I do think, uh, because it will be a consistent process across all the content areas, I think it'll allow for some of the standardization of what you're uh, asking about. So, Commissioner, I'm not sure what you might add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you answered that very well. The the only thing I can think of is, again, what, what by doing this now, we will be able to compare back to the work that was done, because there's a lot of records that go with us, a whole technical document and everything else that goes with it. So regardless of what the next panel is, but there might be some, uh, also some opportunity for, we, we go down this path, maybe when you're looking at all of the standard, or all of the content areas at the same time, that might also uh, lend to an improved process. I know when I've met with superintendents and assessment coordinators and others from across the state, you know, that's one of the concerns. When you stretch things out over time, things tend to change, and that's why really the recommendation is do it for a year and come back and ensure that, you know, either that's uh, it's on, it's there, or at least it's aligned with the rest. So I, I really, I, I kind of always uh, think of these particular processes. There are some, always some potential flaws in these approaches, right? Um, and every state goes through some of those flaws, I think, with it. But the more data you have, it's actually helpful to get another year of data to look at it and say, hey, look, we really feel, feel very good about this, or that, hey, look, we can see some changes that might be necessary. So. Deborah. Sorry I didn't bring this up in committee yesterday, but it didn't, the importance of it didn't land uh, in my brain until I received an email last night from a superintendent. I've been in good communication with my superintendents about our assessment work, and I mentioned we were cutting these uh, scores. And so one of my uh, superintendents mentioned, and I know you talked about this yesterday, but as I said, I didn't drill down uh, and understand it like I should have. But he was requesting that taking the science, math, and the EL together and have them cut that way. Am I understanding that correctly? Or and I, I, I think that's what we mean by doing We have to do this now in okay. part because we have a reporting requirement that we want to make sure we're able to meet now. But our intention is then next summer we would do that do collectively, it. yes. 
Okay. Simultaneously, I think was the word we oh, used yesterday. Not that we would combine them together to one. It was, we'll take a look at ELA, we'll take a look at math, we'll take a look at science ha at the same time, but not combine them into any one score or anything like that. If that makes okay. sense. Yeah, I, and they would understand that we have to okay. do it separately. Yeah. All right, yeah. thank you for that clarification. Yeah, I know, I know there had been conversation from some superintendents about why even set a cut score this year, but the reality is if you use an assessment, then you need to use results, right? It needs to have some sense of meaningfulness to people, but I think seeing this as, as transition, we're acknowledging that it, it is just a transition. It's not, it's not a permanent, cut score, because that was another criticism or concern, I guess would be the more appropriate word from some superintendents, was that the cut scores for NSCAS, for ELA, were too high, or they didn't seem right. So having, um, having that simultaneous kind of comparison and looking at the process next summer, I think may help resolve some of those concerns about are, are the cut scores where they need to be, right? Sorry, one more question. <coughs> Sorry. So the, the test that these, well, the students who were tested, I guess, in spring, um, we're st we are still coming off of a year of COVID, right, uh, and learning loss. And so is, how did that impact the cut scores, if any, and are we, did we take that into consideration at all? I don't think it uh, impacted the cut scores, um, especially because this is the baseline year. It's hard to know, like, the impact of COVID in particular on science. Science is interesting because, especially in K-5, it often is, does not get full attention relative to literacy or math. Um, I hear that often from science educators that they fight for time, like many of our content areas. So I think it's part of this larger conversation around as in, in the pandemic, and I think back to the spring of 2020 where we were fully remote, were kids actually getting science instruction? Or were schools focusing mainly on literacy or mathematics? Then as we transitioned into 21, what did that actually look like? So uh, we've done a lot of work around science uh, teaching and learning and high quality instruction materials for science. Um, so I think it's really tough to say what the impact of COVID is through this data. Um, but anecdotally, I think part of it goes back to that kids may not even have access to science instruction at the same level. Then as we start to talk about high school, think about high school science courses uh, uh, and the high school graduation requirement, not all kids are taking four years of science. Um, they sh we want them to integrate CTE into their science coursework as well, thinking about health science or ag food natural resources. So. Um, yeah, I, that's a long way to say I'm not sure, um, but I think there are many factors. I shared in committee yesterday, I think that the um, actual proficiency levels is um, uh, a great starting point for us to build from, um, and then we'll be able to, to move forward from there. So impact on science of COVID is probably because maybe students were getting as much science instruction. Right, I just, my thinking is there is an impact but we, we aren't discussing that. Right, <laughs> absolutely, I This agree. could be affecting totally. some of this. I right? agree, I agree 100%. Which, again, I think another good reason, although one not necessarily that we discussed yesterday, but another good reason to kind of keep reviewing that. I think the other part of this is that, um, you know, and we, we when we discussed assessment, right, schools have really, used uh, map growth and that puts us also on a national scale and so we're trying to build a system that does what we have to do really say here's what we want in Nebraska but our numbers aren't comparable to other states right so you can't compare because someone else sets their proficiency rate here we said so it creates this kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, unusual circumstances. You can't compare that to that to that. 
What you have to, though, be able to do is, and we've always wanted this in our system, to be able to triangulate against those national data sources as well. Now, we certainly have a bit of that with ACT um, because that's a national test with those standards. And so what I think we want in the long run around this vision for what we are doing with NSCAS growth is to get those national comparisons built into our system. And I actually think in the long run that could help inform our proficiency uh, cut scores as well. Because we do very well in the national comparisons, yet we've set a high bar for ourselves generally. And that's one of the big things that school superintendents and others have been, you know, say, hey, look, how do you balance all that out? And, you know, let's be honest with ourselves about what our performance levels are, but we also not, we want to be fair about what those performance levels are relative to the expectations in Nebraska schools. <laughs> no, you don't. Patty, is there a motion on item 6.3A? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I move to grant conditional approval under Rule 14 for the following applicant non public school to operate in the 2022 23 school year. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Robin, seconds. Okay. Is there any discussion on this motion? Andrea, please call the roll. Fricky? Yes. Neary? Yes. Enner? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Cojones? Yes. Eight yes. Patty, is there a motion on item 6.3B? I move to approve the Rule 11 teacher waiver request for Grand Island Public Schools and approve annual operation of the Early Childhood Program for the named school district. Is there a second? <laughs> okay. Um, Mo, we'll go with that. Okay. All right. Um, is there any discussion? None? Okay. Andrea, please call the roll. Neary? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Penner? Yes. Cojones? Yes. Eight yes. Is there a motion on item 6.3C? I move to approve the Rule 11 teacher waiver request from Lexington Public Schools and approve annual operation of the Early Childhood Program for the named school district. Lisa, second, okay. Is there any discussion on this motion? Andrea, please call the roll. Penner? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Neary? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Cojones? Yes. Eight yes. Is there a motion on item 6.3D? Yes. There is. And I will be um, asking for two motions. The first one, I move to approve the recommended cut scores for NSCAS Science and NSCAS Science Alternate. Okay. Second, over here, Robin. Okay. All right. All right, is there any discussion? Please call the roll. Penner? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Neary? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Cojones? Yes. Eight yes. Okay. And the second motion, I move that during summer 2023, the NSCAS Science, ELA, and Math cut scores, including the alternate assessments, be reviewed and revised for consistency. Is there a second? second? Okay, Deborah. Okay, any discussion? Okay, Andrea, please call, please call the roll. Stevens? Yes. Neary? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Cojones? Yes. Penner? Yes. Goobles? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Eight yes. Okay, um, agenda item 6.3E, I think it's E. Corey Epler, is there any discussion on Nebraska college and career ready standards for mathematics? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, 
I uh, do have some information to share relative to the math standards. Uh, we're presenting them in this month and coming back next month to ask for your approval of Nebraska's College and Career Ready Standards for Mathematics. Um, we've worked really hard over the last year to take what we've learned over the last year <laughs> about standards and standards processes and communication with the board and have provided monthly updates um, to the committee and the full board as needed. Um, we have, um, and it's in Spark Draft 2 of the Nebraska Standards, or excuse me, the Nebraska's College and Career Ready Standards for Mathematics. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about those standards today. Um, and again, you all will have the draft for a month as well as all of the other material. And then we'll come back next month asking for approval. I do want to note again, I'm flying solo today. Deb Ramonic, our math specialist, retired from the NDE on Monday and started her other job on Tuesday. So she's working for the Nebraska Children's and Family um, Foundation. And then Marissa Pazant is not able to be here today as well. Um, just a reminder that this is a revision of the current standards, which were approved back in 2015. And this was the first time uh, Nebraska standards were designated as college and career ready by our post-secondary system. And we also engaged employers in the process. Uh, we assess math um, uh, via NSCAS general and alternate for grades three through eight and for the ACT in grade 11. I did share this uh, with the committee yesterday and just wanted to, to acknowledge uh, the proficiency conversations that we've had. Um, so the current standards were approved in 2015 and then it takes us two years to get that first state assessment in the book, so to speak. We get standards approved, uh, we work to write new items, do standard setting, and then we're able to have a fully uh, implemented uh, statewide assessment. The proficiency level that you see in the slideshow reflects a combined result for all grades tested three through eight and grade 11. So the first time our standards, math standards were assessed, we were at 51% proficient, uh, went to 52% that next year. There was not an assessment in 2020 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then our first year after the pandemic, uh, we were at 46% uh, percent proficient statewide. This, I think, uh, to Jacqueline's question earlier about impact on COVID, I think this does illustrate the impact that COVID had uh, in particular on mathematics. And I shared this with the committee yesterday. I think this is consistent with what other states are seeing around mathematics teaching uh, mathematics learning being more impacted in the pandemic um, than perhaps literacy uh, compared to some of the other um, data that we have as well. The other data point that I wanted to talk about just briefly, and I've shared this before with the committee, um, and we talked about it yesterday morning, is we spend a, a, a fair amount of time working on standards and working on assessments um, yet also recognize there's a lot in the middle that has to happen to get to that um, assessment in the proficiency level. Um, over the last five years, the NDE has been working to elevate conversations around high quality instructional materials, and we collect data around what districts uh, tell us they're using for instructional materials as part of their local curriculum. And we've seen significant um, movement around districts moving towards higher quality instructional materials um, in the last three years of data collection. Yet if you look at the 21-22 data, um, only about 40% of our districts reported that they were using instructional materials that fully met the expectations for alignment to our standards. I think our numbers next year are going to uh, jump significantly because many districts uh, are using ESSER 3 funds to purchase new materials. Um, but again, I wanted to point out this the, the conversation around standards and assessment um, and also recognize that there is a, a, a need to have a conversation around uh, the instructional and teaching and learning side of this as well. Um, the, the designation of these standards as college and career ready is important um, because we want to make sure that students can enter into credit-bearing post-secondary coursework without the need for remediation. Um, we hear from our post-secondary partners that that's a really critical uh, piece to make sure students do not need those remedial courses that they can come in uh, for credit-bearing. So that's a um, kind of starting with the end in mind as we work through standards is make sure they're ready to transition into post-secondary education. 
We um, uh, use a similar process and recognize this process was occurring as the ad hoc committee was working through uh, recommendations to the board around standards, revision, and development. Uh, we started in fall of 21. I'm going to kind of fast forward to uh, May of 22 when we released uh, our first draft of these standards. Uh, we had a little over 200 responses on the public input survey. Uh, no responses via email, and then we made post targeted post-secondary outreach with our university system and state colleges to get their feedback on draft one, leading us to draft two, uh, which is uh, public uh, as of yesterday. And I did, uh, in the PowerPoint, put a link to the reference document that is also in Spark. So that document below is a really comprehensive overview of our process of the math standards revision. So if you have more questions about, and this goes back clear to the very beginning of this process, um, we work to provide that for you all as well as our public around how these standards um, got to the, this point. I shared this information um, I, back in as we released draft one because there haven't been a ton of changes between draft one and draft two conceptually. Um, some things that I really want to point out relative to uh, this version of the math standards is strengthening the data strand, um, but then also really focusing in the middle school area on ratios, proportional reasoning, reasoning and arithmetic, making sure that students have those foundational skills so they're ready for algebra one as they end enter into um, high school. Um, we did do a public input survey on draft one, and I'm sorry if this mic is cutting out. Um, I'm not sure if it is or if that's just my, my own lateness in the day. Um, <laughs> the uh, public input data, we ask uh, for feedback relative to the questions that you see on the screen, but then also what content should be added, what, how, what should be removed, how can the rigor be uh, approved, and we also uh, link the summary of the public input data in Spark as well. We got really great feedback, and I've always said the feedback that's most helpful around this is when it's really specific, so um, you know, there's always the thought that there are just too many standards, so how can we streamline them and make sure it does reflect the major work of the grade? So I appreciate all of those individuals that provided that feedback. I, I don't want to uh, leave the table without talking about the challenges of implementing revised standards, um, and this has been consistent not just within our state but across the nation. And so thinking about what does it actually take to begin implementing a revised set of standards. Um, and that also means not just focusing solely on standards, but really thinking about um, how we improve teaching and learning at scale requires conversations about helping folks understand what the standards and indicators are telling uh, folks to, to do, what should instruction look like, but continuing to expand access to high quality instructional materials, assessments, and aligned interventions. We heard a lot about tier one, tier two, and tier three today. We think that um, it's important to note that the implementation of these standards occurs in tier one uh, as part of core supports for all students. And um, that third bullet, I, I really appreciated the comment from one of our Milken Award winners today when they talked about high quality professional learning. And she said it's not enough just to get new curriculum or new instructional materials, that teachers need professional learning in order to be able to implement those. And I think that's something that we're committed to um, and partnering with our ESUs and districts to do that as well. Um, similar to English language arts, we've developed a set of resources to support the rollout. Um, it's a professional learning series that uh, can be facilitated by ESUs or district leaders. Um, starts with a shared vision of excellent math instruction, uh, but also talks about the revisions and how they support that shared vision for excellent math instruction, but then also gets into some of the nuts and bolts of how a district might approach launching the revised standards as well. So those are free. Um, we worked with a steering committee of NDE staff and ESU uh, math cadre leaders to be able to develop those, and they're already ready, so they're waiting uh, on approval um, next month, and they can start working through those professional learning resources as well. This is also linked in Spark, and it's posted on our Math Standards uh, Revision webpage because folks want to know not only the implementation overview, but also the um, relationship to summative assessment. Um, so the 
uh, this coming school year, 22-23, really will be exploration. Um, we'll continue to assess what we call the legacy standards, which will be the 2015 standards, and then you can see that we begin working towards implementing an assessment that's reflective of the 22 math standards um, over the next several years. And again, this is posted in Spark, and you can see the reference document uh, that's uh, linked at the bottom of the screen. So we'll come back next month. Um, maybe I'll have friends in tow. I don't know if they'll leave me out here again. To, uh, but uh, we're, we're really excited to get to this point. We appreciate the guidance of the board and continuing to encourage us and push us to think about process improvement. We've been absolutely mindful of that and truly think that we have a set of standards uh, in draft two that will continue to move us forward. Um, recognizing, again, I'm going to go back to standards aren't going to change instruction. There's a lot of other things to consider when we talk about how do we improve mathematics education for all. Standards are a starting point. Assessment's one of those, but there's a lot of other uh, great work that we can do uh, together in that. Whoops. I'm not, I must be tired. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation and for answering questions and listening. Uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate your work. Agenda item point six, 6.4 and 6.4A, Vice Chair Lisa Fricke, please provide a report from the Rules and Regulations Committee meeting. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the committee received uh, the report on rules and a public hearing was held July 26, um, 2022 for Rule 20, and that's the regulations for approval of teacher education programs. And um, the committee reviewed the final draft of B13, uh, which is the development and recommends adoption of the proposed revisions to the full board today. And the committee received a progress update from NDE staff on legislative regulatory priorities. And the committee will have a discussion at the September uh, 2022 meeting on proposing legislative priorities for 2023. And I would just like to note that um, Senator Walls, who's chair of the Education Committee, has um, requested that the commissioner uh, develop the safety task force that's been talked about. And so far they have 200 applicants um, to uh, go through. And another thing, um, as we look at regulatory priorities, um, LB 335, I think it is that states um, by 2030, 70% of students will either have received a degree or certification. I think um, thinking legislatively and setting priorities, the legislature needs to know that um, in order to attain that goal, there are things we need. And so uh, we need to work together to get this done. Uh, the committee received an update from NDE staff on Rule 24, and that's the regulation for certification revision process, and advised the NDE staff um, to propose a draft to the committee at some time in a, at a future meeting. The committee received an update from the NDE staff on Rule 20. That's what they had the uh, hearing July 26th. Announced regulations for the approval of the teacher education programs and revision process. And the NDE staff reported on feedback mentioned from the Nebraska Attorney General's office, which we were grateful to receive. Uh, and uh, will revise the rule accordingly, and the NDE staff will bring that uh, recommended revision back to the committee at a future, future meeting. So that concludes my report on rules and regulations. Okay. Uh, all right, um, Lisa, do you have a motion on 6.4B? It's been a long day. I move to approve proposed, I can't say proposed, and my husband did that to me 50 years ago. Um, 
I move to approve proposed revisions to State Board Bylaw B13. Is, is there a second? Thank you, Maureen. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Andrea, please, please call the roll. Goobles? Yes. Neary? Yes. Co Johns? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Penner? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Eight yes. Agenda item points are seven and 7.1. Chair Patty Goobles, please provide a report from the Ad Hoc Committee on Board Policy Manual Revision. Thank you. The Ad Hoc Committee on Revising the Policy Reference Manual has met twice to initiate our work of reorganizing the State Board of Education Policy Reference Manual. Um, at those two meetings, we reviewed the purposes and goals for reorganizing the bylaws and policies. We compared similar documents from 10 states. We reviewed the crosswalk um, that was shared with you at a previous board meeting, comparing the current organization of the bylaws and policies with what our recommended organization is. Um, through our discussions in the committee, we recognize the importance of having formal authority to propose a reorganized policy reference manual based on the charge we were given by President Kojans. With that, uh, the committee is submitting a proposed resolution which, if approved, will act as our directive to proceed to provide definition of bylaws, board operational policies, and agency management policies, and include a request for board approval date. Our next scheduled meeting is August 10th. Thank you, Patty. There are three items under the additional business today. Wait, wait. And, <laughs> oh, is there a, I didn't see that there was a, oh, 7.1. Is that what you need to do now? Okay. Yeah, the resolution. All right, thank so, you. Um, our intention is to share the resolution with you today in hopes that you would approve this resolution at our September board meeting. This is a resolution to revise the State Board of Education Policy <coughs> Reference Manual. Whereas President Patsy Kojans appointed Patty Goebel's chair, Maureen Nichols, and Kirk Penner to an ad hoc committee to explore revisions to the State Board of Education Policy Reference Manual. Whereas the ad hoc committee has met to review the current policy reference manual, review board policies from other states, review Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised, and recommends that structural changes to the policy reference manual be proposed to the State Board for consideration. And whereas the ad hoc committee intends to make final recommendations to the Board at the November 2022 meeting with recommendations, recommended adoption at the December 2022 meeting, now therefore be it resolved that the State Board of Education adopts the following definitions to direct the work of the committee. Bylaws. The board's own basic rules relating principally to itself as an organization. Board operational policies, the board's policies that relate to and support the policy making, rule making, and quasi-judicial responsibilities of the board. They specify how board members are to conduct themselves and interact with individuals and external entities. Agency management policies, the board's policies that define how the state board intends the Department of Education to operate and conduct its actions and business and how the state board itself may be involved in such matters. Resolve that the State Board of Education intends for the ad hoc committee to present recommendations for revisions to the current policy reference manual to the State Board of Education at the November 4, 2022 meeting 
with the potential for the adoption of any presented recommendations at the December 2nd, 2022 meeting. Thank you, Patty, and thank you to the ad hoc committee for all of your work, and we'll look forward to seeing the results of all that work. Okay. All right, there are uh, three items under the additional business today. Um, the first one is F 5.2.B. Okay, so you have to go back in your document. So that item, 5.2.B from the consent agenda, is approved the 2022-2023 Nebraska Council on Teacher Education membership roster. And, and um, Madam President, what I would do is just ask for a motion on it so we can discuss the item. Okay, do I have a motion on item 5.2B, 5.2.B? Deborah, do I have a second? She needs to make a motion. Oh, move. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I move to approve uh, the 2022-2023 Nebraska Council on Teacher Education membership roster. Thank you. Do we have a second? I second. Thank you, Maureen. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I'm the one that pulled these three, and we'll make it quick because it's, it's late in the day. So I just want a better explanation, and maybe it's better next time to explain what NCT is, NCTE is. Uh, one particular question I have that I would like answered today is, my understanding is it's Nebraska Council on Teacher Education, and they are telling the teacher colleges what to teach. Is that a good assumption? Help me out. Who's, who's deciding? <laughs> So yeah, what it, is being taught to teach? I'll see how well I do, and then if, if I have a friend out there, they'll help me. But okay. uh, um, the, the council is actually created in statute originally. I mean, it actually, it actually predates the State Board of Education, if I remember the history well. But that council consists of members of the teaching profession to be able to make recommendations ultimately to the State Board of Education about the operation of, of teacher colleges and so they do make recommendations that end up in our rules and regs like our previous conversation okay but are they are they saying which classes and what type of they might make recommendations as such and then ultimately that ends up maybe in our rulemaking process on how that's done so i'm looking if there's in, not even a thumbs up over there but <laughs> that close, close. Okay. yeah so then i that brings me to we had talked in fact they talked about i've got to go my memory here we talked about the human humanities requirement who is human, human relations, relations requirement who is making that requirement is that nde uh, i think i think brian hall said statute yeah that was that's what it, it's actually a requirement in statute the legislature requires yeah. who's choosing the class Well, I think that there is a class probably provided within a framework for each of the institutions that offer that. So, yeah, that's it would be at those institutions. And I, I will say that that was one of those points of asking about how that could be changed. That would be a great thing for a legislative priority for us to look at uh, or, or uh, also in rule that depending on how much latitude we have after an AG's uh, right. uh, review and the right. governor's review of that, but yeah. Okay, well that, that clap, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna add that the legislature put that in the statute, late 80s, early part of the 90s. I didn't know I, the phone a friend was on the board, that's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well the class that they're teaching is not, not something we need to be teaching uh, when you go to that class and you look at it, it is uh, not appropriate. And it's the same class you have to teach for to get your substitute teaching license. And it's at Central Community College. Um, I've got a copy of it. So they have to read a book. And it's on human relations here. This is the synopsis of it from Central Community College. And you have to take this class as human relations class in order to get your substitute teacher license. 
and and what I'm guessing, and I I'll be glad to talk more with you about it. That's fine. But what I'm guessing is that they have created a course. We don't design those coursework, but it might be one of those that they've designed with the intention that it fits, fits that requirement. It sounds like, and I, I you I'd think that's from the that's, so that's that coming case, from the school because it's all it's similar at Wayne State as it is at Central. I, Community. I suspect there's a framework out there for the, that course, and I don't. And Brad's shaking his head. I don't believe we set that framework, however. Yeah. Okay, so that's the individual school that, okay. Well, reading a book called White Fragility is a little bit odd for me, for Humans Relations, to take a substitute teaching license to get one. I'm just being honest with you, and that's what I wanna know, who is recommending they take that uh, to get a substitute teaching license. And I don't have to go into what's said in the book, but I've got it, and I'll just leave it alone. I took that class yeah. um, when I moved from one school in Nebraska to another school, mm -hmm. and I ha wasn't required to take the class at the other school. Okay. Um, but the class that I took was really quite informative okay. and a really wonderful class. But I think it's the school itself and the okay. teacher that decide what it, what's contained okay. in it. And that's why I pulled it. I didn't know if NCTE was dis discussing that or not. And that's why I pulled it, because I'm going to vote no. And that's one reason. That's it. OK. All right. Should I call for a motion or a similar discussion? Yeah. Yes. Looking at the directory, um, there's an edit that needs to be in there. Um, John Schwartz isn't at Firth anymore. He's at Millard. So just so you know that needs his address and all that information needs to be changed. I'm good. Good note. So we'll note that. And Deborah, did you? Well, I'm want to make it clear that my interest in having that class not a requirement anymore was only because I heard people across the entire education sector saying it wasn't necessary. But now I'm wondering, <laughs> I, I guess I'm curious, what was it that you didn't like about the content of it? Am I hearing that it was discussion about white privilege? And that's what you think is inappropriate? I can read a little bit. OK, please. So go ahead. So basically what it, it's doing um, is it, it puts certain people in two categories, racists who admit it and racists who won't admit it. And to take a humanities, uh, human relations course to be a substitute teacher or anything, this is the type of stuff, and I have more here, but it just doesn't make any sense to be having that. So, uh, yes. I think we're a bit off, probably a bit off topic here, um, unless the topic is, in my opinion, if we are going to vote for the members of this committee or not. Um, and then if we want to have a discussion about whether or not we want to propose legislation as it relates to a class, I think that's something for the executive committee to take up. Um, the one thing I just want to clarify, and sometimes um, that happens, I think we start using words like they are making, and I don't like they, who, I, I don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. And then like, I'm going to read this, but then giving a summary of what it says that wasn't like the word. And so I, I would just take some of this, like I don't think that there's been a lot of clarity in some generalizations that were made, but I, I think it's off top germane to what we're discussing. Uh <laughs> That's I, fine. I, I get that, and that's fine. The, the question or the motion or the discussion item is, or the action item is NCTE, and I just wanted to know who did it. The other part, 
can be discussed later. I'm with you on yeah, that. And I would suggest that if you want to discuss the content of the classes across the state, that maybe you bring the bring the, that question to the executive committee, okay. and we'll see. You know, is is there a format that all of the schools are teaching? Or I, I I doubt it because that's nothing like what I had. I mean, it had a lot about diff different um, different people and uh, ideas and that sort of thing. So that when you walked into a classroom, um, you were able um, to look at your students mm -hmm. and to be fair and honest with them. And so. But if you want to bring that to the executive committee for further discussion, we, we could take that up and see what we think we need to do with it. Madam Chair. Okay. Yes. Um, one of the things uh, in reading the last attachment to this agenda item, uh, it says organizational policies of the Nebraska Council on Teacher Education. 1.00, the Nebraska Council on Teacher Education. One thing that I highlighted was the last sentence in that 1.00. It states that the State Board of Education reserves onto itself sole authority over college program approval and certification. Now, that's not what I'm hearing. I just want to make clarification. So if I want to separate the two issues too now so we don't get too confused here, right? Yeah. So first of all, that's the organizational policies that they create. They were created in statute. They are advisory to the State Board of Education. So they aren't demanding something of that, right? And so if courses or any, anything else, that's, they're making advisory decisions to us. The reason that they actually have to function as a public body because they are advisory directly to the State Board of Education. And so they function under those things. These are their organizational policies on how they function. But I think, I actually think maybe uh, in, in, in light of that, we could ask that question of that organ, do they, do they ever make recommendations on course? I don't think we have anything in our rule that defines what that course looks like. That would be a future conversation in my view. Our, our item here is to approve the membership recommendation. There's not anything else within right. it. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, contract approvals, uh, 5.3B. Um, wait, we need a vote on that. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Just vote. Okay, let call the, call the roll. Goobles. Yes. Neary. Yes. Kojons. Yes. Nichols. Yes. Fricky. Yes. Penner. No. Stevens. Pass. Morrison. Yes. Okay. All right. Six yes, one no, one abstain. Okay. So it passes, right? All right. Um, contract approvals, 5.3B. You want me to read that? So item I, 5.3.B is authorize the commissioner to amend the contract with student one to continue improvements in the or NDE central data repository and advisor LDS longitudinal data system and to maintain the level four technical support related to integration of EDFI technologies pursuant to 2019 federal SLDS grant terms. That's statewide longitudinal data system grant terms. So that's the item and you want a motion on that one. Okay, do I have a motion on 5.3 point B? Um, thank you, Deborah. Do I have a second? Well, she needs to read a motion. Or I'll read it. So. I've done that twice now. Sorry, on, so please read I. it. And I don't have it in front of me. So I think you could say so moved as I just read okay. them. You wanna read it? Go ahead. I'll read it. Yeah. All right, Mo, thank you. I move to authorize the commissioner to amend the contract with student one to continue improvements NDE Central Data Repository and Advisor LDS and to maintain level four technical support related to integration of EDFI technologies pursuant to 2019 federal SLDS grant terms. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Deborah. 
Okay, please call the roll. Hold Edward. on. Oh, discussion. That's all right. So real quick, I pulled it. Discussion, I don't, go right ahead, sir. That's fine. I pulled it because I didn't know what it was, and I just wanted to point, just go after it. And so what I would like next meeting is a description of and an understanding. You heard it today. What data are we keeping? Who, who's, who's right is it to know my kids' information? And that type of stuff. So I would, I'm a no vote here because I know nothing about SLDS, but it's a data, it has something to do with data. But if you could, could please, could you please tell, wow, that's odd. Ooh, it is. Yeah, let's not do that. Um, just come back next meeting and explain the whole data process, the surveys, what you're keeping, how long you keep it, and who's right it is to, to data. So we won't actually vote on it then, right? Oh, no, but I, I mean. You can proceed with your vote, yes. Okay, we'll proceed with the vote, all right. Um, yes. Can I, can I before? I'm trying to work on the microphones here, and we aren't going to be able to hear very well. I feel like I'm in a big stadium. And hello, 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 hello. <laughs> so let's give them just a minute to do that. It's really echoing, yeah. I think it's because mine and yours are both on. No? So I did hear what was said earlier. Um, the statewide longitudinal data system has been in existence uh, for a couple decades at this point as a result of two grants that we received from the US Department of Ed. Um, do you have specific questions that you want to know? Okay, I, I for the most part don't do surveys. We're talking about the data warehouse. Um, secondly, um, we do have a process for who sees data. I think it sort of is a misrepresentation to suggest that we are sending out student level data to anybody uh, without consent. Um, it is a very long discussion. I, I will point out that you saw a very similar contract in January, and that there probably have been seven or eight other ones over the last 10 years. Deborah. You really want me to turn it on? I can't. I, I, can't, I did not understand much of that. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So I, I don't know. I'm hoping to help clarify. I might not be. So, but what I heard today in public testimony was about these health surveys that are you know, county health departments use to gauge what are the supports needed for the students. And I don't know that those are even a part of NDE at all. Am I correct in that? See, this is where I don't want to get it. The, yeah. I think what Kirk was asking for is a longer presentation because we're not prepared to go all the way through this. It is a very, if you want to know what's gathered in the information that we have, there are technical documents and our a presentation that could be organized to kind of walk you through what that is. And I would say that's not the survey stuff that you were hearing about, but I hate to even answer that at this point in time. I'd rather would wait for the rest of the a presentation. Yeah. 
Stevens. Yes. Neary. Yes. Morrison. Yes. Co Johns. Yes. Penner. No. Goobles. Yes. Nichols. Yes. Fricky. Yes. Seven yes, one no. Do I have a um, I don't even know what you call it now. I'm so gone. Okay. It's a motion on 5.3. A motion 5 on 5.3F, please. Yes. You want, oh, I, okay. You got it? I move to authorize the commissioner to contract with Children's Hospital and Medical Center for the purpose of providing expertise in child health topics and intervention through a partnership with the Nebraska Healthy Schools Program. Do I have, or we will now discuss this. A oh, we gotta have a second. 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 Thank you. And now is there any discussion? Okay, real quick here. So it's a children's hospital sponsoring a drag show and having a tent for gender affirming care. That's why I'm voting no. And Okay, so we're gonna vote on that, huh? Okay, all right, call the question here. Stevens? Yes. Neary? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Cojohns? Yes. Penner? No. Goobles? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Seven yes, one no. Okay. Item six point. Madam President. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. Here. Um, it's done. Yeah, you vote it, you advance it. It's about oh. the program that we're working with. Yeah, the okay. concern okay. with something else. All right. Uh, agenda item 6.1, uh, Vice no, Chair. No, no, no. Item, we're on item 9, 9.2. Remember, we had to jump back. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. 9.2. Okay. Submitted written public comments are attached in the electronic meeting agenda for the board and the public to review. Agenda 10.1 and 10.4. The next items are information items and written reports for the board and for our information only. This section of the agenda is intended for, intended for board members to offer informal uh, conversations, uh, observations of the work of the state board. Board members may take brief make brief announcements about attendance at future events for the purpose of incoming, informing other board members. We uh, no business or motions or suggested actions of the board may be offered at this point in the agenda, nor should board members engage in substantive discussion about other agenda items or introduce new agenda items. Anything to be added to this for the good of the order? Thank you, uh, item, agenda item uh, 12, thank you for those who attended in person and who tuned in to the broadcast. The next meeting of the State Board of Education uh, is scheduled for September 1st and 2nd, 2022 in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, the August 5th, 2022 State Board meeting is adjourned.